call the meeting to order. Um, Deputy Clerk, could you conduct the roll call? Certainly. Supervisor Brown? Here. Supervisor McCowan? Supervisor McCowan? It looks like you're, you're muted. muted, Supervisor McCowan. Hi, good morning. Supervisor can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. Uh, here, thank you. Uh-huh. Um, Chair Hashtag? Here. Supervisor Jurdy? Here. And Supervisor Williams? Here. Thank you. Okay, Supervisor Jurdy, would you like to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Sure, yeah. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, um, to, to which it stands under <laughs> to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, with indivisible liberty, liberty and justice for all. All right. Um, let's see. Thank you for that. Um, staff, let's, I have this announcement that staff have remained dedicated to expanding public engagement tools in order to provide new ways for the public to interact with virtual Board of Supervisors meetings. We're happy to announce new methods of engagement, including a live listening line. You can call toll free at 888-544-8306. That's 888-544-8306. A voicemail box for recorded public comment at 707-234-6333. That's 707-234-6333. And expanded Zoom attendance via video. More details and instructions can be found on the Board of Supervisors website under public engagement. So we really hope that helps. Um, get more public, um, you know, suit the public better in our interactions. In order to speak via telecomment, one must submit a speaker form online before 8 a.m. the day of the meeting. The link to the telecomment request forms can be found on both the first and last pages of the meeting agenda and on the Board of Supervisors website under agenda and minutes and public engagement. If you have submitted a telecomment request for either public expression or consent calendar, please call in now. All right. So on agenda item number three of public expression, I don't have any comments recorded. Have we had any others? Deputy Clerk. Um, all public expression has been uploaded to the item. Okay. Mr. So Chair? It's uploaded. Yes, Supervisor Brown. Yes, um, number two. Um, just on our agenda, just before public expression um, is a time for proclamations. Okay. So, um, yeah, we were going to do that with the consent calendar, but um, let's go ahead and do uh, the proclamations. So, Supervisor Brown, you Thanks, have a proclamation sir. that you would like to introduce. I do. Um, and I have comment to begin it off. Um, as historically documented, uh, the 19th Amendment to the United States Constitution prohibits the states and the federal government from denying the right to vote to citizens of the United States on the basis of sex. The founders of our country purposely made it hard, but not impossible, to change the Constitution of the United States. Supporters built up solid political strength through many years from the first attempt to get an amendment proposing suffrage for women. It took 50 years and 900 proposals for Congress to finally pass a resolution that ultimately became the 19th Amendment to the United States Constitution. It passed the House of Representatives on May 21st, 1919, followed by the Senate on June 4th, 1919. It was then submitted to the states for ratification. On August 18th, 1920, 
100 years ago from today, Tennessee was the last of the necessary 36 ratifying states to secure adoption. The 19th Amendment's adoption was certified on the 26th, as I just stated, but it was a decades-long movement for women's suffrage at both state and national levels. The sponsorship of this proclamation is also to recognize the organizational work of the Mendocino Women's Political Coalition, MWPC, for the centennial um, celebration of the 19th Amendment within Mendocino County. Katrina Rolinski is spearheading um, the inland celebration of that this historic event or that one that occurred 100 years ago. In Ukiah, everyone is encouraged to view the banner hanging downtown across State Street and also visit the display at Ukiah Civic Center sponsored by the MWPC with the city of Ukiah. Both these displays will continue for two weeks. The Civic Center display includes four large posters telling the suffrage story, along with highlighting focused um, on the building using the suffrage colors of purple for justice, gold for courage, and white for purity. On August 26, flags will fly all along State Street, and I'm hoping others in the residential areas to display flags as well. Awareness, education, and celebration are the purposes of these displays and our proclamation today. It also recognizes the diverse women who fought for suffrage through the nation, giving them a special place in American history. I'd just like to share um, in final comments some colorful history for us in Mendocino County. When the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854 threatened to establish slavery outside of the South, a woman by the name of Clarina Nichols uprooted her family on the West Coast to become a pioneer and activist in Kansas. Her efforts helped catapult her adopted state into the forefront of women's rights, gaining the respect and support of such women as Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Clarina left Kansas for California to be with her son in Mendocino County, where she pioneered and agitated to the end. She is buried in the Potter Valley Cemetery. A.O. Carpenter, the son of Clarina, they hosted Susan B. Anthony at their home in Ukiah when Anthony visited this uh, city to speak at a local rally for the suffrage cause. It's hard to imagine a time in this country when women didn't have many of the rights they do today. But it wasn't all that long ago when things were very different. Thank goodness those days are over, but the fight continues since there are a number of ways women still aren't treated equally to men. Of course, we've come a long way, so let's celebrate our nation's progress. And Mr. Chair, it would be wonderful for you as our leader on the board to read the pro proclamation and after we can hear from our colleagues and the public, including Val Malhowski, who is waiting to speak. So please, sir, read the proclamation. Very good. Thank you very much for that. Proclamation of the Mendocino County Board of Supervisors recognizing the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment of the United States Constitution. Whereas the bold, courageous, and powerful women who fought decades for the ratification of the 19th Amendment to the United States Constitution with the final necessary 36th state adoption on August 18, 1920, deserve special recognition by the County of Mendocino especially on the 100th anniversary of the ratification and onward celebrations of equality taking place on August 26th, the day the amendment was certified in 1920. And whereas California was the 18th state to ratify the 19th amendment on November 1st, 1919, and California holds a special place in women's suffrage history as thousands of California women advocated for the right to vote on the streets in the newspapers, at the state capitol, and throughout the great state. And whereas California women gained the right to vote with the passage of Amendment 8 to the state constitution in 1911, nearly a decade before women voted nationally. 
And whereas the 19th Amendment did not guarantee suffrage for all women, including Native Americans, who did not gain the right to vote until 1924, followed by Asian Pacific Islander Americans in 1952, the African American and Latin Americans suffered voter suppression until passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965 and 1975. And whereas the fact that today women are active in local, state, and national government and are running for office in unprecedented numbers, it reminds us that we all follow in the footsteps of these resolute American suffragists. And whereas the 19th Amendment of the United States Constitution played an important role in advancing the right of all women in the nation. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Supervisors of the County of Mendocino hereby advocates that residents and civic institutions celebrate the 100th anniversary of the passage and ratification of the 19th Amendment, providing for women's suffrage to the Constitution of the United States to honor the role of the ratification in further promoting the core values of our democracy as promised by the Constitution of the United States. Reaffirm the opportunity for students and adults in the county to learn about and commemorate the efforts of the women's suffrage movement and the role of women in our democracy and reaffirm our desire to continue to strengthen democratic participation and to inspire future generations to cherish and preserve the historic precedent established under the 19th Amendment, dated August 18th, 2020, and it will be signed by me as the chair. So thank you all, and um, let's see if there's any board comments before we go to Val Mahowski. Okay. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. Yes, Supervisor McCown. Uh, thank you. I I had not spoken with Supervisor Brown uh, in advance of this item, but uh, I appreciate her recognition of Clarina Nichols, whose son, A.O. Carpenter, uh, married my great-great-aunt Helen uh, in Kansas. Uh, all of the families involved had moved to Kansas to help make Kansas a free state. Uh, and, of course, they later emigrated here, uh, played key roles in development of the community. It's a part of my family history that I'm very proud of, and I appreciate uh, Supervisor Brown for acknowledging some of my forebears. Uh, and, of course, the struggle does continue. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, any other comments before we go to Val Mahowski? All right, is Val on the line? Ms. Mahowski, you're muted. Perfect. Good morning. Good morning, I'm Val Mahowski from Philo, California and uh, the head of the um, Mendocino Women's Political Coalition. Uh, we thank the Board of Supervisors for recognizing August 26th as a historic day, 100th anniversary of women winning the vote. And they did win it because it started in, 19, in 1848 and took over almost uh, over 70 years before it actually came to fruition. Um, throughout that time, uh, Susan B. Anthony and other uh, suffragists uh, went throughout the country and uh, they came even to uh, California and even to Mendocino, Potter Valley, where uh, they met uh, John McGowan's relative. Did you, John, did you say that that was your uh, aunt or your great grandmother? A uh, great great aunt. Your great great aunt. Yes. Susan B. Anthony came and stayed there and uh, wrote her a letter because she was uh, a known suffragist uh, throughout the country. So it's it's been a long long struggle. Many women struggle. They uh, had parades. They went to jail. 
uh, they had to uh, really uh, insist. And the interesting thing is that uh, they weren't, most of them weren't allowed to vote in the election uh, for uh, the states. It was only the Western states which had uh, given women the right to vote. And the reason they did that is they wanted more women to come to their states, and so they opened up suffrage to the women. But it was the men who did it. And uh, also in uh, Mendocino County, it was a very close vote, but uh, the rural county came through for suffrage. So once again, I thank you. And please enjoy the banner that is crossing uh, State Street in Ukiah. And uh, the Ukiah Civic Center will be lit up every night. Uh, and uh, really on, on August 26th, there will be flags up and down State Street celebrating this historic event. So I thank you to the Board of Supervisors. Okay, thank you, okay. Ms. Mahowski. Yes. Um, so let's see, we do have public comment for items not on the agenda. So is Sandra Berman on the line? Hi, this is um, Deputy Clerk Lindsay Dunham. Um, Ms. Berman has withdrawn her request to telecomment. Okay. Is Patrick Kickey on the line? Yes, he's being brought into the meeting now. Okay, thank you. Yes, uh, I am. This is uh, Chair Haschak, members of the board. Um, I'm not sure if CEO Angelo and County Council Curtis are with us. Uh, good morning. My name is Patrick mm -hmm. Hickey. I'm the field representative for SEIU Local 1021. And I'm with you today speaking on behalf of the executive board of our Mendocino County chapter. In her Friday briefing, Dr. Duhan, the public health officer, said that the DOC is an incredible and dedicated team of professionals that have been doing a great job responding to the pandemic. We could not agree more. They have worked tirelessly to get a handle on the local COVID-19 outbreaks through targeted testing and aggressive contact tracing. We have seen positive developments recently with the addition of staff from the state of California, and emergency response volunteers who are being trained to carry out contact tracing. But we need to do more to support the public health department that is leading this effort. Public health should certainly take the lead on this as this is their area of expertise, but they need more foot soldiers to help carry out the effort. In particular, they need the need for bilingual Spanish speakers to assist this effort is acute. This isn't a normal emergency or disaster response. We're entering the sixth month of this crisis, and it isn't likely to end this year. We're already burning people out by not meeting the staffing levels that we should have. We have lost our recently hired director of nursing because of health concerns triggered by the relentless demand of the work. How is this going to be kept up long-term? We need more help, whether it's new hires or people from other county departments or more state contract workers. We can't wait for public health leadership We've been without a public health director for over a year. Our HHSA director is retiring in a month. There is a 25% vacancy rate in public health positions. To face the most challenging public health crisis in our lifetimes, we need a fully staffed and directed public health department. We cannot wait for studies or reviews. We recognize that hiring a public health director in these times when the demand for this skill set is high is a particular challenge but we need to rise to it. Staff is willing to work the overtime necessary to meet this public health challenge, but if we can increase the staff who are being utilized for this effort, we can keep costs to the county down and avoid burning out our staff as this crisis continues. 30 seconds. We can also make sure that all the other vital services that public health does are not neglected. As Dr. Duhan has said, this is an incredible team. Let's give them the support that they need and deserve. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hickey. Um, is Janine Coleman on the line?
Ms. Coleman. Good morning, Honorable Supervisors and Chair Hashek. Uh, Janine Coleman, Executive Director of Origins Council. I'm reaching out this morning to make an urgent request to this board to please consider the immediate removal from the county's publicly searchable databases, all information identifying the location of cannabis farms and other non-retail cannabis businesses. Due to the economic downturn, violent crimes and burglary in this county are on the rise. Due to barriers to banking, cash-based cannabis businesses are extraordinarily vulnerable to crime, which is further incentivized by a thriving illicit market for stolen cannabis products. Following the unprecedented criminal targeting of licensed cannabis businesses during the recent civil unrest in urban areas of California, the state cannabis licensing authorities responded swiftly to industry advocacy and unpublished all identifying information regarding the location of non-retail businesses from their publicly searchable databases. Today, the Mendocino cannabis business community and other businesses and residences located near these farms and facilities urgently need your protection. The resources of our first responders and law enforcement are stretched dangerously thin at present, and this vulnerability threatens to further burden these precious resources. The public spreadsheets could be easily revised to remove the address and APN columns and still serve their purpose. Applications and permits will still be searchable by application ID number, business applicant name, property owner name. Additionally, the status of the permit, whether pending, denied, approved, issued, et cetera, is helpful for those seeking to know whether someone's in good standing or not. Having this data posted without location information is very helpful to applicants and consultants so they can see their status and other information that saves the county many inquiries. Thank you for the opportunity to comment and thank you all for your leadership and dedication to public service during these extraordinarily challenging times. Uh, Chair yeah, Hatch, I, yes, Supervisor Williams. Yeah, can, can we get an answer from uh, staff, maybe uh, Deputy CEO on this one? Um, I know we're trying to cut down on um, agenda items, and so I'd rather not bring it back if staff can just take care of it. But I too have the concern about the publication leading to uh, unnecessary increase in crime. And I, Mr. Chair? Yes, Supervisor Brown. Thank you. And I would just like to add, it's also the neighbors to um, these cannabis business that are also um, put at risk. Thank you. So um, Deputy CEO Janelle Rao, is there an answer for Supervisor Williams? Uh, Janelle, Rao, Janelle Rao, Deputy CEO, uh, we can certainly look into that with Planning and Building Services and have an answer for the board, but um, I'm, I'm not entirely certain under our Track It program where exactly the data is located, but we will definitely um, get some information and, and see what we can do about redacting that. Okay. Sounds like a good direction to go. Okay. Thank you. Um, Hannah Nelson? Oh, I think you're going to speak on, Ms. Nelson has signed up to speak on some of the consent calendar items. So let's move on to the consent calendar. Um, has clerk, has proper notice been established? Deputy Clerk Lindsay Dunham, yes, proper notice has been established. Okay, are there any items to poll? Yes, Mr. Chair. Yes, Supervisor Brown. Thank you, sir. Um, I First, I want to apologize that um, I didn't give any staff a heads up that I would be pulling these items. It, um, it's as a result of some public information that came in this morning, maybe not more than two hours ago. And um, these would be to item 4O, 4P, and 4R. Um, and we may need to take them up later in the day, but I, I would like uh, County Council to explain the legal process of um, for the public uh, to understand why these items are before us today. 
And then within the comment that came in, um, and I'm talking um, in particular, I'm addressing the Farm Bureau um, request that it's not clear how the fire code intertwines with local building code. So they're asking for a response um, from planning staff, code enforcement, and um, the question clarification on the F1 occupancy designation for agricultural crop production, including cultivation, drying, processing, or storage related to these items. So, you know, I just think it's important that everyone understand needs to be clear um, about the flexibility as stated in the Farm Bureau uh, comment of local fire departments, you know, what do they have in choosing what sections to adopt. So we need to understand the public does the legal process as well as um, building and um, planning services along with um, uh, code enforcement, um, a response to how they adopt these um, code changes. Thank you. Chair Haschek. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, Supervisor Williams. I, I was also going to suggest we pull these for separate consideration. Um, I, I would actually rather these come back because I feel like it's putting an undue um, burden on staff to scramble and provide explanation and answer questions last moment. Um, so I'm ha happy to hear them, but I feel like uh, there's more details than what can be worked out in this meeting. Uh, um, I guess the question for a deputy CEO, Ralph, is that is there any time issue on those 4O, 4P and 4R? Is there immediate concern? If I may respond, Mr. Chair, um, I, I don't yeah. know that we have an immediate time crunch on those. However, I would ask um, if the board, rather than simply um, uh, tabling it, if you would at least uh, uh, hold off uh, uh, and leave the possibility of bringing up the items later this meeting, we might actually be able, if there's time, uh, to provide the answers a little bit uh, later today. But um, uh, if not, if there's no time or if we're not able to, to fully answer the questions, we could also table to next meeting. Okay. I felt it was important to do it today um, for all sides. So if staff can respond later today, I'd sure appreciate it. Okay, so we will, let's see, we will table those till later. And hopefully we can get some answers. Are there any other items to be pulled? Mr. Chair? Yes, Supervisor McCowan. Uh, thank you. On item five uh, I, I um, I see that this relates uh, to a single uh, item of litigation, and before committing the amount of money requested for legal fees, it would seem appropriate for the board to first receive an update in closed session to understand where we are in that particular litigation. So um, if there's a time sensitive need to approve some funding in order to pay current billing, uh, I would be in favor of approving a modest amount that would get us uh, to, a, to the next closed session where we could consider this, but I'm reluctant to approve the full amount without the board having the opportunity to understand uh, where we are with this particular litigation. Uh, thank you. Uh, Chair Haschek. Yeah. I, I think Supervisor said uh, 5I. Um, perhaps he's referring, referring to 4I on the consent. That's thank correct. Thank you, Supervisor. <laughs> okay, so you, Supervisor McCowan, you'd like to pull 4I. That's what threw me off. Um, Cur and, correct. Uh, and County Council, is it possible to have an update in closed session before Mr. we consider 4I? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, I don't believe we'd be able to add that to the item today. Uh, I don't know that we'd meet the criteria for uh, a late added agenda item. 
uh, it, it is something that we uh, could be brought forward on uh, not, uh, September 1st uh, at the board's next meeting. Uh, I would, I, I would um, uh, defer, however, to risk in terms of uh, whether or not there's any um, time issues in, in terms of the contract. Uh, and actually, if I may, I just also add, um, uh, uh, I believe closed session may be appropriate if that's what the board wants, but uh, another option the board might have uh, would be to um, consider any um, uh, confidential updates. Um, it, th there wouldn't be room for discussion uh, uh, and there wouldn't be room for questions, but if the board, uh, the board is entitled to receive any confidential communication from, uh, uh, from its attorney uh, uh, in the, any pending litigation um, uh, outside of the context uh, of the meeting. So um, that is also something that could be provided to the board as background. And that could be done today. Is that what you're saying? Uh, to the extent such updates uh, already exist, I'm not sure how much risk has at this moment from LCW. Mm -hmm. uh, Janelle Rao, Deputy CEO, in um, in working with risk management and our risk analyst, uh, I do believe that there is some amount that does need to be increased on this current contract to cover our existing um, commitments. We can have an update later um, in the afternoon if you'd like to pull this for separate consideration and can give you that update then. And then um, as requested, we could bring back an item for an update in closed session on the first. Okay, that would be good. So why don't we table that until this afternoon and noon also? Anything else need to be pulled? Um, and we, we do have uh, Hannah Nelson who's called in about 4AE. So I'd like to pull 4AE so that Ms. Nelson could speak to it before we vote on it. Okay. So um, anything else? Okay, so we are going to table for O, for P, for R, for I until this afternoon. And um, we will hear from Ms. Nelson right now about 4AE. Ms. Nelson? Deputy Clerk Lindsay Dunham, Hannon, you are muted. Okay, good morning, Ms. Nelson. Good morning. Sorry about the technical difficulty. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Uh, I also spoke briefly to the sheriff yesterday, and we just want everyone to know that, of course, we are in full support and continue to support enforcement of uh, cannabis cultivation on public lands and that which uh, results in egregious environmental violations. We certainly also support the public safety efforts that the sheriff is engaged in to keep everyone safe. Uh, we submitted this memo because we felt it was important, even though in the context of a narrative of a grant, to have the county affirmatively and continuously acknowledge that the failed paradigm that we're currently in for a whole variety of reasons often results in people appearing to not be fully licensed, let's say, by the state or by a permit by the county, but who are currently in good standing with the county. And the narrative regarding the grant application, and we're not suggesting to not accept that funding, we're just asking that thoughtful attention be put forth every time the narrative is uh, discussed regarding proper licensing and permitting that, you know, things are a mess right now and that there are a lot more than 275 people out there who are trying their best to adhere to regulations that are often confusing and duplicative and at this point perilous in terms of resulting in full licensure at the end of the day. So that's the reason why we were writing the memo, and we just hope that careful attention to reflect the accurate situation, particularly the need for a clear pathway forward for 
permitting and licensing uh, in order for enforcement to be effective is what we ask and that the acknowledgement of more than the 275 annual permit holders being referenced in the grant application are in fact in good standing. 30 Thank seconds. You. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Nelson. Okay. Do, so there's no other public comment. Do I hear a motion? Mr. Chair? Yes. Thank Super you, Mr. sir. Um, I move to um, approve the consent calendar with the exception of items 4O, 4P, 4R, and 4I. That'll be taken up later today. Second. Okay, very good. All right, any further comment? Okay, Deputy Clerk of the Board, could you conduct a roll call vote? Yes. Supervisor Williams? Yes. Supervisor Jurdy? Yes. Supervisor McCowan? Yes. Supervisor Brown? Yes. And Chair Hashchak? Yes. The motion carries unanimously. Okay, very good. Agenda item number 5A, discussion and possible action, including an update associated with the novel coronavirus COVID-19, including possible direction regarding essential services in Mendocino County, operational preparation and response, and associated countywide economic impacts. The sponsor is the executive office. So I'm going to turn to the deputy CEO, Janelle Rao. Good morning, uh, board members, Janelle Rao, deputy CEO. Um, just very quickly, I am not certain if Dr. Duhan will be able to join us this morning. I know she had conflicting meetings. Um, I will turn this over to Becky Emery, who is running the DOC for an update. Thank you. Okay. Good morning, Ms. Emery. Good morning, Supervisor Hashcheck, members of the board, Becky Emery, I'm the DOC manager. Uh, currently, we have 556 people in Mendocino County that have tested positive for COVID-19. We're continuing to see increasing numbers and are continuing to monitor 96 people with the virus, eight of whom are currently hospitalized. These increasing trends continue to, initiate, to be initiated through family gatherings and spreading through these gatherings, as well as some of the workplace interactions. We're identifying more workplace spread, primarily associated with like breaks and lunches where people are eating together and engaging in interactions of 10 or more minutes without wearing their mask because they're eating. Uh, we encourage businesses to evaluate their lunch rooms and break areas to ensure social distancing and limit ma unmasked interactions whenever possible. We're working diligently to ensure that people are placed in isolation and quarantine and that we're engaging in case investigations and contact tracing timely. We've been more successful in this effort because we are receiving our timely test results much more often now. However, we're still challenged with our bilingual staffing needs and connecting with the individuals. In some situations, our calls are not being taken. We're using CalConnect system to text these individuals so that they expect our call and that it uh, is gonna be coming from an unknown number. Uh, we are having some success with this, but we're continuing to work through that challenge. On Monday, August 17th, Mendocino County was placed on the state watch list due to the current count of more than 100 cases per 100,000 residents in a 14 day period. Currently, we're averaging 11 cases per day over a 30 day window. The action by the state has been done retroactively dated back to July 25th. Are currently our health officer orders do align with the governor's requirements and as a result there are going to be limited changes to be implemented at this time one of the most significant impacts of the watch list is the requirement for schools that want to open to in-person education and the need to submit a waiver to do so at this time there are nine schools that have opened for in-person education with precautionary measures in place Dr. Duhan has been a strong advocate with the state for these schools to continue to be open under their plan without having to submit a waiver. And while that's still undecided at the state level, she's been unwavering in her support on this matter. Um, we continue to work with our community partners for outbreaks and testing in these situations. Additionally, we continue to partner with local clinics, including Mendocino Coast Clinic, Redwood Coast Medical Services, Long Valley Health Clinic, and Anderson Valley Health Clinic in partnership with UCSF. The tests or results are now being returned faster, often within four to five days. Through the new portal that UCSF has initiated, we're able to sort the results and forward them onto the clinics as well. 
whereas previously we were finding that it would take up to 30 minutes to identify a match on one test result, we're now able to match up a full, a full batch of tests in this time frame. Uh, we are continuing to streamline this effort and appreciate the partnership of those clinics. Additionally, we're continuing our partnership with Consolidated Tribal Health Clinic, collaborating to ensure that our American Indian communities uh, with focused testing and efforts and supports. This collaboration has helped administer 1,112 surveillance tests since, July, since June 27th. It's through these continued partnerships and diligent efforts to engage in social distancing, wearing masks correctly over the nose and under the chin to ensure full coverage of your mouth and nose, diligent cleaning and sanitizing and sheltering in place as much as possible that will come together to curb this increase in the cases that we're experiencing. Thank you for your time. Chair Haschek, I have two questions. Thank you. Um, is Supervisor Williams, you can't wait? Can we wait Welcome. until the end? I will wait my turn. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see, Deputy CEO Darcy Antle. Good morning, Chair Hashex uh, and members of the board. Um, I just have a brief update this morning. I wanted to report out that um, the county has put in a total of greater than 65,000 hours into this event. <clears throat> One third of those hours are from public health, followed closely by the Sheriff's Office for Enforcement, and then the Executive Office, which continues to support um, Carmel Angelo as our incident commander and all the work that she is doing, your finance team, and your disaster recovery team. I would like to point out two contracts that we have entered in recently. We have a CMSP grant that we've entered into with NCO for 150,000 for housing for individuals with housing insecurity. The other uh, contract is with NCO for $250,000 for food insecurities. We are working closely with CSAC and the Department of Finance on submitting the coronavirus relief funds uh, plan, the, the plan that you all reviewed at the last meeting um, on August 4th. The report is due to the state. Our expenditure plan is due to the state on September 1st. And I'm also working closely with Dr. Duhan on a um, California Department of Public Health monthly attestation report to ensure that we are meeting the public health guidelines, which will enable us to receive the CARES Act funds. Um, and that concludes my report for today. Okay, thank you. I'm Sheriff Kendall. Good morning, Supervisor Hatschak, members of the board. Good morning. So our COVID stats from August 1st through August 18th, we had 43 contacts regarding facial covering. Most of these were in and around the town of Mendocino. Uh, this is actually good news because it shows greater compliance, uh, less contacts. We were running about a dozen a day and now we've dropped significantly um, for a lot of different reasons. We're continuing to work with Mask Up Mendocino and the um, uh, various social, or, uh, social groups who are assisting us. Uh, we provided flyers to volunteers for posting in the areas, mostly in and around the coast, all the way over to Anderson Valley. We've got some that'll be going up north here shortly also. Currently, we've had one case in the jail that we reported on. This was a subject who was uh, wanted out of another jurisdiction, or excuse me, wanted out of our jurisdiction, however, was arrested in another state. He was brought here, uh, tested positive for COVID. He still remains in isolation. Um, and we're continu continuing to have uh, more testing completed in the jail. At this point in time, we have some tests out uh, and we will see what the results are here in the next couple of days. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And um, John Martyr. Good morning, Chairman Hasek and members of the board. Um, in the two weeks since we last had a board of supervisors meeting, the uh, special investigation units received uh, 18 calls for service. Uh, we had six days with no calls for service. Uh, of those 18 calls, 44% uh, were handled by SIU, 
33% were uh, given to Uka City of Ukiah Code Enforcement, 16% were given to Willits City Code Enforcement, and 5% were given to the Fort Bragg um, City Code Enforcement. Uh, we had 22% of our calls were not as reported. 16% uh, we issued out uh, copies of the public health order and made an educational contact with, with people. 16% uh, of the calls were regarding gathering, large groups of, of people gathering, and about half of the calls, 50%, were uh, mask-related calls. Uh, I'd like to echo uh, Sheriff Kendall's comments. Uh, we have noticed a substantial drop in uh, calls for service. Uh, I do attribute this to our county-wide effort of outreach through our social um, uh, community partners. Um, and also our, our ongoing public relations campaigns uh, on, on various media. Um, I would say uh, our calls for service are down about half of what they were prior to uh, this time period. So I, I think in a way that's, that shows very good uh, compliance. My investigators report uh, out in the community that um, they're seeing uh, uh, almost 100% compliance with the uh, masking ordinance uh, when they're driving around. Uh, we've been making stops at numerous commercial establishments, uh, talking to business order owners, and handing out uh, informational flyers as well. So I think uh, our efforts are, are well received, and I'm, I'm happy with the numbers uh, that we uh, are, are seeing so far. That's all I have. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, Trent Taylor or John Burks, are you filling in for him today for code enforcement? Yes, I am, Chair. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, good morning, uh, board and community. This is John Burks, Acting Code Enforcement Supervisor. Uh, along with uh, Chief Martyr and Sheriff Kendall, our complaint volume is also uh, significantly down. Our in-depth investigations are uh, down as well. So, so far we have 108 total cases that required in-depth investigations. 105 were closed with compliance. We have two active cases currently under investigation and one case in citation. Uh, of the 108 cases, 54 were businesses, 54 were vacation home rentals. And of those 108, 24 were inland and 84 were coastal. And I think that's all I have to report at this moment, but I am here for questions. Okay. Thank you. And then Trey Strickland. Is Mr. Strickland on the line? Okay, so that's it for the presentations then. So um, we'll go to questions and we'll start off with um, Supervisor Williams. I have three questions, I suppose, for the DOC manager. Are visitor services and visitors in general a leading cause of COVID cases? How many uh, cases have been traced to visitors? So our primary spread is from families from one to another and it's within local. Uh, I don't have the exact number, but I will get that for how many are traced to visitors. I believe that last time uh, when I had checked it was 13, but I will confirm what the current number is, Supervisor Williams. And and thir a ballpark figure is fine. And um, how many cases have been traced to salons? Um, at this time, I do not have any cases that have been traced to salons. So it sounds like the uh, leading cause for cases is private social gatherings, not business interactions and visitors. That is what we have identified. Thank you. Okay, and we'll go to Supervisor Brown. Um, I want to go back to public expression and perhaps staff can respond to um, uh, Mr. Hickey's comments. Um, you know, I am concerned about staff stress, all the hours they've been working. Um, but I guess my real question is in the CARES Act funding we received, is there amount of money that we could hire um, temporary staff, extra help um, to help run the center? So it relieves some of the hours being put in by staff. 
That's a question for Deputy CEO Ralph. Um, whomever could answer that. I mean, can the CARES Act funding we receive, can some of that be used? Because it all has to be used by December 31st, I believe, of 2020. But can we use some of that funding um, for t to hire temporary staff, extra help to help run the center? Okay, Deputy CEO Antle. Uh, Deputy CEO Darcy Antle through the chair. Yes, there there are some parameters around the CARES funding, but yes, we can hire staff to help with contract tracing and contract investigations. That specifically is called out in the CARES Act. Okay, thank you. Supervisor Brown? That's all, sir, but it should be something we consider. Right. Supervisor McCowan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I do have a, a number of items. And to start with, a uh, follow up on uh, the issue raised by Mr. Hickey and by Supervisor Brown, we did approve at our last meeting. Uh, staff recommendations on how to utilize the CARES Act funding, including 750,000 for mask up Mendo slash outreach. Uh, please refresh me on how much of uh, that line item uh, has been allocated through contracts. I know we do have at least one with NCO, but uh, what portion of that money First, what portion has been allocated and to which agencies? And second, uh, therefore, which amount is currently unallocated? Darcy Antle, Deputy, contract. Darcy Antle, Deputy CEO, through the chair. So uh, approximately 250,000 of that is currently obligated. A portion of that, a larger portion is to NCO who will be doing Mask Up Mendo and working with the Latinx community. And then we have another uh, pot, I think around 50,000 to 75,000 that is out with the chambers. Um, so approximately 250,000 of that is obligated currently. Uh, thank you. So we appear to have 500,000 currently available that must be uh, spent by the end of the year. And uh, this should be a high priority item, uh, particularly we have identified uh, for some time now that we need additional help with uh, case investigation and contact tracing. I believe specifically for the Spanish speaking community and uh, we've made suggestions before that in addition to working through NCO, it would be advisable to work directly with the uh, Latinx community organizations that already have uh, contacts uh, in the community and I believe could rapidly assist in um, helping communicate the messages that we want people to hear that they don't seem to be getting. And it's perhaps not that they're not uh, hearing about the necessity to social distance, to wear a mask, to avoid gatherings. They're not hearing it perhaps from a source that they consider uh, credible or culturally competent. So again, I. I really encourage uh, staff to explore the possibilities of contracting directly with groups like uh, Ucaya Vecinos en Acción, uh, Nuestra Alianza, uh, Latinx Alliance. Uh, there are other organizations like uh, Community Action Network in Walala, and I know we don't have an identified problem in Walala yet but they have culturally competent staff. So uh, I really encourage us to 
explore these opportunities to partner with existing community organizations. If I could, I'd also, in there, Supervisor and, McCallum, yeah, that's mainly a comment, but I'm, I yeah. welcome any response as well. Yeah, if I could interject, I just spoke with um, leaders of the, the Latinx community last night and their issue, well, they thought that the structure that we were creating sure. NCO was going to be sufficient and that, you know, going directly to those organizations and having contracts wasn't, um, they didn't feel like the capacity was there to, to do it that way. They'd rather have it through NCO and do that outreach and they could certainly facilitate the out outreach. So, so I appreciate your comments on that. Uh, thank you. The uh, other issue I'd like to <clears throat> continue with is the lack of documentation that business sectors impacted by the watch list restrictions have not been identified as contributing to the local increase in cases. And Supervisor Williams asked specifically about salons. Have we identified that uh, salons, barbers, personal care uh, technicians, uh, which includes uh, estheticians, massage therapists, um, nail salons, and a variety of other personal care, or that uh, gyms uh, have contributed to the increased caseload. Do we have any documented cases of operators in these industries or patrons of these businesses contributing to the caseload? So if I may, through the chair, Becky Emery, yes. uh, DOC manager. Thank you, sir. Uh, Supervisor McCowan, um, I, I do know that I have looked at the list for hair salons. I have not looked at the list for gyms, um, masseuses, or other uh, entities, but I can certainly do that, and I will provide that information to this uh, board in a, a report, a written follow-up report. Uh, thank you. I would appreciate that. <clears throat> also, I wanted to ask if we have an update on our collaboration with the city of Ukiah, which uh, was going to assist with uh, data analysis, uh, mapping of hotspots, uh, and perhaps also targeted outreach uh, to the community. Uh, any update on current progress uh, with that effort? So again, through the chair, uh, we are continuing to work very closely with Tammy Bartlemay through the city of Ukiah and the geo mapping. Um, as our information changes day to day, uh, getting that geo mapping um, targeted has been a little more difficult than expected. Uh, however, it is very close to that end result of where we're able to see the current hotspots and reaching out and doing those efforts. And we'll be working very closely with um, our community partners in that effort uh, as we move forward. Thank you. And what progress have we made in targeted engagement with the California Department of Public Health in recognition of the fact that we are now officially on the state watch list. That's a question for Becky Emery. Thank you, Supervisor Hashtag through the chair. Uh, we have had regular conversations with the state. Uh, Dr. Duhan was almost daily. Uh, I think there may have been one or two days last week. She may have, have not discussed with them, but uh, really and truly having daily calls with the state um, to discuss not only the watch list, but our next steps in moving forward. As I've stated, she has been very proactive in ensuring that um, 
her current health officer orders align with the state requirements in effort to um, support Mendocino County in responding quickly and diligently to the increase in cases. And uh, I, I really believe as a health officer, she has taken, uh, even though the state did not have us initially on the watch list, she was aware of the requirements and followed those to support Mendocino County in uh, addressing the increase and in effort to uh, reduce that increase as quickly and as efficiently as possible. Uh, she continues to have those conversations. As I said, she is uh, advocating very strongly for schools that are currently open so that they do not have to do a waiver. Uh, she is continuing to have ongoing conversations with the state to discuss the next steps for Mendocino County. Uh, and I believe that was clearly demonstrated based on even the governor calling out the health officer for Mendocino County yesterday in her efforts and the interactions and conversations that they've been having to that effect. Uh, thank you. I appreciate that uh, the health officer acted uh, preemptively to place Mendocino County on the watch list restrictions once it was understood that we met the criteria to be on the watch list. Uh, however, uh, the concern as expressed by the Board of Supervisors at our last meeting was for the need to uh, encourage the state to consider actual verifiable local data in deciding what appropriate restrictions are for counties on the watch list. So we are in the position of uh, a number of sectors uh, are subject to state watch list restrictions, uh, first by the action of uh, our county, but from yesterday forward by the action of the state. And I would hope that through these calls with the state, an effort would be made to uh, make the state aware that the business sectors that are being subject to the watch list restrictions are not the business sectors that are contributing to the increased uh, caseload. Uh, if we are not able to secure some relief for these businesses soon, many of them will fail. And I won't belabor the negative uh, health consequences of driving people into poverty, but I think we're all well aware that many of the negative indicators for community health are escalating in Mendocino County, and we already ranked uh, high uh, statewide on a per capita basis. So again, my concern, we need to be advocating in these calls uh, that the state uh, recognize that there is very limited value in restricting business sectors that are not identified by data as contributing to the increased caseload. Okay. And if I may through the chair. Yes. Thank you, Supervisor Hatchet. Supervisor McCowan, I know that, that Dr. Duhan has been a strong advocate as well for um, rural counties, uh, recognizing that rural counties have very different structures and needs and have to be evaluated differently uh, and that we do not all align with especially larger counties uh, in the much more urban populated areas uh, and that there are differences for us that they need to look at in some of those considerations. So I do know that those discussions are occurring as well uh, and that there needs to be um, some evaluation specific to rural communities and what our structure is and where we're seeing spread. Uh, so those are definitely points that Dr. Duhan has been bringing forward. And if I could Thank add you. to that, uh, Supervisor McCowan, that um, uh, thank at, the you, last, Ms. at the last thank meeting. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll have one more point before we leave this item. Thank you. Okay, and we'll go around, certainly. Um, at the last meeting, you know, it was decided that Supervisor Williams and I would, would write a letter to the state about this kind of request for data <clears throat> and the um, disconnect between what the public health order is at the state level, the watch list requirements, 
and what's going on that we're seeing on the ground here in Mendocino County, especially for the businesses that you've been noting. Um, and so Supervisor Williams and I talked about it. And, and at that time, we weren't on the watch list. So we thought it would be premature to, to go ahead and write this letter to the state. So we sent out notification to the board. Um, and so to say that we were just going to wait until we got on the watch list, now that we're on the watch <coughs> list, Supervisor Williams and I are going to proceed with that and we should have this letter out by, by Thursday. And that's going to be requesting that the state look at our local data as far as these businesses. So, so I hope that clears up what happened last time and how we're going to move forward with that in collaboration with the public health officer. So, Supervisor Jurdy, do you have any questions or comments? <clears throat> I, I, I do. Um, so I, I think it may, it may have been noted by Mr. Hickey's comments that, that we're now in month five. I think it's almost exactly five months that we are in this public health crisis, which obviously is impacting everyone in Mendocino County, all members of the public, um, and uh, county staff in virtually every department, if not every department. And um, I'm just, I am concerned about now that we're, you know, we're five months into this thing and no end in sight. And, and, I, and I don't wanna see, you know, staff members uh, burn out, resign, you know, end their careers early. Um, I want to make sure that we're we're dealing with uh, the you know sort of the end game here you know until we can get to the point where there is a nationally available widely available vaccine. Um, Supervisor McCown, you might want to mute yourself for a second. Um, and uh, so I, I don't know what's the solution. I, I feel like you know we're we're all as board members we're somewhat isolated from uh, county operations more than normal, obviously. Uh, but maybe it would be appropriate to have an ad hoc committee of the board um, to do sort of a check-in with the CEO and with um, key county staff to make sure that we're properly staffing um, and providing for uh, whether it's extra help or, um, uh, you know, some extra staffing in some of these areas so people can take a break. You know, I, I think we have many county employees who haven't probably had a vacation, uh, even like a weekend um, in the last five months. I just want to make sure that that we're taking that into account because I really would hate to see some people resign and retire early um, uh, and just end their careers abruptly. You know, it's not going to be good for the public. It's not going to be good for the organization. At some point, this um, pandemic will be over, and I'd hate to have the county as an organization be in a shambles by the time that happens. If I may, through the chair, Becky Emery. Go, go ahead, Becky. I think the chair is muted. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I, I can say that we have submitted requests to hire additional staff for this effort. Uh, I do know that we all share your concern as far as the impacts to our staff, the long-term ability to respond to this need, and um, have had discussions with CEO Angelo and Deputy CEO Antle as far as uh, the ability to use CARES funds to uh, increase staffing and supports. And so we have submitted not only extra help, but also permanent position requests. Uh, um, for this effort specifically that would then uh, roll into supports to our communicable disease throughout Mendocino County and responding. So we do share your concerns and are trying to look forward on those efforts as well to ensure that we have not just short term, but some longer term goals and um, responses to be able to respond because we all know or believe that this is not a um, a quick response effort and it is definitely looking at as though it will be at least through the whole year. Uh, if I may, through the chair, Darcy Antle, Deputy CEO, um, to comment, uh, support Becky's comments, that is correct. We are looking at hiring a COVID unit, three to five individuals to help manage uh, this effort and the ongoing effort for, for, um, for COVID. Uh, we expect at least one year, possibly two years needing this team. Um, you know, the statement is even if we get the injection or the vaccine within the next six months, 
everybody doesn't get the get the vaccine day one, right? And we all have to sign up to get it. So it's going to take a long haul. Um, we're, we're looking at two years uh, right now uh, to even support this team, get it up, get it going. Uh, we're working very closely. Um, this is uh, CEO Angelo, uh, Director Tammy Moss Chandler, and uh, Janine Miller from Public Health, and uh, uh, Mary Alice uh, Willerford uh, from Public Health as well, um, on how to put this team together. Uh, I believe we have our first person on board uh, to help us with this effort, uh, and so I think you'll be hearing more about it in the next uh, next board meeting on the first. And I guess my follow-up question, question to Supervisor Dirties is, you know, we're hearing about the public health, the contact tracing, all of that. Um, what about law enforcement? Because I can't imagine that law enforcement isn't feeling the stress too of having to deal with the, the uptick in um, just regular crime and also trying to deal with all these issues around COVID too. So um, I'm concerned about, you know, the staffing for law enforcement. Um, is there any, can, can CARES money be used for that too? Ms. Emery or? Uh, Darcy Antle, Deputy oh. CEO. Uh, certainly it calls for public safety through the CARES Act support. Um, I would need to work with, uh, Sheriff Kindle and Under Sheriff uh, Brewster to understand their needs a little bit further. Okay, thank you. I'd appreciate that. Um, so, Supervisor Jerdy, are, are you all right with that information? Have we covered enough of what's going on, or do you think that we still need this ad hoc to to deal with the issues? Well, I, I certainly appreciate the work that's underway and, and hearing about it. Um, I just. I, I suspect I'm not the only one on the board who's wondering about this issue and, and wanting to see that something successful is put in place. I mean, I am concerned with um, some resignations that have taken place and, and I'm concerned that there will be more. And um, I don't want it to see that happen. I want us to make sure that we get something in place and give hope to the employees who are in place that have not resigned, that, that, that hope is on the way and that they, they should not resign. So. I think we want to see something move pretty quickly and want to make sure that's communicated to the employees as quickly as possible so we don't see additional resignations because I, I think it's it's going to be um, a, a big disappointment if that happens. So I, I would be happy if we had an ad hoc committee to get more information and to know how this is going to be rolled out and informed um, so the employees would know about it. But if, if staff feels that they can get something in place and communicate to that to the employees, maybe even before our next board meeting, that'd be great. All right, so are you volunteering to be on the ad hoc? I would if the board would want one, yeah. And I would also volunteer. Okay, very good. Um, so I'll make that appointment as an ad hoc to deal with the staffing in regards to the COVID-19 situation. Right. Is that clear, Deputy Clerk of the Board? Janelle Rao, Deputy CEO, I believe we have it. Um, we'll take that as a general consensus. Thank you. Okay, very good. Um, let's see. I would just like to add, if you're done, Supervisor Journey, with your comments for now. Um, let's see. Certainly staffing was a question for all departments. And um, with the Latinx community and our you know, high numbers. I just like to add that I don't know if it's people not hearing the message. You know, certainly when we had the presentation about health disparities and everything, that there were certainly a lot of factors leading into the high rates of the Hispanic community getting COVID, certainly with um, housing, you know, of multiple people, multiple generations in housing for. Um, a lot of times in Hispanic community, that is certainly a factor. People working in jobs where they're essential workers, they have to be on the front line, they're, they're working with the public. And um, so there's lots of factors like that. It's not just not hearing the message. So, so I hope that um, we're taking that into consideration. And, um, figure, you know, I know that we've looked at when 
people in the Latinx community get COVID, you know, what we're doing for alternative housing if they don't have a place within their housing unit to, to self-isolate or to quarantine. So I appreciate the staff's work on, on those issues. And, um, and so those are, it's a complicated issue. And hopefully, you know, I'm hearing good things from the mask up Mendocino and the outreach they're doing. I think that we, um, with that um, workshop we had the other day about the Latinx issues, that we're getting more translation available to people. Um, so, so there's lots of issues around that whole thing. And with that, I'll move on to the next round. Um, Supervisor Williams, do you have any more questions? No. Okay, Supervisor Brown. No, sir, thank you. Okay, Supervisor McCowan. Supervisor McCowan. I think he's on mute. Supervisor McCowan, you are self-muted. Okay, we'll go. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, thank you. Um, I'd like to come back to the outreach, which we've identified that we have uh, significant funding available on that line item from CARES Act funding that it can be used for case investigation and contact tracing. Uh, can we direct or encourage, authorize the ad hoc that we have just appointed to uh, work closely with staff on how we can utilize some of those CARES Act funding to uh, to get the necessary staffing, whether it's hiring <clears throat> additional employees, uh, contracting out, or working with the state. We all know it's a critical need, uh, particularly to try and get on top of the increased caseload in the Latinx community. <clears throat> so, uh, and we know the funds uh, have to be expended within a defined period of time. Uh, hopefully there's uh, full support to go in that direction and use the funding that we have to address the critical need that we've identified. And then I have a couple of other items. Okay, is there any problem with having the ad hoc look at that? Hearing none, it sounds like a very good idea. So, so let's proceed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. One other issue that we know has been <clears throat> problematic is timeliness of test results. And it was very encouraging to hear the reports that that has improved, uh, sounds like dramatically. It sounds like we're getting most test results back within four to five days. It remains a bit of a concern in that the ideal would be probably within 24 or 48 hours, if not less. But also my understanding of the state watch list criteria is that in considering uh, the, the caseload, the 14 day case rate, that's computed based on a three day lag. So count back three days from today and they are evaluating whether we meet the watch list criteria based on the 14 days prior to that. And yet with some test results not coming back for four or five days or longer, uh, the data for that 14 day period is incomplete. So that is an ongoing issue that obviously we would welcome any assistance from the state in uh, being able to shorten the, the time lag between testing and receiving the test results. And just to, we've already given direction, but I will note that the issue of adequate case investigation and contact tracing, particularly for the Latinx community, is one of the action items uh, identified by the state in their county data chart for Mendocino County. So we're perfectly in, in alignment with the state in 
uh, giving direction there and also in reaching out to them for help. Uh, and I, I can wait for another round. I, I have truly only one more item this time. Mr. Chair? Mr. Chair? Supervisor Brown. Thank you, sir. Um, Supervisor McCowan, in response um, to some of your statements, um, uh, Cal Office of Emergency Services has statewide calls um, every week, twice a week, sometimes it's three or four times a week. And just exactly your statements, help from the state um, in getting tests testing to um, be more quickly, um, you know, a quicker turnaround, as well as, I forgot your other point, um, but contact uh, tracing, I think, was one of them. Uh, but anyway, every time I'm on there, those are the requests coming not only from the county representatives, but also cities. So, um there is push and shove that the state give more help. Uh, so I, I wanted to just comment on that. Thank you. Okay. And if Thank I you. for the chair, and, Supervisor yeah. Hashtag. Yes. Uh, this is Becky Emery, the DOC manager. Um, I just wanted to be really clear. Uh, the four to five day turnaround is not for all of our labs. That's specifically to the UCSF labs. Uh, we are still seeing some delay in the other labs and are working through those processes. Uh, we do have regular calls, weekly calls with the testing task force for the state, and they are aware and working through that as well, much as Supervisor Brown said through her calls. Uh, additionally, we have regular calls with California Department of Public Health regarding the the testing data or the, the data that the state is monitoring and working with them for them to be able to get a closer timeline on our data and, and in comparison. So those are items that are on regular conference calls that we are discussing. All right. And um, Supervisor Jerdy, you have any other comments? No additional comments. Thank you. Okay, Supervisor Williams. No further. Okay, Supervisor McCowan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to come back to the issue of the letter that the board authorized two weeks ago. And I think the expectation of the board at that time was that letter was urgent, that it would go out uh, in a timely manner. And it was surprising to hear, at least surprising to me to hear that the letter had not been sent. Uh, the reason being, well, gee, we weren't on the watch list yet, and if we get on the watch list, we can revisit this. It was um, very foreseeable that we would be on the watch list. In fact, it was foreseeable as of July 25th. So the same need that existed on August 4th to make the state aware of the um, of, of the inequity, the unfairness of restricting businesses that are not contributing to the increased caseload, uh, that same need to make the state aware of that and that the dynamics that, uh, as Becky Emery stated earlier, that prevail in urban centers may very well not prevail in Mendocino County. So we don't have... Uh, a lot of businesses that uh, that involve large numbers of workers in close contact. We don't have a significant amount of public transportation. We don't have a significant inner city commuting. We're much more spread out and um, low population density. And many of our uh, business operators in the barbering and uh, hair salons and personal care services are one or two person operations. So they aren't large shops that may have dozens of uh, operators and customers. So that 
same need to educate the state that existed August 4th has existed continuously and, and exists now. Uh, having been given the information that the ad hoc chose not to send the letter that the board had directed, I did uh, draft a letter last night that has been uploaded to this agenda item. I believe it's been uploaded as the last item at the bottom of all public correspondence. I would request that rather than uh, leaving this item of the COVID update uh, at this point or leaving it for the day, that we defer the item till this afternoon uh, the board can have an opportunity to look over the draft letter uh, that I've submitted, and then perhaps we can discuss uh, whether uh, we wish to give direction to send the letter or send it as modified or not send it at all. But I think this is, we're, we're at a critical time for many of these small businesses. We have, uh, I didn't count them, there might be a couple of dozen uh, submittals by members of the public uh, advocating that we be their advocates in their efforts to try and save their businesses and continue to provide service to the community. And some of them eloquently make the point that uh, they're not just cutting hair or uh, doing someone's nails, but the interaction with their clients is much more complex and has a therapeutic value. So there's a lot of reasons, I think, why we want to uh, act uh, quickly and deliberately on this issue uh, in collaboration with our public health department, of course, but uh, in advocating on behalf of these local businesses to the state. So again, I request that we come back to this item after the board has had an opportunity to review the proposed letter and uh, if that's acceptable, we could have further discussion later in the day. Thank you. Well, Supervisor McCowan, I think that we have a very full agenda today and I haven't had time to look at your letter. I don't know if anyone else on the board has, but um, Supervisor Williams has drafted a letter and we have been in consultation. We will look over your letter and see if um, we can incorporate parts of it into Supervisor Williams' letter, and then we can move forward. I think this is going to be a quick process because we do understand that there's an urgency to it at this point now that we're on the watch list. So Supervisor Williams, do you have any comments on that? No, no only agreement with you that uh, at our last meeting, we thought we were being put on the watch list immediately within a day or so. And of course that didn't happen. And it happened less than 24 hours ago, um, arguing that the state has restricted us when in fact they hadn't, that we had restricted ourselves preemptively to try to maintain some local control for what we thought was coming, felt like too convoluted of an argument. Um, I think it, we're in a better situation now that we are on the watch list. And in fact, it is the state that's restricting business. And I think that one of the things that we should also add to our letter in light of this current situation with being put on the watch list is that my understanding is that if we're on the watch list and we make it off the watch list, then we still have to abide by the state regulations. I think that in our situation, since we voluntarily went on the watch list, kind of adopted those kind of restrictions, then, then we can make the case to the state that you know, when we go off the watch list, then we should have the autonomy of um, taking those businesses off the state restrictions also. So I think that that's something that we could incorporate Supervisor Williams in our letter. Chair has checked. Um, one piece of information that we're missing that may be beneficial to the state is an analysis uh, to date of the uh, 500 plus cases we've had. Where have we traced those cases? Okay. How many private gatherings, how many salons, how many grocery stores, how many visitor services? I wonder if we could um, ask public health to provide us with those numbers to incorporate into the letter. Yeah, I think that'd be appropriate. Ms. Emery, is that something that we could do? Through the chair, Supervisor Hashtag, we will work diligently to get that to you. Uh, 
by Friday. Will that work? Um, we were hoping Thursday. We will make it by Thursday. Thank you. Okay. So I hope that's all right and a good um, path forward for us. Mr. Okay. Chair. Supervisor McCowan. I would uh, suggest not making any reference in the letter to local control or local autonomy. Uh, that was a nice theory that was put forth. However, when the state put us on the watch list yesterday, they did so retroactively to July 25th. We do not have local control. We did not have local control. It's accurate that even after the caseload would drop below the watch list criteria, we will not be relieved of watch list restrictions until the state public health officer approves that. Uh, it's very likely, given the current trend, that it will be uh, some time before we drop below the state watch list criteria for a 14-day caseload. Uh, that makes it imperative that we work to convince the state that we should have local control <clears throat> for the health officer to make decisions on business restrictions based on local conditions and local data. Um, it's, I think, unfortunate that this effort didn't begin two weeks ago. I'm glad to hear that your intent on seeing that it happened now. Um, again, I would suggest that um, a letter has been written that I think addresses uh, the points that the board would like to make. I do request you at least do the courtesy of reviewing the letter. And then if we come back later and you say, thank you very much, uh, your input is uh, not appropriate, fine, we can move on. I would like uh, you to at least take the time uh, on a break, which we will certainly have a couple of breaks today to review the letter and see if it addresses the intent of the board or not. Thank you. Okay, and Supervisor Williams and I will take into consideration the letter, certainly. All right, so with that, any other comments from the board? about the COVID-19 situation. Okay, hearing none, we will take a break now until it's 1034, we'll take a 15 minute break, so 1049, all right? So we're on break.
Agenda item 5B, which is discussion and possible action, including adoption of urgency ordinance enacting temporary restrictions on COVID-19 pandemic related commercial and residential evictions. The sponsor is County Council. So Chris, County Council. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So uh, uh, this board had previously enacted an urgency ordinance uh, uh, consistent with the, uh, the authority granted by the governor's executive order, um, uh, giving some limitations on uh, the ability to, to um, uh, pursue evictions uh, in the context of uh, certain COVID related causes and specifically loss of income during the emergency um, uh, due to either COVID or the, the COVID response. Um, that ordinance was set to expire uh, at the end of the, uh, the governor's executive order. So, so it actually lapsed at the, the end of when uh, the governor had granted that authority, but the governor since renewed that. Now, the other thing that happened during that time, though, was that the court issued its own orders, um, which uh, uh, were effectively broader. So the Judicial Council had uh, suspended the ability of um, uh, the, the courts to issue summons um, in eviction cases. Um, and, and they had actually given a deadline of that uh, uh, to expire 90 days after the, the emergency concluded. Uh, however, uh, recently they actually decided to go ahead and set it to, to expire on September 1st. Um, uh, there was some earlier statements that they were looking at possibly making it expire as of August 14th. When they ultimately t took action, they did set it to expire um, for September 1st. So uh, give, given that that was um, uh, going to lapse and given that the board had previously enacted an ordinance, um, we decided to bring this one forward. Um, the, the governor has extended his ex executive order, so this would again uh, be within the scope of the county's authority um, under the governor's executive order to uh, put certain limitations on evictions. I do, I do want the board to understand um, there have been sort of rumors and, and statements that have been made uh, often in the public that have, have suggested that, that the governor's orders and local ordinances are broader than they actually are. Um, the governor only conveyed on local jurisdictions the ability to um, uh, suspend the evictions as to certain things that were COVID related. Uh, it did not extend to um, all, all evictions under any circumstances whatsoever. Um, uh, but we, we've been working under the assumption that the board would likely want uh, to uh, renew the ordinance given that the, um, uh, the judicial council's orders are ending. So we uh, made some slight modifications, uh, changed the expiration date uh, and, and made a, a couple of other tweaks um, in, in here. Uh, I have Deputy County Counsel Mike Mactasey, uh, uh on the meeting as well uh, in case there are any questions uh, that the board has for him. Thank you. All right. So, are there um, any comments from the board, Supervisor McCowan? We'll start with you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I would note we have uh, board correspondence from the North Bay Association of Realtors. I think they do ask some pertinent uh, points, uh, including uh, asking for clarification on what constitutes uh, substantial loss and substantial medical expenses, uh, substantial decrease in household or business income. Um, and I, I think it would be appropriate to uh, get a response from staff on uh, those technical questions of how do we define these terms and how do we expect a court to define them? Okay. County Council. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is so we're we're relying on on language that's been uh, propagated by the state. Um, you know, my understanding um, uh, from from the context was that it essentially would would likely be adjudicated uh, as um, a, a standard of of being both significant and material. Um, that is that that the um, the loss of income actually is impacting um, the ability. Um, uh, uh, to pay the rent and that it's not uh, a mere pretext. Uh, that being said, I don't know that we have, and, and I'll see if um, uh, Deputy County Counsel Michael Mactasey has any further on, insight on this. I don't, I don't know that we have, um, it, 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 this may be sort of akin to with a new statute when a standard is set forth 
Um, you know, we, we think we know what the courts might do with it, but without uh, out any case law, um, we don't have uh, sort of certainty on that front. And uh, thank you. I would note that uh, the letter of comment uh, cites that Napa's ordinance has a language that uh, would refer to exceeding 10% of the monthly take home pay. So if loss of income or COVID related expenses exceeded 10% of the monthly take home pay, that would make uh, those individuals eligible uh, for relief under this ordinance. 10% uh, actually seems like a fairly modest uh, requirement, but it would perhaps uh, eliminate a lot of uh, back and forth and uncertainty in the court process if we were to insert uh, some standard into our ordinance. Thank you. Okay, um, Supervisor Jerdy. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, so I, I guess my um, question to county uh, staff is, um, just again, also reading the correspondence we received, um, knowing that this is now again five months into um, to COVID and uh, many more months ahead, uh, we definitely want to provide these protections. But um, we also may have learned something from other counties and other jurisdictions that have had time to maybe to refine their ordinances to make them as workable as possible for both sides. So, in the correspondence, they they reference some things that I'm not clear exactly what they're. Um, describing, but maybe staff knows. So for example, they, they suggest to avoid simply delaying an eviction and please require both parties to attempt to create an agreement uh, to qualify for protections. These are often effective tools. Does county staff know what's um, being represented there in, in other counties? Uh I, I would ask um, it, if perhaps uh, Deputy County Council Mactasee might be able to speak to that a little bit, and then I, I, I may have a little bit of input of my own. This is Deputy County Council Michael Mactasee. Um, through the chair, I have not had the opportunity to read the correspondence that was posted when I checked the website. I, I had not seen any correspondence, um, so I can't respond directly to what was mentioned in that correspondence. Okay, and then the other the other point that they raised um, that I don't know if we've addressed, which is um, just if uh, the, the property owner, I mean, mo most properties in Mendocino County are not large apartment complexes. They're usually fairly small. And um, uh, so their point is, what if someone needed to sell their property? Um, and uh, just to want to make sure that we're not somehow tripping up the ability of someone who has a property that has a rental on the property um, somehow can't sell their property because the, this uh, moratorium on evictions is in place. So to what extent and how have, have we tried to address that in the Mendocino County Ordinance? Deputy County Council Michael Mactasee through the chair. My understanding of being able to sell a property and whether there's a moratorium on evictions are, are, are slightly separate matters. One doesn't include the other. Um, you can certainly sell a property uh, with renters still renting the property. Um, I'm not saying it doesn't pose challenges, but it, it doesn't uh, create a bar to it. So, but if you were selling the property um, and it, let's all say it's a single family home and someone's living in it, um, normally I would think that the, um, the buyer might want to live in the house. And um, so uh, are we prohibiting the buyer from buying the house because they won't be able to live in the house? Deputy County Council Michael Mackesy. Um, going back to the language of this particular ordinance, um, it, is, it is restricting evictions uh, for particular reasons that are related to COVID. If somebody is looking to sell a house um, and they're looking to uh, evict their tenants for, for something that is not COVID related, this ordinance doesn't preclude them from doing so. They would have to go through uh, the laws that allow them to evict for other reasons and go through the, the timelines for those uh, evictions. Sometimes it's 30 days, sometimes it's 60 days, uh, sometimes it's 90 days, depending on uh, the circumstances and the tenants. Um, uh, 
but if it's not a COVID related eviction based on uh, the circumstances specified in this ordinance, it would not preclude someone from doing that. Okay, so for clarification, if, if, if they're selling a, a single family house or a house with two units on it and, and the buyer needs to occupy the house, that's why they're buying the house, um, there would be the ability to, to evict because it's not related to COVID. Deputy County Council Michael McKenzie, again, with it, I'm, I'm hesitant to give uh, a case, um, a, a legal opinion on a specific case, but it sounds like what you're talking about is, is probably doable. But again, unless I looked at all of the circumstances impacting um, the circumstance that you're talking about, I would be hesitant to give a definitive answer. But in general, the, you can remove people from your property if you're the landlord or if you're the owner um, for a number of different reasons. Um, and, and sometimes all it requires if an owner wants to move in is a, a notice that has the particular amount of time, such as 30 or 60 days, depending on how long the tenant has been in there. So it sounds like that is something that could happen. But again, I'd be hesitant to give a definitive answer without knowing all of the circumstances. If okay, just, just my final question is, um, because this has been in place for a while, has county staff had a, had the opportunity, I know you're stretched thin on other projects, have you had a chance just to see what other counties have perhaps put in place or modified during this moratorium? I mean, I'm just assuming uh, issues have come up in other counties that we might want to incorporate in just to make it as workable as possible. That's it, thanks. Deputy County Council Michael McNessie, again, um, the ordinance that's before you is based on the ordinance that this board passed uh, a few months ago. And that ordinance a few months ago was based on um, other counties that were passing them at the time. Since that period of time, I personally have not looked at the changes that other counties have made or the challenges or, or successes that they have um, come by. Uh, this is this ordinance as presented right now is based in large part, as uh, County Council Curtis had mentioned, uh, the language on uh, the executive order that was passed by the governor. Mr. Chair, if I may add just a little bit more. Yeah, County Council. Uh, thank you. So um, I, I, just a, a couple of things there. So in terms of lessons learned from other counties, um, while there have been some other ordinances that have been enacted, I'm, I'm not certain I don't know that it's quite the same situation uh, where we would be looking for insight in terms of what's worked and what hasn't because of the fact that the court's orders on this um, have been sort of broader reaching than what the governor was allowed to do. So during the window in time in which these ordinances have been in effect, uh, the, the, the vast majority of it um, really has been sort of um, preempted by the court's orders. Uh, and, and so I don't, I don't know, you know, we could certainly take some time to, to reach out to, to some of the, the other counties and see what, what, what experience they've had. But from the, the discussions that I've seen um, and, and just from the fact that the, 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 the court's order seemed to be so much broader, uh, I don't know that we're going to find a lot of um, sort of data um, uh, based on what's worked and what hasn't. Uh, in terms of the reference to um, a potential uh, uh, process for um, uh, requiring the parties to reach an agreement, it's not uncommon either in the, the case of court disputes um, or, or in the case of contractual disputes to have some sort of requirement for alternate dispute resolution, often uh, a requirement that the parties go to uh, a mediator. Um, the parties are able to contract for that uh, in the case of contract disputes, uh, and there are situations in which um, uh, the, um, uh, the courts, for example, will provide um, a, a judge for settlement purposes or a mediator free of cost. Um, there, you know, potentially, um, uh, I'm, I'm not certain of a model of it in this context, you know, potentially uh, the, the board could opt to, to impose some sort of requirement on that front, but there would be a question of essentially, um, you know, when is that adequately complied with, who bears the costs uh, and expense of, of settlement or discussion, uh, and in particular, who, who has the cost of a mediator if a mediator is going to be um, uh, the, the, the method that's used. 
um, you know, you, you could simply you know, um, have have some sort of limited sort of meet and confer requirement. I'm not I'm not certain if that's going to have that much of an effect, but certainly if the board wanted to, uh, we could draft some language to that effect. Uh, and I will also just mention um, uh, the since the the um, uh, uh, since the the court opted not to um, uh, terminate its order on August 14th, which was the date they initially indicated, but rather. Uh, on September 1st, you know, we would have some time if the board so decided um, to take a look at some I issues, uh, make some changes, and bring this back. Thank you. If I may, through the chair. Yeah. Uh, Deputy County Council Michael Mactasi, I just wanted to add to uh, County Council's uh, comments in that even if we were to make a change now, because the Judicial Council's rules are still there, um, their, their rules prevent the issuance of summons. So uh, to your question, Supervisor Judy, whether someone could uh, evict if they wanted to move into a house, right now the Judicial Council's rules uh, prevents the issuance of, of an unlawful container complaint and it doesn't, um, it, it doesn't limit it to the things that we would be limiting it to. And, and just as kind of a, a thinking forward, the legislature I believe has two bills right now that they're working on which would extend eviction protections. And we won't know what those look like. And they could be um, more strict than what we're passing right now or what we're considering passing. OK, yeah, just, I'll just add one more point. Um, again, we've all been reading about this subject over the months. And um, this is definitely a very big issue statewide. And uh, some of the uh, concepts that I've seen floated are um, that the state might at some point try to develop a fund that would be sort of like a global settlement fund with landlords and, and renters who were unable to make payments. Um, concepts have floated around like maybe paying 80 cents on the dollar of what was owed in rent and then it wipes the slate clean with the people who would successfully go through a program like that. But nothing's been approved yet as far as I know. I don't think the states identified or approved funding sources for this. Um, there is a real estate transaction tax that fee that went into effect a few years ago that was supposed to be sort of a replacement for redevelopment for housing. Um, perhaps that fund might get tapped. But um, I mean, th there's, I mean, probably going to be billions of dollars in unpaid rent statewide, um, if not hundreds of millions. And um, so we're obviously a very small portion of that. But it just, it, I'm hoping that the state and the federal government can somehow step in here because this is, this is an issue much bigger than Mendocino County. Mr. Chair, I believe you're on mute. Supervisor Williams. Uh, I think Supervisor Jurdy uh, raised my concerns. Um, it looks like we're trading one problem for another here. Of course, the, the drawback in not enacting the uh, eviction ordinance is that when the state does provide a solution um, to remedy the losses of landlords, it may not be applicable because we didn't actually have the um, anti-eviction ordinance in place. And I could see those spaces sitting empty. Um, it's hard to imagine new businesses moving in during a pandemic with unknown restrictions um, being phased in and phased out. So I, I definitely have concerns about this on the fence, but but I think I can support it. And Supervisor Brown. Supervisor Brown, you're muted. You are Sorry about that. <laughs> I had to unmute twice. Um, no further comment on my part. All right. And I just, um, you know, I've heard from people too who, you know, we have a county of a lot of small mom and pop landlords as well as lots of renters. And um, that, that issue of making sure that we can evict if it's not a cause, not caused from COVID or loss of income is still pertinent to a lot of these people. So I guess my, my question for county council is, you were saying that the judicial council's um, 
restrictions were more severe than ours. And so what does that actually mean? That it's, it's a higher threshold to be able to evict someone with the judicial council's um, interpretation or how's that work? So my understanding, and, and what I may want to do is turn this over to Deputy County Council Mac to see, but my understanding is that the Judicial Council simply suspended the issuance of a summons uh, for unlawful detainer actions, uh, and th th uh, that it wasn't limited to the circumstances of COVID, that simply those cases would not go forward. Um, but I'll, uh, uh, Mr. Mac to see may be able to speak to this in, in more detail. Deputy County County, excuse me, Deputy County Council Michael Mac to see through the chair. Yes. That, that's what I was going to say. Uh, essentially, that it suspended summons without uh, regard to circumstance, um, and that effectively stops all unlawful detainer actions from moving forward. You can file them, but you can't get the summons. Um, as soon as that gets lifted, then they all can go forward. Our uh, comparison to ours is that we are we are targeting uh, the suspension of unlawful detainers that are COVID related, as specified in the ordinance. Um, and, and that's the main difference. There are other things in the emergency rules, which is attached as Appendix I, um, such as uh, the court can't enter a default or default judgment for restitution in an unlawful detainer action. Um, and there's uh, other, other rules that pertain to time for trial and, and things like that. Um, but the main one is what County Council Curtis mentioned. Okay, thank you, because that whole issue with um, having to go to court and try to figure out what um, is a substantial decrease of income, that sounds pretty horrific, even if it's with a mediator, it still sounds like a real burden on people. So, so I appreciate those comments from the North Bay Realtors Association. And I think that also, uh, my understanding was that with the North Coast Opportunities, there was this $150,000 for housing insecurity. And so that was one of the issues of um, trying to get effective tools already used by being utilized by many renters and providers. And so I guess that would be one way of helping people avoid eviction too, is using that housing insecurity money and my inter if I remember correctly, it was um, $1,500 per person or, or per household for a thousand or a thousand dollars for 1500. I forget exactly how it worked, but um, that would be another way of avoiding this eviction process. So with that, um, are there any public comments? Hearing none and um, seeing none on my list, there were certainly Mr. some Chair. hidden comments. So, so I hope that people take those into consideration. Um, Mr. Chair. Yes, Supervisor McCowan. Thank you. Uh, I think we may have heard a suggestion earlier from County Council that uh, this item could be uh, held over so that they can more fully consider some of the suggestions that have made and address those. The eviction process doesn't move with lightning speed. So even though uh, we may not have an ordinance in place today, uh, I doubt that anyone will be evicted before we have an opportunity to revisit this item. Perhaps we could go to County Council for clarification of that and then consider if it might be appropriate to take a little more time to uh, give County Council an opportunity to digest some of the comments that have been made and uh, perhaps uh, recommend to the board that certain items be incorporated into the ordinance to address those concerns. Uh, thank you. Okay. Uh, if I may through the chair. Uh, so, uh, I don't want to say that no one would be evicted, but no one that, whose eviction would be prevented by this ordinance would be evicted. There are still, um, so even under the court's orders, um, there are still uh, the possibility of some evictions proceeding, specifically those that were filed well before 
uh, COVID and are unrelated to anything um, uh, um, uh, regarding COVID that, that might ultimately still make their way through the, the, the system. I don't know that the board has the, um, the ability under the scope of the governor's executive order to be able to do anything that would impact those because the governor's executive order was specific to um, uh, the, the sort of loss of income related to the COVID or COVID response. Um, in, in terms of the, the timing though, yes, the, the expiration of the, the court orders is set for September 1st. Uh, so unless the court goes and, and changes something, um, I don't, and, and September 1st, I should note, is the date of our next meeting. So um, uh, I, don't, I don't believe that there would be um, uh, any harm unless something unexpected happens uh, in putting this over until the, the next meeting. Uh, that being said, um, I, it, it would help me, you know, I've, I've heard some comments from the board, but it would help me to get sort of a sense and maybe even a poll of the board uh, on some of those issues. Um, there, there are some limits as to what the, the board is able to do with the urgency ordinance. Um, you know, the, the, the limitations with respect to uh, only impacting those evictions that are um, uh, a result of loss of income uh, due to COVID or COVID response. Um, uh, those are coming from the governor's executive order, w which was specifically eliminating the issue of uh, state preemption um, that would otherwise be there um, uh, by virtue of the state having occupied the field uh, with respect to the evictions and the eviction process. Um, so there, there are parts that there isn't ability to um, go significantly outside of. I think I've, I've heard two ideas in particular um, for board members, though, that we may be able to incorporate. One would be uh, if the board wanted to create a definition of substantial um, uh, the, in the ordinance, we could certainly put that in. Uh, and um, as long as it um, wasn't held by a courts to be violating the scope of what the governor had authorized, um, it, it would provide um, an additional level of, of I think assistance in determining uh, when um, uh, uh, when the income had in fact been, or, or when the loss of in, impact had in fact been significant enough to trigger the, the requirements of the ordinance, uh, and you know the number that I had heard floated was Napa's 10% requirement. Um, so you know what what I'd like to know you know if we're going to be coming back with a draft on the first is whether that's something the board would want to include, uh, and then the other thing that I'd heard that that sounded um, uh, like something we'd, we'd be able to incorporate would be potentially requirement that there be some sort of um, uh, mediation or meet and confer requirement. Uh, I, I will tell you right now, um, I don't know that I would suggest making it mediation because there's a cost associated with that and the, the difficulties in determining who pays for the cost um, uh, may not be particularly workable in the context of an ordinance su such as this. Um, uh, there, there may be some complications um, in terms of, you know, both sides need to consent to the, the, the mediator, et cetera. Um, uh, but, but we could probably work out something that we would be able to recommend that, that would have some sort of uh, process for attempting to work out an agreement um, prior to relying on the ordinance um, uh, uh, as a, um, uh, a defense against an eviction. Um, uh, but uh, again, that, that's an area that would help to have some guidance from the board as to sort of, um, you know, what their preference is on that, and and you know, is that the the full board, and, and sort of what what in particular would that that look like? Supervisor Jerdy, did you have any idea on that? Um. <laughs> well, I was mostly posing questions. Um, so I, I, um, I don't want us to create something that's going to create a, a greater burden for the tenant or the landlord. I just am wanting to make sure that we're thinking through all of our options. And, and um, you know, if there is not an urgency, um, I do think it would make sense for to have um, some uh, thought by county staff, county council's office, um, and maybe put this off to our, our next meeting. Um, but one of the questions that I didn't ask that I was wondering is if there was a global settlement by the state and it could be who knows a year from now um, when they might approve some funding and that's a big question mark whether they would um, would we um, would would the both the tenant and the landlord be in a better position if if our ordinance um, was maybe um, not more restrictive than the state which it's not um, right now, um, 
uh, so that the essentially we could potentially say that the, it was the state um, moratorium that that imposed the um, the non eviction and therefore was the the entity that needed to help help pay for some of the unpaid rent. Uh, and if I may, Mr. Chair, I, I don't mean to be putting words in the mouths of any of the supervisors. I just note that sometimes when the comments are made during the board meeting, I can't quite tell if that's a question being raised by one supervisor or if it's direction from the board. So I just, it, it, it helps if I can get a little bit more full discussion to know what to be coming back with. Chair has check. Very good. Supervisor Williams. So um, I, I support Supervisor Jurdy's uh, uh, questions and, and statements. I, I would like to get a sense from staff whether what's being proposed is in line with most other counties. We don't want to be the odd one out. I think what we've learned from the cannabis permitting is when we're all by ourselves with slightly different rule than the rest of the state, it's very hard to get the state's support. If a bailout is coming, I would rather have similar language to other counties so that when other counties receive a bailout, it applies to us. Um, but I, I, today I don't have a good sense of whether this language would be in line with you know, um, the majority of uh, the other 57 counties that are passing similar. Any further comment from the board? All right. So we have the option of um, bringing it back in two weeks or approving something right now. And if we bring something back, I think County Council wants a little more clarification of what needs to be brought back. So um, could I propose that uh, we put it to a vote today and then um, ask if Supervisor Jurdy would be willing to work with County Council to refine it and bring back any modifications next meeting? I would Mr. Chair. prefer that the, oh, sorry. Yes, yeah, Supervisor I'll Brown. defer. Thank you. I would prefer that the item be tabled and uh, further direction be given as to what um, we feel should be um, looked at. And I think the um, comment about other counties is a good one. Um, because again, we don't want to be so different that um, we're being criticized by both sides. Okay, so that's a that was a motion to table it. Yes, Mr. Chair. I'll second the motion and the intent is to bring it back at our next meeting and um, and to, just to investigate um, uh, ways to make sure that uh, we're positioning our ordinance to um, assist both the renters and the landlords to the greatest extent possible um, uh, through our, a perfecting of the ordinance if needed. Supervisor Brown, are you in agreement with that? Um, I will amend my motion to include it. Okay. County Council, does that give you enough to work on or too uh, much? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. It, it would still help if I could get just um, a, a, maybe a quick poll of the board as to whether uh, the board would like to, to define a, um, a, a threshold of, of substantial and whether they'd want to use the 10% from Napa or some other figure. Uh, and then additionally, um, just a sense as to whether or not the board would want a requirement of some sort of meet and confer or mediation um, uh, prior to um, uh, uh, prior to any um, uh, eviction being halted due to COVID related reasons. Yeah, I think that substantial loss needs clarification and this, see what other counties are doing besides Napa would be good. And if it would put us out of the the mainstream for any kind of future reimbursement, that would be good to know too. And with the meet and confer, I guess um, I guess that's something that I would be interested in looking into because that seems pretty low keyed. Mr. Chair. Yes, Supervisor McCowan. 
Thank you. It appears that the Napa ordinance also uh, clarifies the documentation that would needed that would be needed to substantiate the substantial increase in expenses or decrease in income and that this uh, is necessary in order to help uh, landlords qualify for mortgage relief. So there's a number of points there that I think would uh, could be used to clarify our ordinance to make the process more transparent for all involved. Chair Haschek? Yes. Do we know whether CSAC is taking up this issue? I don't know, that's a question for county council. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm not aware uh, of uh, anything CSAC's done on this front. Um, I don't know if the CEO's office has more information, but uh, you know, at, at this point, what I've been getting from CSAC has just been updates as to what the state has been doing, uh, not, not articulating a specific position that has been um, uh, advocated for. So are we in agreement with the substantial loss and that needs a little more clarification and that um, the numbers could be determined after doing more research from other counties? Yes. And that, okay, and the documentation could be explored too. And that we could look at some kind of meet and confer language. Are we in agreement on that? To yes. Okay, <laughs> hearing no one else that, um, except for Supervisor Williams, will County Council, is that enough for you to work on then? Uh, yes, Th thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, good. So we have the motion on the floor from Supervisor Brown, seconded by Supervisor Jerdy. Are we clear on that, what the motion is? I would appreciate a restatement of the motion with changes. Okay, Supervisor Brown. <laughs> well, to incorporate all the comment um, that was spoken, um, but I move to table um, this agenda item to come back at our next meeting and to take all comment made by supervisors into consideration when coming back with um, a proposed um, revision. Okay. Perfect, thank you. Supervisor Jurdy, you're in agreement with that? Yes, I am, thank you. Okay, very good. Could you conduct a roll call vote, Deputy Clerk? Absolutely. Supervisor Jurdy? Yes. Supervisor McCowan? Yes. Supervisor Brown? Yes. Supervisor Williams? Yes. And Chair Hashtag? Yes. Thank you, the motion carries unanimously. All right, All right, moving on to agenda item 5C, which is discussion and possible action, including approval of the Board of Supervisors responses to the 2019-2020 grand jury reports and disbanding of the grand jury ad hoc committees. Sponsors are county council and grand jury ad hoc committees, supervisors Brown and McCowan and supervisors Williams and Jurdy. M Mr. County Mr. Council, would you like to introduce this? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, so previously the board had created two different ad hocs to go ahead and um, craft the grand jury responses. Um, those are due on September 1st, which is also the date of our next meeting. Uh, I had some placeholders um, uh, uh, with the clerk of the board for uh, this meeting and, and for the next one. Uh, at this point, two of the, um, the responses have been crafted by one of the ad hocs. Uh, the third is still, um, uh, uh, in process, um, you know, I, uh, I'd like to give the board the opportunity to, to have uh, looked at the two so that we're not um, uh, too much uh, uh, up against the wire at the end of this. There had been some uh, question raised regarding clerk of the board's ability to um, process and get it out to the grand jury um, on the day of the next meeting since they're often very busy on those days. So um, I, I, I wanted to give the, the board the opportunity to approve those two and to dissolve the ad hoc if it so desires. Okay, anyone from the ad hocs would like to comment on this? Especially um, the ad hoc of supervisors, um, 
McCowan and Brown. Supervisor McCowan, um, did you want to speak first? I'll defer to you, Supervisor Brown. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Supervisor McCowan and I um, did the response to the grand jury on two of their reports, how the tax dollars pay for services, and the second was um, school safety, um, a priority. Um, we felt that we did our research um, and responded the way we felt we should respond on each of those. Um, on the report, how tax dollars pay for services um, is quite lengthy, but we felt that the grand jury as well as the public should understand um, te the teeter plan uh, better. So we did do um, quite a bit of dialogue, but other than that, um, I believe, um, well, I'm going to be supporting it, obviously, because I was on the ad hoc um, that brought it forward, but I'd very much like our colleagues um, to move forward on these two reports, response to reports. And I will further comment they are due on September 1st. Our next meeting is September 1st. So uh, clerk of the board staff is gonna have to turn that around very quickly when we receive the other uh, response to the grand jury report for the emergency communication system. Okay, hey, Supervisor McCallum, would you like to add anything? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I, of course, concur with Supervisor Brown's uh, comments. Um, we did go into some detail in responding to the grand jury report, how tax dollars pay for services. It does seem that there is um, a good deal of confusion on the part of the authors of that report as to how the teeter plan uh, functions and also the history of the teeter plan. So we did suggest uh, corrections to some of the statements made by the grand jury and tried to explain in detail how the teeter plan uh, works, how it initially was not managed appropriately in Mendocino County beginning in 1993 uh, up until 2009 when the board did uh, take action to, uh, to ensure that all teeter plan revenue was first devoted to paying off teeter plan debt and associated interest. Uh, that direction was given. The teeter plan debt was paid off in full in 2016. Since that time, the teeter plan has functioned as designed and although income and expenses varies from year to year with proper management that we now have, the teeter plan does provide an additional source of discretionary income to the county over time, as well as providing budgetary certainty to uh, special districts, including school districts, which are guaranteed 100% of the taxes, fees, and assessments that they are entitled to. Uh, the grand jury seemed to be under the mistaken impression that the county is at risk of paying out millions of additional dollars to special districts. That is simply not the case. Uh, there are minor glitches with the operation of the teeter plan with regard to uh, a couple of dependent special districts of a community services district However, that's a very minor part of the teeter plan and manageable under current circumstances. Uh, sorry to go on at some length there, but uh, it is important, I think, to get this history uh, clear. Hopefully our report uh, has helped uh, do that. Um, very minor uh, correction to the recommended action. Uh, we are only disbanding one ad hoc committee. Um, so 
uh, whenever, whenever you're ready, uh, either I or Supervisor Brown would be happy to make a motion. Mr. Hester? Yeah, Supervisor yeah. Williams. I have a question about the um, our response to the school safety. Can we can we look at those briefly? Yeah. Um, so the question is first about R1. I, I feel like our response, while it's accurate, we don't have authority over the sheriff's office and uh, the sheriff is the domain expert here. He should be telling us whether this is a good idea. I, I think we're deflecting a bit more than we should in the answer. Um, you know, we're, we're essentially saying uh, not our job, but the, I think the spirit of the question is uh, about the Board of Supervisors budgeting and working with law enforcement to ensure that there's an officer uh, in the locale that can um, respond uh, with no greater than five minutes. Seems like we could have a discussion with law enforcement and decide is that a priority and then respond to what we plan to do rather than just um, pointing the finger somewhere else. And I know that's not the intent and this is technically an accurate answer, um, but I, I, I don't know if we're collaborating the way the grand jury would expect us to. Um, any thoughts from my colleagues? <laughs> Well, I think it would it would be good to hear from the sheriff, and I I guess I would question whether the ad hoc um, met with the sheriff. Obviously, you know we have a huge county, we have schools all throughout the county, and to expect a five minute response, you know, is is unrealistic. But but was the sheriff consulted on any ideas like other options or what might be possible? Supervisor McKinney, I believe you oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Well, I believe we have incorporated by reference the sheriff's response and uh, everyone acknowledges that an emergency at any school is an all hands on deck event. So everyone responds from uh, the sheriff to uh, to a fish and um, wildlife services uh, warden, uh, everyone wearing a uniform, everyone with an emergency response capability does respond. I think the uh, law enforcement and the schools are working closely together on a continuous and ongoing basis. I think the spirit of our response is to recognize that and to say, we're more than happy to engage with you if there's anything that you think we can add to the equation. But uh, my, my belief is that uh, all involved parties are doing everything they reasonably can to assure the greatest level of school safety possible. Um, I, I don't see the grand jury saying otherwise. Our primary challenges are the uh, geography and the low population density of Mendocino County. Uh, but I, I think we need to acknowledge that uh, all parties from uh, city, county, state, tribal, uh, law enforcement and associated agencies work very well together to provide maximum coverage. Mayor Haschek. Yes, yeah, Supervisor Williams. So, so um, that, I appreciate the answer. Um, it, it, it doesn't resolve the concern I have in that the grand jury is recommending that the Board of Supervisors work with the County Sheriff's Department to develop a plan. And we're saying we don't oversee the sheriff. That's our full answer. I think we might need to either say, yes, we will work on a plan in collaboration with the sheriff. The sheriff is the lead specifying what, uh, how this needs to work we will fund it or say, no, we're not going to do it. But I think simply saying we don't have direct authority over the sheriff's office it isn't a full answer. And then on R2, I guess I have had a similar thought that um, that grand jury is recommending that uh, Mendocino County Office of Education and the Board of Supervisors develop a strategic plan. And we're saying we don't oversee MCOE, uh, but if they ask, we're willing to work with them. I think we need a more affirmative yes, we, we will collaborate on a strategic plan. 
you know, that doesn't mean we have authority over MCOE, but it means we're willing to step up to the plate and participate as a lead agency in developing the plan. Otherwise, what we have is the grand jury asks the board to do it. We say, no, we don't oversee MCOE. They can next time ask MCOE to do it, and they can say, we don't oversee law enforcement or the county, right? And this sort of round robin, everyone shrugs and says, we don't have authority over the whole process. What the grand jury is asking for is collaboration. Well, thank you, Supervisor. And uh, we'll hear from Supervisor Brown in a minute, I'm sure. But what the grand jury has not done, to my knowledge, is identify any deficiency in the working relationship between the county sheriff, other law enforcement agencies, MCOE, and individual school districts. So it's great that they're saying we should do these various things. Uh, I would want to know from the sheriff or MCOE what is missing that they think we can bring to the table. And if we hear that, we are more than willing. But uh, my information is all parties involved are working appropriately on an ongoing basis to address the concerns. And again, I don't see written in the grand jury report anything that contradicts that. My, my final comment on, on rec the second recommendation, what they're asking for is a strategic plan. Can you point to a strategic plan today? And is that the responsibility of the Board of Supervisors or is it more appropriate for law enforcement agencies, MCOE and school districts who have direct hands uh, on knowledge site-specific knowledge of what would be required to write a strategic plan. As the grand jury has noted, we have not been able to write our own strategic plan for the county. Maybe we should focus on our direct responsibility first. Mr. Chair? Yes, Supervisor Brown. Thank you. I disagree with Supervisor Williams. Um, support for the most part the comments of Supervisor McCowan and I'm going to move the recommended motion. Okay. Are there any further comments from the board? Yeah, this, uh, I'll just note that I, I uh, sat in on the um, swearing in of the, the, I believe it was the current grand jury. Um, and uh, it was interesting um, sitting there hearing the judge give instructions to the grand jury because I think she mentioned county government, maybe even board of supervisors four or five, six times. And I think only near the tail end did she reference that one of the things that they could look into was other governments other than county government. She may have referenced city. I don't think she ever once referenced special districts. So I think part of the issue is the grand jury is usually, you know, it's, it's filled with very competent, capable people, but the, the instructions that they're given are, in my opinion, not broad enough. So I think part of the issue seems to be that they, they focus their attention on county government, maybe the board of supervisors, because they hear that from the judge and they don't, maybe they don't recognize that they could give these reports um, and focus their attention equally on cities, school boards, special districts, um, that honestly have a lot less uh, maybe public scrutiny um, than county government has. Um, so that may be why um, they proceeded to ask the Board of Supervisors to sort of step into someone else's business um, rather than go directly to those agencies. Okay, let's see, let's go to public comment. And um, I don't see anyone listed for public comment. Was there any attachments of public comment? No, there weren't. So we'll go back to the board. We'll go to Supervisor Brown. You want to make a motion to accept? Yes, sir. I'd like to move the recommended motion. And the recommended, well, of the two reports from your ad hoc committee. Correct. Do you want me to read it into the record? Um, no. You don't need to. Thank you. Okay. 
Is there a second to that? I'll second the motion. Okay. And I hope that this uh, about the the schools was, you know, for my 30 years of experience in the school districts, that that there was a lot of collaboration between law enforcement and the individual school districts. Um, I never knew that it went up to the Board of Supervisors as an issue, um, but certainly the County Office of Education should be working closely with the school districts and the, the Sheriff's Department and individual police districts. So, so anyway, I hope that's happening and I hope that they, um, they take this uh, report from the, from the um, grand jury seriously too. So we have the motion. Mr. Chair. Yeah, any further comment? Very minor point. Uh, the second line of the recommended action uh, refers to disband the grand jury ad hoc committees. Uh, I believe it should be committee since we're only disbanding one of the ad hocs today. Right. Okay, so Supervisor Brown, is that all right, that correction? Strike the yes. Yes, it is. And I think with both the um, the two reports that were referenced in the motion took care of that. But if Supervisor McCallan suggests crossing out the yes, that works for me. Okay. And Supervisor Jurdy, you're all right with that still? Yes, thank you. Okay. So, uh, Deputy Clerk of the Board, could you conduct a roll call vote? Of course. Supervisor McCowan? Yes. Supervisor Jurdy? Yes. Supervisor Williams? No. Supervisor Brown? Yes. And Chair Hashchak? Yes. The motion carries with Supervisor Williams dissenting. All right. Let's see. It's um, 1148 right now. We do have a lot of um, issues on the um, closed session calendar. So um, we have items 9A, 9B, 9C. Item 9D has been withdrawn. And we have I, 9E, 9F, and 9G. So we do have a substantial number of items to deal with in closed session. Hopefully we'll be back around 1.30 or as soon as possible after that. And um, so with that, why don't we take a 10 minute break and come back into closed session at 11.58. All right, and we'll see everyone.
Okay, I see everyone on. So, hey, thank you. So, welcome back, everyone. Let's see, we had some closed session items. We had 9A, which direction was given to staff, 9B, and 9C, and 9E, and 9F, and 9G. Direction was given to staff on all of those. We did not have 9D, which was listed. All right, so with that, um, we appreciate it. We're moving on to item 5D, which is discussion and possible action, including acceptance of presentation by Pacific Gas and Electric, PG&E, regarding public safety power shutoff, the PSPS program preparations in the County of Mendocino and an update regarding the county's associated preparation. So the sponsor is the executive office and I see we have Allison Talbot from PG&E here. So I'm gonna turn this over to Steve Dunnicliffe. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the board, Steve Dunnicliffe, deputy CEO with the County Executive Office. And um, so depending on, on how time goes with this item, because I know that um, PG&E has a lot of great information for us, we've got an update from the county preparation that we can uh, add at the end. It'll be a, a brief update. But um, as the primary item here in front of you today, I wanted to introduce uh, PG&E, and uh, we'll be turning this over to PG&E here shortly. Uh, Allison Talbot, as everybody is aware, has been able to help coordinate uh, Aaron Johnson today as PG&E's primary presenter. Aaron is the Vice President of Wildfire Safety and Public Engagement. Uh, Aaron is joined by Jason Regan, uh, who's the Director of PS, uh, PS Mitigation's uh, Execution Team. And then as a resource, we also have Ian Erickson, who's uh, representing the North Coast Vegetation Management uh, process. So with that very brief introduction in place, I'd like to go ahead and turn this over to either um, Allison or, uh, Aris, or uh, I'm sorry, Aaron, uh, whichever one of you are prepared to uh, tee this up. Well, Steve, thanks very much. And um, thank you to the chair and board for having us. Uh, Apologies, but we don't use Zoom that much at PG&E, and so we need just a moment to ensure that all of our folks can um, get their mutes off and um, their videos on. So I'm going to click participants, and um, I see that Aaron Johnson is on with no video and, and no... Uh, no mic. So apologies, board, give us just a moment if you would. Um, Steve, do you do you want to perhaps ad lib a little for us on Aaron. county business? Hey, absolutely. And seeing oh, that, that we just had Aaron join us, let me go ahead and, and give a, a, a quick update here with the county uh, component. So, um, and, and at the end of this, we can go um, to Office of Emergency um, Services um, staff at the end of the PG&E presentation. But just for, for context here, even for the PG&E presentation, um, the county has historically had stationary emergency generators to power core critical operations, including computer servers, communication facilities, the jail. Um, but this infrastructure was all installed at a time that power outages were typically winter events of the shortest possible duration due to a line that was damaged or, or some other uh, issue that was quickly repaired. In 2019, the county began a real focused effort to improve its ability to provide services through extended power outage events. And we've made a lot of progress um, in, the, in the last year, year and a half. Um, and um, although the timing of these preparations has been difficult, the overall effort um, increases the county's resiliency in future disasters. Um, at this point, we've got additional infrastructure in place at uh, more county facilities that allows rapid connection of generators in the event of a PSPS event or other equipment failure. We've also completed energy assessments that have allowed us to extend additional uh, circuits of power uh, into a couple of buildings that had uh, existing generators, and these include like the 10-mile courthouse um, and uh, juvenile hall. Um, and then... Um, you know, we've also got a plan to um, to host a few departments that don't have access to emergency power for critical facilities or critical operations. Um, and these departments would be hosted in the administration center while accommodating um, social distancing and COVID-19 difficulties. Um, and so, you know, that's really the comments that um, briefly that I was going to make at the end of this. 
we'll turn this over to PG&E. And then, like I said, at the, at the absolute end of our item here, uh, we'll have some, some wrap up comments from the Office of Emergency Services staff. Thank you, Steve. Aaron, are you able to um, participate? Excuse me. Yeah, this uh, is, Allison, um, can you hi. just do a mic check? This is Deputy yes. Clerk Lindsay Dunham. Um, I just want to give a reminder that if you are not speaking, please mute yourself. And upon speaking, please state your name for the record as well as your title. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, um, supervisors. Thank you for having us today. Uh, my name is Aaron Johnson, and I am uh, Vice President of Wildfire Safety and Public Engagement. Uh, I work in PG&E's Electric Operations Organization. Um, I wanted to uh, start today by actually speaking a little bit about the uh, uh, outage event that we're having right now um, uh, with the uh, heat wave. And so I thought I would just give a, a, a brief status of that. Um, and then uh, we'll get into the uh, public safety power shutoff items that we have here today. I want to say that I think the highlight of our presentation today, um, we have, uh, have with me uh, Jason Regan, who until quite recently uh, and for almost a decade now has led our uh, distribution control centers and is one of our uh, foremost subject matter experts. He is um, leading a team that is uh, putting in place uh, PSPS mitigation programs, uh, in particular um, temporary generation, which is uh, something I know there was a lot of interest in and he is going to uh, technology willing um, uh, do an overview of the grid in Mendocino County uh, and really highlight those areas where we think we're going to be able to provide generation uh, throughout uh, any fall PSPS events this year. So hopefully that will be um, highly informative. So uh, I'm going to keep my remarks relatively short and then uh, get to uh, Jason. Um, so um, first of all, on the uh, on the heat wave events, uh, there is, um, uh, you know, as you know, you know, we have a supply shortage in the state that uh, is uh, uh, being overseen by the California ISO. Uh, we are certainly one of the recipients of that uh, of the challenges that they are experiencing in in operating that grid, and may be asked to um, reduce uh, load uh, on our system throughout the day. Um, generally, in the evening has been the target area. We were lucky yesterday; uh, load was down, uh, predicted at forty nine thousand, and peaked around forty five thousand across um, the state. And so um, PG&E was, uh, we were not called upon to do any uh, shutdowns. Um, we do have um, a plan in place that we have been sharing with emergency management to reduce uh, as many as uh, 4,400 megawatts. Uh, we serve at peak about 21,000 across um, PG&E service territory. So about 20% of customers might potentially be affected across our service territory. Um, we have a series of outage blocks that are, are designed for this very purpose. Uh, they are designed to be uh, scattered throughout the service territory. So one particular region is not uh, affected um, too hard. And uh, that um, uh, program uh, is, uh, is currently in place. And um, we also have the circuits designated so that certain critical facilities like hospitals are not um, on those circuits that are affected. There is really only one circuit in Mendocino County. It's a little north of uh, Ukiah and it would affect about 1,200 customers. So um, it is scheduled to shut off at eight o'clock if, um, or actually I should say between uh, seven and 8 p.m. If, if we were completely called upon. Uh, the, those shutoffs are scheduled to start at five. So it's, it's two or three hours into that process. The shutoffs are about an hour. And we start at the beginning of these different blocks. So it's really in the third tranche of blocks. And if we aren't called uh, in the earlier hours, um, then we push everything back. So it's quite possible that that outage could come later as well. Uh, again, that outage would be about an hour in duration and we would need probably one to two hours to make sure restoration uh, is complete. And uh, customers that did experience these outages uh, on Friday and Saturday, those outages were between about 90 uh, uh, minutes and three hours uh, max. So um, just wanted to uh, provide an update there and uh, given that emerging uh, event and just wanted to see if there are any uh, questions I can answer on that before I jump into the PSPS presentation. Uh, Supervisor, Supervisor Jurdy. 
Just briefly, um, we received an email from Allison a little bit earlier of a link that PHE has uh, for people to check um, the status. So maybe if that, that obviously was prepared, it sounds like since this PowerPoint, but if there's a way that we could distribute that to the public, that'd be good. And then the other is um, there's the um, diesel generators that PHE has installed over here in Fort Bragg that serves Gibney Lane north of Fort Bragg and including city limits. Um, and I didn't know if I didn't really it wasn't clear whether or not in if there was a, a future power shutdown uh, related to the, this um, heat wave, whether it would um, kick in on the coast um, for that service area. Yeah, thank you, Supervisor. Um, so um, we have uh, on both questions, we have built uh, a system that lets a, the customer look up their uh, outage uh, block number. That's also on your pg e bill. Uh, should you uh, be looking for that? That's always listed there. Um, again, not something we, we hope to use often, uh, but it is there for emergency purposes. Um, customers can look that up by looking up their address, and then they can um, uh, uh, understand what the timing is of that. So we did build that tool. I will uh, caution the public that we built that tool. That is not something that we had ready to go. And so we built it in the last about 36 hours. Um, so uh, I just uh, take it with a grain of salt. We are trying to provide that service to customers, uh, but it obviously has not had the same rigor that we would normally put into an IT system. So um, uh, I just want to acknowledge that uh, that, that uh, reality is there with that system. The second issue is, is Fort Bragg. Um, Jason is going to show uh, when we get to that part where um, and how generation will affect. We are trying to uh, operate the generator at Fort Bragg. It would not, however, serve the general community uh, as a microgrid, say, if we had to turn off that area. Uh, and again, that area is, is unlikely to be affected here, right? It's just the area north of Ukiah. Um, so it's more that the generator would operate and help the overall grid as opposed to providing some sort of microgrid in the Fort Bragg area uh, if that area had been out. And so in a lot of the substations across our territory where we have generation staged, for PSPS this fall, we are uh, firing it up today where we can uh, to support the overall effort in the state. Okay, okay. I, can't, I can't see everybody, but um, are there any other questions from the board? I, I have one question. Are there any other locations in the county that will have uh, generators placed besides Fort Bragg? So um, in, the, in the further presentation, uh, we're going to go through all of the substations. And we've got a map that we can show you of all the substations that are being made ready for generation and all of the ones. Uh, and, and then Jason will also explain which ones we're going to have sub, um, generation actually parked at and which ones will be served by sort of a hub where we're keeping uh, some of the generators. And he's going to walk through that when I get to him, if, uh, if you're okay uh, holding on that question. Yeah, excellent. No further questions. Okay, thank you. All right, I'm selling Jason a lot, so I'll, uh, I'll uh, go through my part uh, relatively quickly. Um, we have a few introductory slides. I know that you all have seen um, some previous presentations and that we've met with the county on a number of occasions uh, over the winter and spring. Um, so uh, just the basic structure of this presentation, um, we'll go through most of these items quickly. I really want to focus on the third item here that uh, about the improvements we're making uh, and that fifth item on there, which is really the electrical grid overview, which I think will be the most insightful for, um, for you all in terms of some of the areas that we'll be able to support this year. So uh, next slide. Thank you. Um, this is just a snapshot of the infrastructure in the county. Uh, hopefully you've seen this before um, and, and just indicating that as, as you all well know that most of Mendocino County is in the elevated or extreme uh, fire risk area. Um, we serve about um, 40,000 customers, uh, about half of which are in these high fire threat areas, um, 2,000 miles of distribution lines and about uh, 350 of transmission. Um, again, uh, critical facilities, medical baseline numbers listed there as well. And all of that information has been shared uh, with uh, County Emergency Management. Um, this uh, late this spring, early this summer. Um, next slide, please. Uh, I, I just want to know that, you know, I know that my colleague um, 
Ahmad Ababne was part of a couple of the meetings. Um, he's the vice president of our major project delivery. He uh, was uh, present for the listening session and uh, one of the early uh, uh, sort of planning sessions a couple of months back um, that we coordinated with your emergency management office. I think um, I, I won't go through all of these here, but um, I, I just want to say that the feedback that we've heard uh, really boils down to um, uh, better preparation, better information, better communication, and better support. And those are all things that we are working on. We have um, over two dozen project teams at pg e that are working on a variety of different elements of the public safety uh, uh, shutoff program. And I'll provide you an overview of that overall effort to really take a program that you know we know just had unacceptable consequences. Um, uh, the, the, the impact to communities was far too much, and we can't have a re repeat of that this year. Unfortunately, with fire risk being what it is, and we're certainly seeing that the last couple of days, you know, mostly driven by lightning in this instance, um, uh, we had 11 fires burning in, across pg e territory this morning, and I know reports of many more today. So um, that fire risk is out there. It's very real. We will need this tool in our tool chest but we've got to use it better than we did last year. We understand that uh, implicitly. Uh, frankly, it was unacceptable performance last year and, and far too impactful. So um, uh, next slide. We're really focused. Uh, we've used this not as a marketing slogan. It could sound like that. This is uh, just something for our teams to repeat internally. Uh, and we try and say it just as an organizing principle for all of us, smaller, shorter, smarter. Uh, we've got to make the event smaller we're trying to reduce the overall size by one third um, through a combination of things you're going to see today, sectionalizing devices that help us break the grid into smaller pieces. And then um, the other big impact will be these microgrids uh, or in temporary generation at these substations that will let areas that um, maybe were collaterally impacted from fire danger somewhere else on the system. Uh, and because of the interconnectedness of the grid, they were affected. We are going to um, try to take those uh, out of scope um, with uh, this backup generation. So um, shorter in length, uh, we're significantly increasing the resources, especially the helicopter fleet, almost doubling in size so that we can cut our stated goal of 24 hours of daylight, which you know was our goal last year and we didn't live up to in all instances. I want to acknowledge we're trying to reduce that to 12 hours of daylight. So you know if we can get an all clear from a PSPS event at sunrise, um, uh, depending on how much time there is in that day, you know, the goal would be to get everybody back in lights uh, uh, before the sun, uh, before last light, I should say, in a day. Um, so um, uh, we're also going to be moving resources around. Um, we certainly are aware of the, the feedback that sometimes pg e is very big. This is, uh, and, and, and that can make it challenging to work with. In this instance, uh, we have contractor crews, you know, all the way um, uh, north of Humboldt and, and, uh, and, and all the way down to Bakersfield. And we were moving uh, crews only regionally last year. This year, we will be moving them all over our service territory so that there are more folks available to do the patrols on lines to get the, the um, uh, get power restored more quickly. Smarter is really about um, better information, communicating with emergency management. Obviously, uh, the very embarrassing event of our website crashing last year. Uh, we've really put that one to bed uh, We uh, in later October. We had about six times the traffic and everything held. We've moved both our primary website and backup one uh, to the cloud uh, with um, a high degree of scalability in them now and a fully functioning operating backup emergency site at all times. So um, much stronger and, and uh, a battle tested uh, website for this year, uh, better community resource centers. And then obviously um, we wanna support our most vulnerable customers as well through uh, really working with community-based organizations. That's not always pg and uh, strength. And so what we wanna do is help fund organizations that um, are good at working with these, um, our most vulnerable customers and providing that uh, sort of support. And so that is a, a big focus for us. Um, I do also just wanna speak to COVID readiness uh, on the next slide, please. Um, a lot of things that we're doing around uh, COVID. Uh, most critically, we've been working with the California Hospital Association and the Hospital Council to make sure that all 31 facilities that are in the PSPS footprint uh, have a resiliency plan that will allow them to operate at or close to their um, uh, their uh, normal operating uh, 
status. So in some instances, these microgrids we're going to speak about will help with those hospitals. In other instances, um, we are uh, making sure that uh, we may roll additional uh, individual site backup generation to support any and all hospitals. Um, we made it easier to get on medical baseline by uh, removing the need for a physician's note uh, so that people can get on that. We don't want to be sending people unnecessarily to medical facilities right now. Um, and, and then ultimately, our community resource centers, we have a few different models that we've built, indoor facilities, uh, if that's appropriate in COVID-19 conditions, outdoor sites that are open air, that are kind of more grab and go style based on COVID testing facilities, uh, you know, a snack, water information, and a, a small device charger, and then medical device chargers at that site. Um, we've also got sprinter vans, a small fleet of those that we can deploy into particular areas. So we don't know what the state of COVID will look like in the fall, but we wanna be ready with whatever um, execution model makes the most sense for CRCs. And we will take our lead from you locally in terms of which model you would like us to deploy in different locations, uh, depending on how things look in Mendocino. So um, uh, the last thing I'll cover uh, uh, before I really turn it over to Jason is the community resource centers. Um, that's on the next slide here. Um, these are the sites that we have uh, actively that we are working on. Um, they include uh, both indoor and outdoor facilities. You can see on the color coding there. Um, our goal is to have uh, those three indoor sites uh, ready. Um, and, uh, and then also to have a, a big uh, swath of outdoor sites um, available as well so that um, we can execute either model. Uh, and again, the idea here is that we're trying to have um, one of each in each location uh, uh, around the hard side facilities. Uh, we'll obviously have a lot more outdoor facilities. They're a little easier uh, to get secured. On the indoor facilities, we are paying for modest ADA upgrades and also the installing a transfer switch. And we will have generation parked at them so they are ready to go um, once those upgrades are all ready. So um, that's what we're doing on community resource centers. With that, uh, the next slide is really starting to show you where the temporary microgrids are and where we're uh, staging generation. And with that, um, I think I would turn it over to my colleague, Jason Regan, to allow him to uh, go into our GIS system and, and give you a little bit more detail than this, uh, this picture on the slide. Great, can I get a mic check or a thumbs up, Aaron? Can you hear me okay? I hear you, Jason. Okay, great. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, I need uh, Bobby to stop sharing yours first before it allows me to uh, share it. So while Bobby's doing that, um, ladies and gentlemen, my name is uh, Jason Regan. I've been with Pacific Gas and Electric uh, for about 20 years. I started in gas and I've had the opportunity to hold many positions, both from a uh, field construction level to emergency response to where I'm at with all of you right now. Um, what I would like uh, to do is I'm going to speak a little bit uh, for about five minutes and do a grid overview, talk a little bit about how we're mitigating efforts for needs for a PSPS beyond just turning the power off. And I, I would be remiss if I didn't say one thank you for your help from a COVID perspective, pandemic response. I am the uh, deputy I see on a, for pg and pandemic response, um, along with this heat event, uh, our IC is Mark Quinlan, and uh, understand the challenges you have in your county, and we're looking here to not be a part of those challenges, but to be more of a solution. So uh, to share a little bandwidth, I'm going to stop video, but I wanted to virtually just say hello, introduce myself, and, uh, and get right into it. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn the video off so I can share some uh, uh, bandwidth here. Aaron, can I just get a uh, verbal confirmation that uh, you can see uh, this ISO web page here first? I can see it, Jason. Okay, great. Just a test, everybody. Look, uh, uh, Aaron talked a little bit about generation, and I'm going to go into it here shortly. But current grid conditions are being uh, being seen as more favorable. And I'm going to zoom in here to talk a little bit. This is about the uh, the load that is uh, that is about five minute average on the state versus certain forecasts. So what I'm just trying to show here is. What pg is doing a little bit with the uh, temp generation is not a huge contribution, but in times like this, every megawatt matters. And we are seeing some favorable trends uh, by the utilities and uh, the public with conservation. So I do want to get a plug in there. We're not out of the woods yet, and we do have a, a dicey few hours, but I wanted to acknowledge that. I also wanted to acknowledge that um, we recognize the districts, and I'm going to speak as best I can relative to districts. 
rather than PG e uh, jargon or, or lingo. Um, also wanted to say what I'm going to show is a GIS portal that's very similar to the portal that all of you use, so it shouldn't be too odd or new. Uh, frankly, we use some of your GIS information that's publicly available to supplement our uh, GIS system, such as roads and parcels and uh, specific county priority uh, locations, things like that. So um, what I'm going to then also recognize is that we understand and are partnering with the city of Ukiah as a customer of ours. They are fed from a transmission source, about 16,000 or so. Uh, customers on the back end of that meter, uh, but we are the power provider to them. So in partnership, we're here to recognize uh, all of you as supervisors in the district you, you represent and serve. Um, and then I wanted to uh, go right into the GIS overview. So um, this is our GIS overview. And Aaron, I do want to just check. You can still see the screen okay, and there's not too too bad of a, of a lag time, is there? Are we okay? It looks pretty good, Jason. Okay, great, thank you. Bear with me again, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's about five minutes of speech. Um, I did want to point on point at one thing. Uh, I had the honor and opportunity to be asked to pause on my control center role and uh, fill a, a new position called uh, Public Safety Power Shutoff Director of Mitigate, Public Safety Power Shutoff Mitigations. And what does that mean? There's a lot of words there. It's really, look, at the end of the day, a public safety power shutoff cannot be our only choice and it won't be this year, and we've got to do things differently. We heard it from all of you. We heard it from every county we serve, and we are uh, going to be on our toes this year rather than our heels. So uh, what I wanted to acknowledge is the efforts that I'm going to go over are from the men and women at pg and &E, uh, that are proudly trying to be better and listening not only to many of you, but their neighbors and loved ones and others. And a couple of things we're going to talk about is the grid overview of how power is served to Mendocino, I'm going to talk a little bit about some uh, temporary generation and large generation uh, that we're supporting uh, within your county and also in the Humboldt area. And then I'm going to go into some PSPS mitigation where we have actually surgically gone and added new isolation devices. And I'll spend more time when I get there. But frankly, it's about being able to better isolate our grid so those customers that don't need to be interrupted because they're not at risk of catastrophic wildfire conditions don't have to be. Um, with that said, as you see on the screen in the state of California, we serve about two thirds of it. We have partners in the South, uh, SCE and SDG&E, but we also got municipalities and co-ops such as uh, City of Dukaya that we partner with. I'm gonna turn on roads here for a second and then I'm gonna get more tighter into uh, actually Mendocino. This red line is a bulk transmission line, a 500 kV line, uh, similar to what we're challenged with today in, state, in the state's uh, capacity challenges. Uh, the major amounts of megawatts flow north to south uh, on this path similar to these roads like Highway 5, 101, 280, uh, 80. So I'm gonna turn those off. These are a major transmission path, but I'm gonna turn the roads off for the sake of complexity. Uh, the 500 kV bulk system uh, is like your major highway. And then as I zoom in here, you're gonna to start to see a few layers populate and it goes from a 500 kV voltage down to a 230,000 kV voltage. It's similar to taking a state road versus an interstate road. Um, we have to push megawatts across the state because the service territory is so large at a very high voltage. But residential and commercial customers cannot accept high voltage. It damages equipment and frankly, it puts uh, um, uh, our customers at risk. So we step the voltage down from 500 all the way to a 4 kV level at a very distribution uh, uh, delivered uh, level of source so that when you have power in your homes or your businesses, the power quality is able to meet the demands that you have of us as your uh, utility provider. So we go 500 to 230. As I continue to move into uh, this area, you will see some additional uh, transmission lines start to populate. And I apologize, I, I don't have the greatest bandwidth, but it, but it will populate here. Um, what I wanted to bring to attention is we talked about the 500 corridor uh, and then the 230 corridor. The 230 corridor has a major substation in Cortina, which is outside of your county. That 230 uh, source uh, allows for a Up quickly enough and then also 60 kv lines that's a green i know i'm showing lake county but the source for energy uh one major path of three that we have that feeds mendocino comes from the valley across lake county uh into redwood valley ukiah area so these are major transmission paths we also have paths that come from the south down here by clover cloverdale north into hoplin and we also have transmission paths in the north that come from the Humboldt area, from Garberville, past Leggett, to Cavello, and Laytonville. 
Um, I wanted to kind of show you that because there are multiple paths of transmission support for Mendocino, but not any single path can serve the entire county if those uh, remaining paths were to be interrupted, okay? So bear with me, I'm gonna zoom out and I'll have plenty of time for questions because I wanna show a little bit more beyond just the transmission uh, pass. Now that we've talked a little bit about the 500 and 230, I'm just gonna take them off to get a little less, um, a little less impacted. I'm also going to turn off the 230 KV substation. What I wanted to show here is what, the active uh, high fire threat districts, which are tier three, the most extreme, and the tier two areas. And a, and a large percentage of Mendocino County is covered in these very high fire threat district areas. These are the areas that we need to mitigate against having any of our assets contribute when the conditions are, 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 are extreme of uh, contributing to the start or, or continuation of a catastrophic wildfire event. So the PSPF program is about de-energizing equipment in these high fire threat districts, unless we have another option. And that's what I'm gonna talk about here. So I'm gonna turn these off and I'll come back to them. I also wanted to turn on um, just uh, a bit of information that says, that shows that we recognize the efforts by CAL FIRE, US Forest Service and others. These red, uh, more amber type, um, dark magenta colors are the large and extended attack fires over the last 30 years. So there is risk and we've seen it and we've, uh, uh, been responding to it over the last 30 years. So this is not something new, uh, but we've got to be smarter and, and better at applying to it. I also wanted to recognize a couple of things. Um, we have our tribal lands that we support in your county uh, that are, of course, another area of priority and inclusion. And then uh, being the pandemic response deputy, I just wanted to acknowledge a couple of things that we're working uh, with California Hospital Association and other leaders to identify critical needs relative to pandemic response. Some hotels become um, nursing facilities because the hotels become over, uh, because the hospitals become overloaded. Um, we also have, and I don't wanna click on it because if it does, it's just really too much information, but we know where the hospitals are at working with the California Hospital Association and also the special needs facilities. One of the things is once we get out of the hospital and, we're, and the individual is stable, there's still a long period to recovery. And we need to be mindful that it's not just hospitals that are supporting community response needs relative to health. So that being said, I'm gonna go into a little bit of what are we doing differently? So I'm gonna start off, uh, since we're up here in the north, with a large islanded project that we're supporting in our Humboldt division, which is a Humboldt Island situation. These yellow pins represent substations that are all interconnected. Through our Humboldt Bay power plant, we're able to isolate this section um, from the transmission grid that is sourced out of Reading over here. And able to do so it leaves this portion of this county energized when we have at-risk conditions over to the east of them. Now, why is why am I bringing this up for Mendocino? Because Mendocino supports uh, it's also supported by a substation called Gerberville. So I'm going to turn on the polygons. These green polygons, and I called up this specific one that goes into Mendocino, are all areas that have addressable load that we can safely energize if, cool, if conditions warrant and allow us to, even without that transmission source that I talked about. I'm gonna zoom in a little tighter. Garberville has a circuit uh, that is supported by Garberville and it is the 1102 circuit and it'll come up here and you can see this orange circuit is a distribution level circuit that I'll speak to a little bit more when we get into uh, more portions of your county. It does go north into Humboldt but a, but a portion of it does lie with inside Mendocino down into Leggett and just uh, west of Cobola. So we want to recognize that there is an islanding situation here on a large scale that we have operational tested and are able to do if called upon due to a loss of a transmission source uh, for a PSPS need. I'm gonna turn these off and if you bear with me, I probably need about another five minutes and then I will help answer or go back to any of these topics. Um, from a county perspective what are we doing differently to be able to support um not interrupting customers in the first place so before i go to temp generation i want to shock a little bit about impacts in 2019 these polygons represent the impacts uh, potentially seen in the county if a psps was called for i'm going to turn on another layer behind it and though it may seem subtle we're talking at times direct communities that if we had another option on our grid, we could better isolate and not impact them. And I want you to focus in this area here uh, to the north, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, just, just in the Ukiah area and north of Ku Ukiah. I'm gonna turn off the 2020 impacts. And you can see how this area in the north 
has Dow avoided from a PSPS area uh, at a distribution level? I'm going to go back one more time to put that in perspective. Blue is 2019 and purple is 2020. Now, one thing to think about or one thing to note, these purple areas have a buffer of about a half a mile in the polygon. So it's not an exact to the parcel level representation. We will have that in a portal as we go into PSPS uh, at risk times and seasons and Aaron can speak to that. This is more for situational awareness. And the reason I put this on is because I'm now going to put on, we are installing uh, 26 new devices in, uh, in, uh, in Mendocino County. Uh, 16 of those were insta are installed in 2020 and the other portion were installed in 2019. These are these orange circles you see here. And I'm going to zoom in a little bit here and turn on the distribution layer. And when the distribution layer starts to populate, it will show you, bear with me because I don't want to turn on too much. I just want to turn on the overhead facilities that are on the ground. Um, as I zoom in, you're going to see some orange and green lines populate. These isolation devices, which we didn't have last year, that were specifically targeted for uh, PSPS needs, allows us to keep this area of Covalo uh, energized and only isolate up to the high fire threat areas. Uh, I'm going to go back and turn this on while the distribution layer populates. Remember I talked a little bit earlier about Tier 3 and two, Tier 2 areas? This is really what we're trying to avoid having energized lines in. And last year, we were not able to isolate successfully enough here because we just didn't have the, sh the strategic capability to do so. So these devices, which, by the way, are all completed in your county, allow us to keep certain areas of customers uh, energized. I'm going to scroll down here a little bit. And I'm going to go show you this other pocket of isolation devices. This purple area, um, if I turned off the high fire threat districts, looks much larger than it actually is. And it goes back to that buffer boundary I was talking about. So I'm turning on the tier two area. Everything in purple here is really a safe to energize area, but we have to have this, the, the ability to, to surgically isolate circuits that would go up into these foothills and only keep the customers that are down uh, in the valley areas energized. So now you can start to see like this orange circuit here, which is the, um, bear with me, is the Ukiah 1113. Bear with me, I gotta skip this break. This circuit here originates downtown, but then goes up into the foothills. Last year, we were unable to isolate the at-risk area with the non-at-risk area. And that's where you saw uh, indifference in customers and or representatives that said, hey, look, why am I out of power? There's no wind here and there's no risk. We didn't have the capability. So we ramped up and it installed uh, to date 597 new devices with a target of about 602. And we are at about 550 of those devices operational, ready to be served. So we got a couple of weeks left. But the isolation devices are really just about more strategically uh, isolating our customers so that they don't have to inter be interrupted at a, at a PSPS level, purely because we can't, um, lack of a better term, dice up, slice up our grid. All right, last topic, and then I'll, I'll pause for questions and, and anything we might need. I'm going to zoom back out here, and I'm going to turn off uh, the high fire threat area. I'm going to turn off the devices we talked about in the baseline impacts. And we're going to talk a little bit about temporary generation beyond Humboldt uh, idling, uh, um, islanding. I, th I believe it was Supervisor Jurdy that, that had asked about the, uh, and I apologize if I'm, if I'm not saying anyone's name correctly, or it, it's not meant to be disrespectful. Um, Fort Bragg, we have 14 megawatts right now that's being uh, prepared and ready to be energized before 5 p.m. tonight to help the California independent system operator with additional capacity at a grid level. At 14 megawatts, if during a PSPS, equals about 8,300 customers that would be uh, avoided. And I believe it was then Supervisor Williams that, that said, hey, what are we doing in the South? So as of today, right now, that Fort Bragg generation is being used for the state of California's needs beyond just that Fort Bragg community. And then Mr. Supervisor Williams, I'm now going to talk a little bit more about specific generation that we have targeted across all five districts, um, but it's not being used today. Because I think the question you had, is there any other generation we're using today beyond Fort Bragg? Not at this time for this heat event, but we do have it in place uh, for the upcoming PSPS season. So now I'm going to um, point out where we have all of our, uh, all of our, uh, substa our substations with, sorry, and only, I missed a button there. So each one of these little pins 
uh, is specific to status. The A priority is where we actually have generation on site, interconnected and available to use, not only for PSPS, but any type of grid emergency. And it just ha so happened to be somewhat of a coincidence that we had the heat event and our timing uh, in getting the permits and everything needed to do for Bragg worked out well and we're using it. The, the, uh, the orange ones are generation at site, but not interconnected. And the reason for that is we try to strategically place generation where we know are our usual suspects of at-risk condition, but we don't want to have it so locked in that we miss operational periods to be able to deploy it. So the orange items are where we actually have solid generation on site in the substation, and it's less than a 12 hour time to energize it. The yellow is where we plan to support and if needed, we're going to actually uh, bring them in from uh, hub stations. Now, the hub stations are, are the orange ones because we'll over uh, commit generation in these stations and then we can bring it up the, up the valley north into these other substations. I need to turn on the substations. My apologies. It probably would help a little bit here, too. Um, the want to go back to Supervisor Williams' comment is um, in this northern area, and you see some of the substations start to populate here. I apologize. I, I should have turned them on earlier. Uh, we have an elk substation. Elk substation, we have enough land to be able to support not only generation on site, but more of a hub uh, for us to put generation in. And it's called a hub and spoke model. You have a hub, and then you spoke out to the other uh, substations and communities. This green polygon is more of a travel path. The amount of megawatts we're putting in elk allow us to use Point Arena uh, all the way down to Guadalajara, uh, Garcia. Um, so this is the main hub where we have generation, and then we are able to dispatch it to Point Arena or Guadalajara. We do have some small generation units at Point Arena, but not enough to serve all the needs. I'm going to move out of District 5 and just kind of go over here to, I believe, bear with me, 1 and 2 and 3, just to kind of put it in perspective so that we're, we're really – laying this out across the county-wise and not one specific area. Uh, in the city of Ukiah, we have generation. Uh, we recognize that city of Ukiah is a transmission source to us. Um, there have been some ongoing conversations about potential gen use. Uh, and frankly, what we're supporting right now is a pg and &E supported customer. Uh, through the Cal OES and others, we'll look to provide any relief we may need as a utility partner. But the generation stage at Ukiah is relief for distribution pg and &E load. Uh, we also have Capella, and we also have, um, sorry, down here in Cloverdale, which we can deploy up to Hopland and other areas. So I know this is a, a lot of information to download. I appreciate your patience with me, uh, and I'm welcome to answer any questions and turn on any layers that we might have. But I'll just pause, Aaron, to make sure, one, uh, we answered everything that you wanted to make sure we go through, and if there's anything you wanted to add that I might have missed. Nothing to add for me, Jason. Uh, I, I welcome the questions. All right, any questions from the board? I have a question. Yeah, Supervisor. Can you zoom in on the Little Lake substation on the coast town of Mendocino? Was that an orange or a yellow? Looks like it's a yellow. This one here? Yeah. My apologies. Yep, you got and, it. So this is and, one we would be dispatched. Go ahead. And what does that polygon look like that's associated? Oh, my, you know, my apologies. Let me, uh, let me pull up a couple of polygons that I... I don't, don't apologize. This is a much it. better presentation than last year. We appreciate it. You got it. Well, we're, we're trying to learn here. So I'm going to put on some full polygons, and, and I should have done that earlier. So let me back out just a little bit because uh, there's a couple of views here I need to show so it's not it's not misunderstood. I'm going to turn off the, the, the additional hub one down here just for the sake of this. So all these uh, kind of light blue colors are substation load areas. It doesn't mean that all of this load can be served because what we have to do is it has to be compared to the actual two high fire threat districts that we that we operate to uh, with the Cal, with Cal Fire and others. So let's go back to uh, the Mendocino area. And you can see that the high fire threat district will not allow us to keep this overhead orange line of the Big River 1101 in service. But we can keep this green underground line with a generation source that comes out of the substation, right? and be able to serve the underground facilities and a majority of this coastal area that was unfortunately impacted last year. Does that help, Supervisor Williams? It, it does. And last question, um, when you talk about generator, say in the case of Fort Bragg, um, we, we've had uh, some residents asking how loud those will be. Is there a decibel rating or 
what 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 can the pop, what can people expect when generation is on locally? Yeah, so so we we are very mindful of that and working with that. There is a there is some noise associated, but we're working with United, Agreco, and Caterpillar. All of these vendors utilize generation that is meant to be used in like um, sporting events, uh, emergency situations for communities. I will get back to Aaron and provide the exact decibel amounts for 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 the areas because it's a little spread out depending on vendor. It is very low. Uh, there is some hum, and we recognize that we've got to be better than just noisy, loud generators coming in. I would reference it to anyone that might watch a golf game or a golf presentation where they have generators that fill that feed the events, but you don't hear them because they're either in silent, they're very silent, or they're low noise emitting. I apologize for not having the actual decibel, but it is very low, and that is part of our overall strategic plan is not to bring loud generators hey, in. Uh, Jason, I, I just wanted to add, I know I remember you texted me uh, uh, a screenshot of uh, one of our texts at um, at one of the substations where we were testing the generation, and I want to say it was uh, uh, high 70s or low 80s, if I recall, but um, that would be subject to check. Yeah, maybe I could pull that up. You're right. That was a video. It, frankly, Supervisor Williams, I, we were happy to, to kind of showcase what we're doing. And so we took a video of, of a noise check at the substation. So I'll see if I can find that before before we leave. All right. Any other questions? I guess uh, I... Super Chair, uh, Chair Hashtag, I don't have a question, just a comment. I mean, I really do appreciate the work of pg &E in the last year. Um, obviously, we were all <laughs> somewhat caught off guard by what came last year with the PSB events. And um, all the work that you put into this uh, is really, you know, I think it will be appreciated by the public. And um, uh, while we're, we hope that the generators are as quiet as possible, um, you know, it. We do live in it here in Fort Bragg. We do live in a city, and we do have noise, loggy trucks, et cetera. Um, and I think people, given the choice, they'd rather have <laughs> rather have the power than than not. Um, so again, really do appreciate the work you've done to extend um, power. As Ted knows, here on the Mendocino Coast, we're often the last area of the county to get when regeneration comes back on after an event, just because of all the um, mechanisms you have to do to to regenerate uh, or reinstall power in the county. So um, it'll be nice to have power on the coast when there's um, a possible fire event or you know fire risk inland. And so the people on the coast aren't um, going without power um, and kind of wondering why they are without power. Thank you. We're, we're continuing to try to evolve and, and frankly be better than we were last year. So we welcome the feedback. But last year when your team presented, there was some discussion about hardening lines, and I think 7,100 miles was the number. Um, is that still the plan? Has any progress been made? How many miles in our county? Or is it? Or are you taking a new approach? So this is Aaron. Uh, I'll speak to the, the hardening lines. So we did, uh, we did a little over um, uh, 100 miles last year. We have targeted uh, 200 miles this year, about 240. And we're uh, about 60% uh, complete on that. Um, none of those miles are in Mendocino County. Uh, and also, I can do the same math that you can, that uh, one or 200 miles a year is not going to get us at that 7,100. So um, we are targeting 400 miles uh, next year and um, and trying to ramp that up. It's really a matter of, of getting the, um, the crews that we need uh, and the number of qualified electrical workers to be able to do that uh, quantity of work. That's... Um, pretty un 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 unprecedented in our industry to do that level of basically rebuilding of the network. Um, what what I don't have uh, to present to you um, and a hard number for Mendocino County, but generally um, our assessment is that all 7,100 of those miles, we're trying to do like a risk assessment of them. They're not created equal. Uh, some are at greater risk than others, and we really need to target those miles. The second thing, as we targeted those miles, um, last year and, and when we built that plan uh, uh, in the fall for this year, it didn't have PSPS as much in mind. So there are segments of the lines that are uh, that have not been hardened uh, that are in the middle of nowhere to say that, you know, on some line in a mountaintop area where maybe uh, the risk was the greatest, but it doesn't electrically isolate. So we can't leave it on in a PSPS event. So with the 400 miles for this year, 
Uh, we're going to be we're building that plan this fall, and we will be very focused on trying to connect it electrically so that there are, just like with the, the temporary generation, there are more and more areas that we know we can take out of scope. And um, so I don't have the plan for Mendocino County. Um, and uh, uh, I, I will say that, you know, the last two years, that work has been focused on where the fire risk and the ignition risk around our assets is highest. So um, the silver lining to us not working in Mendocino is that, that our risk assessment is that those are not the highest risk lines around our assets. What I would like to, to be able to offer up is, is that Allison and team, we come back uh, to you uh, as we build that plan and show you what that work plan looks like for this year and how we're approaching that issue writ large. So it's uh, it's kind of an incomplete answer to your question, but I'd like to follow up uh, and, and be able to provide you more insight as we evolve that plan and, and really give you a, ses a sense of, of what of the 7,100 miles are in Mendocino, how are we sort of risk ranking those and provide uh, that insight and, and what a, a preliminary work plan looks like. Uh, for next year as we do that. So the reality also around hardened lines is we haven't seen them go through PSPS seasons. This is the first year some will go through that. And we really need to uh, see that uh, in order to know that it's safe to operate them in those conditions. So we're still observing that. And um, so the fact that uh, early days of this program, we have not done a lot of lines in Mendocino County. Those lines are not coming out of scope this year uh, unless they're fully undergrounded. And so, um, uh, that will um, potentially, uh, so there, there isn't necessarily um, a lot of impact from that yet on PSPS. That will be more of a, a cumulative year's impact as we do more and more uh, of the hardening. Mr. Chair? Yes, Supervisor Brown. Thank you, sir. Um, on the uh, slides that um, attach to our agenda item, I'm looking at the one that says electric power supply Mendocino County, and there is a map, um, but I wasn't able to identify why there's a large blue um, dot and Potter Valley is in blue compared to the others. Can you explain that to me? The blue uh, square, I think, is, uh, Supervisor Brown, is that right, on page nine? says Potter Valley Powerhouse. Uh, is that what that means? Yeah, that's what it is. It's just that identification. That's good feedback. We can get that on there from a legend perspective. That's that actual powerhouse, uh, and it just identifies that it's a, a generating producing facility. Okay, thank you. And then in, there is an extreme area um, shown, um, and it would be to the east of Potter Valley. Is that Eel River Watershed? Uh, I tell you what, why don't I do this? I can pull up my uh, my screen uh, and see if they can give it to me to, to present. We can look at it in detail, but um, you would, can probably help me understand it better than, than I could. Is that okay? Yes, it's a tier three. Yeah. It says extreme. I just wondered what particular area that was. Yeah, I'm pulling it up right now. My apologies. So okay. this is, um, this uh, is, hello, hi, this is Deputy Clerk Lindsay Dunham. We will just need to identify where Supervisor Brown can find this information as she is joining us via telephone. Oh, okay. My apologies. It's okay. I do have the slideshow attached. Um, so I, I have that. So the tier three, uh, there is a portion of it west of, I mean, sorry, east of Potter Valley that goes to the uh, county border with Lake. And then just north and west of Redwood Valley is uh, Willet. It is uh, frankly surrounded on the on the southeast side with tier three, south, west side, and directly to the west. Uh, I apologize. I just and that would be up out as far as uh, Shake City, Burbeck, Clare Mill. And it's, does that help? Yes. And I just wanted that one area, Potter Valley, and it appears it's it going south. Um, to the Lake County line and it says extreme. Thank you. That is correct. Um, uh, could I suggest, Allison, that maybe uh, Jason can do a couple of screenshots and email them to you and you could pass along to the supervisor since she doesn't have the benefit of seeing the, the video uh, presentation. Could we do something like that? I think that's a great idea. This is Deputy Clerk Lindsay Dunham. Um, Allison has my email. She can feel free to send anything you'd like to um, distribute it to the supervisors. Just the COB support email, please. Thank you. 
Thank you. Copy. Well, and, oh, this is Supervisor Heschek. And certainly, um, you know, my area of Willits is surrounded by the tier three. And last year, when we had the power shut off, we had a house fire. And a lot of the people who live in like the valley section of of Willits who who have wells and require inner, you know, electricity to pump the water that we had a house fire that couldn't um, couldn't put out the fire with their own hoses because the electricity was turned off. And so is there a consideration of any of the temporary generation supported substations for the like the substation in Willits out in the valley? Yes, sir. Um, Supervisor Hashtag, I've got it up on the screen now. Willits is a Willits Alpha, Willits A substation. Everything you see in blue is where we have the ability to safely energize uh, our asset. The yellow and the red is where we will not have overhead assets energized. So we do have some ability. I just don't know the exact location of some of the items you're talking about, but you can see on the screen there's a, a pretty good portion in the Central Valley portion of Willits that uh, we can't support. We plan to this year. Right. It um, looks like a lot of the valley would be supported in that case. So, One addition, uh, Supervisor, that I wanted to uh, mention is there is a new program this year called the Self-Generation Incentive Program. And it is, uh, it is really targeted. Uh, it is a battery uh, program. One of the areas of focus is on folks that, um, that rely on well water in high fire threat areas. Um, and there's a pretty substantial rebate available through this program. It's a statewide program. We administer it in pg and &E service territory. Um, we can have Allison pass along some information, but it's called the Self-Generation Incentive Program. And uh, it, historically, for batteries, it really, uh, uh, the California Public Utilities Commission oversees that when they've really shifted the focus uh, towards um, resiliency uh, for these battery programs. We have over 3,000, I think it's 3,200 customers who have already signed up. Um, if they are both on our low income program and in high fire threat areas, the rebate will almost pay for the entirety of, uh, of that uh, battery. Um, and then, you know, it, it tears down based on if they're not necessarily low income, but they, they do get a fairly generous incentive if they are located in a, a high fire threat area. So um, that is a program that we are really trying to push uh, folks who have that same circumstance, obviously well water, you know, outside of our, our, our developed areas in, in California, there are many, many uh, folks on well water, and that is a, um, uh, uh, an issue we've heard uh, very much in a lot of different parts of the state uh, in terms of concern about that, especially in high fire, uh, you know, PSPS occurring around, you know, high fire danger. If it's not utility assets, it's still high fire danger risk, and there could be a fire started in another way. So um, uh, that's a program that we would really steer constituents to, and we'd be happy to provide you any kind of promotional material that you guys could all, uh, that all of you could help get out to your constituents as well, if that's helpful. Okay. I, th I think that um, you did send out some information through the mail about that, but if a person wanted to Google it, they could probably go to PG&E self-generation incentive program. Correct. Maybe get that information there. Correct. Okay, very good. Thank you. Any other comments from the board? All right, um, we'll go to public comment and we have one person who called in, John Almeida. Is John on the line? John? Mr. Almeida? He's muted and he's joining us now. Yeah, I can see. Okay. Mr. Almeida. Good afternoon. Hello, uh, this is John Almeida. Great. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, thank you, uh, Board Chair Haschek and the Board of Supervisor members. I live in the Willits Valley, been here most of my life, went through the 64 flood and we didn't lose the power for as much, the amount of time we did last year. And being as I do live in the valley east of Willits, and we call it the Little Lake Valley, but I'm going to call it Willits Valley to make it simple. Most of us out here are on well water. And my concern is I'm looking at your map and listening to your presentation, and you're not showing a permanent uh, or a semi-permanent stationing of these 
uh, generating sources for your substations here in Will or the substation here in Willits, what you're showing is it can be brought in. And in taking into fact that most of us out here in the valley are on well water, we've had a fire out here, uh, couldn't use the water for that. Plus, it's a health hazard not having water. I would uh, request that you permanently station a uh, semi trailer generating system in the Willits substation, which is out here in the Willits Valley also. And also, uh, last uh, fall, after these events happened, I went to a town hall meeting and talked to uh, Supervisor Hascheck and brought him a picture of these. It, since that time, I went out to the substation, looked. I've worked in heavy equipment all my life. And there's enough room for two semi-trailer generators out there. And, uh, of course, it's surrounded by ag land. And I'm sure if you needed more room for more generation, I don't know how many you would put in if you put them in in series. But there's enough room. And I'm sure that the, the resident that owns the property right adjacent would allow you to put in more if you needed to. But I know there's enough room for two. And I think that it should be established before the event not having to tow it in. And it looks like to me that you have it marked with three different types of stationing. And and one of them is the one in Willits is that you will bring in the generation source after the event happens. And that's really kind of late because we do have uh, issues like we had that fire last year. And I'd really like to see it be a more permanent situation out here in the in the uh, Willits Valley. And also, not only did we suffer here, but we had uh, only one place to get gasoline and they put in a generator source of their own. It was seconds. five hours to get generation. I mean, to get gasoline. And uh, a lot of people lost food and everything else. So I'd like to see the, the grocery stores, at least three gas stations, the hospital and the two pharmacies powered. Willits has water from municipal sources, so there, at least their people have water. But out here in the Time. valley, we don't. And then those other places I mentioned, very important to be powered up. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Mr. Almeida. Is there a response from PG&A on those comments? Uh, first of all, I'll, I'll let Jason speak to uh, some of the logistics about why we, we stationed it, it, it there, um, sir. I think one thing I just want to acknowledge is that... Um, uh, I, I think you're you're very fair in, in leveling that criticism uh, around the duration of the outages last year. Uh, completely unacceptable, and and we are we are doing everything we can to make this a much more manageable program. And uh, and uh, so I really appreciate that feedback. I would I would offer one one silver lining, and Jason can talk about the logistics. I believe the uh, the, the substation where the generation is staged at is uh, is only 20 miles away. Uh, we do have logistical plans to move it into place uh, 48 hours before a potential event. So um, I think that that will be manageable. I think the third thing to remember is that um, part of how we've assessed this is working with our meteorology team as to where PSPS events are more likely. So uh, the fact that uh, you know they're not as likely in Fort Bragg where we have parked something, but that can be challenging to get to. So for logistical reasons, we put one out there. Um, in this instance, I think uh, it will. It's uh, we see it as much lower risk. So uh, the silver lining is we think it's less likely to happen there. Obviously, you know, on the heels of last year, that's that's probably little consolation. I would understand, but um, but that is uh, when we go with our our, our uh, meteorologists, they do, t do tell us that location is uh, a little bit less likely, uh, which is some of why we've staged the generation the way we have. Anyway, Jason, anything you want to? add since you're uh you're uh that's his program so yeah, he's, uh, he tells yeah. better you, you got it first first and foremost uh john mr alameda thank you uh your comments are, are spot on and you've done your recon and intel willits has uh, ample room for generation uh we continue to reprioritize all the deployments either on site or not uh we chose the area of ukiah because it was a bit more central and about 40 minutes away like you like willits and other areas we can get it to uh, I really appreciate the feedback on the water situation and some of the uh, historical impacts that have been there. We do not anticipate uh, having this generation deployed after an event. Now, that might happen because something you know uh, new or emerging in the operational period evolves, but we have a seven-day forecast, and we are tracking to have generation available 
uh, that needs to be deployed within 48 hours. And so that gives us five days ahead of an event. We make strategic decisions. Um, but bottom line is you've done your homework. Uh, I appreciate the input and we will take all of this under consideration. And, and frankly, look, we're at a point in 2020 where we have about 460 megawatts available for us. And of that 460 megawatts, about 300 of it is available to deploy across our entire service territory. The other 160 is committed to either COVID, pandemic response, or our CRCs. So um, it's kind of a supply and demand uh, situation, but uh, I just want to say thank you. You're spot on as far as logistics and, and items, and we'll take your feedback and see if we can, uh, we can adjust that. But um, we do plan on having generation in place well before a PSPS is called, and uh, Willits would absolutely be one of these locations. If that helps, John, thank you. All right, thank you. Any further comments from the board? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. Yes, Supervisor McCowan. Uh, thank you. So I would like uh, a little more information on the uh, temporary generation and uh, the slide that I'm looking at uh, shows about 10 substations. And then there's also a reference to 70 plus sites across PG&E's service area. And is that, are those 70 all within Mendocino County or is that uh, system wide? So that's system wide and it, it takes into account both temporary generation and uh, smaller microgrids that we have in some other counties, not, not in uh, Mendocino. Um, for temporary generation at substations, the target right now is we're tracking to about 62 substations to be ready for and uh, 10 of those are what's inside your Mendocino County. Uh, thank you. And could you, uh, so we have 38,000 uh, PG&E customers. Uh, one of those customers, or, or correct me if I'm wrong, City of Ukiah basically is uh, counted as one customer. That is that is correct. Though, though we so recognize that it's a larger impact. Sorry, go ahead, Supervisor. Oh, well, well understood. So it's about 16,500 people. And what will be the impact of the temporary generation substations mitigating uh, PSPS events in the Ukiah area? So the uh, temporary generation is focused on PG&E distributed uh, energy at a distribution level for PG&E customers. Um, Ukiah is served at a transmission level and the 16,500 or so customers you reference is a large major watt, megawatt um, contribution. If you put it in perspective, depending if it's residential or commercial load, it's about 1,500, 1,000 to 1,500 customers can be supported, our facilities, accounts, however you wanna you know, kind of label it for one megawatt. So if you do the math, it's about 16 to 20 uh, megawatts that would need to be allocated for a transmission source like that. We have had conversations with the city of Ukiah. It wouldn't be prudent for me to, to, to respond on their behalf on their you know, readiness, but we recognize them as a customer and we will continue to work with them if there's a unique need uh, and if we can actually do so. So I, I'm trying to be as respectful as I can, Supervisor uh, McCown, I believe, um, that we recognize them as a transmission supported customer um, the temp generation is specific to the distribution customers that are PG&Es, uh, not the single UPI customer, if that at least helps the conversation. So uh, if I understand correctly, PG&E will not be directly providing much, if any, benefit to the residents of Ukiah. Um, I, I don't know if I'd put it that way. What I would say is that we have distribution circuits out of Ukiah um, that I can share back up on the screen, like Ukiah 1104. It's the southern portion of Ukiah. But to your point, everything that is served out of the city of Ukiah, which is the 16,000, is independent of this temporary gen solution. So, so you are correct. It's just, just a little difference in, I guess, opinion on any customers in, in Ukiah. I, I think that the other element that Go I ahead. would add the other element, sorry, apologize for interrupting, Sir Roger. The other element that I would add is that we have been uh, obviously serving a transmission customers two elements. Uh, communication with transmission level customers was not very good last year. We have uh, significantly upgraded that uh, and held a series of webinars uh, last week. 
uh, including one focused at municipal utilities that take uh, service from us at the transmission level to make sure that we can really increase the communication uh, and the coordination over what they experienced uh, as customers last year. So better communication. The second element is we've really relooked at the, uh, the transmission system in terms of how many transmission lines came out of scope. Uh, we had in many instances, uh, you know, a particular area on a transmission line and that whole line came out of scope. We've installed um, a, a significant number of transmission switching devices, just like you saw on the distribution example that Jason did, that will allow us to isolate the transmission system a little more. It's hard to say exactly what those impacts will be. Uh, that's a very dynamic system and it depends on the weather footprint, but we think we can isolate the transmission system a little more. And we've gone in and done more risk analysis to really know which are the transmission lines we should be more focused on with the expectation that, that um, it, uh, we, would, we would say based on last year's events and no event is the same, we would have less transmission taken out of service. So that should reduce the odds uh, that, um, that Ukiah would be impacted as we've tried again to kind of narrow the program. Again, it will really depend on those specifics and it doesn't rule them out entirely, uh, but it should reduce the likelihood of them being impacted with those uh, those different initiatives. Understood. Thank you. And uh, can you uh, say approximately how many of your 38,000 customers would benefit from the temporary generation at substations, assuming all 10 were involved in the same PSPS event? Uh, I apologize, I don't have that number. Um, for example, for Bragg would be 8,000. Um, I tell you what, we can absolutely get a very quick follow-up to the answer. I, I don't want to misspeak and then um, have to come back and say, you know, frankly. Certainly, if, if, if you could okay. just provide that information to the clerk of the board, uh, that would be great. And then I will say that, uh, like my colleagues, I certainly appreciate the presentation, we're off to a much better footing uh, than we were last year when every city, school district, business, resident, nonprofit entity of any kind was basically left to their own devices to determine how to respond to the PSPS events rather than having a coherent uh, plan pushed out in advance that these entities could all then uh, build on. So, uh, you know, again, I appreciate the effort. Ultimately, the proof will be in the pudding. I was on uh, several of the uh, calls last year, and one uh, consistent outcome was that when questions were raised during the calls that couldn't be answered, we were told, we will get back to you. Uh, it'll maybe a slight overstatement but my my recollection is nobody ever got back to anybody so communication was uh, very poor and uh, i appreciate the work that has been done to correct uh, that deficiency ultimately the proof will be in the pudding as the events roll out I, I agree, Supervisor, uh, a presentation is, is a nice thing to get and, and hopefully, uh, and I appreciate the kind words about the plan and more cohesion to it, but I, I couldn't agree with you more that, that the events of this fall will dictate the success of that plan and that is much more important than uh, any presentation. I do wanna uh, just acknowledge um, Rich Noonan who we've significantly enhanced our, uh, our number of emergency public safety specialists, we call them. Um, Generally, uh, most of them have strong fire backgrounds uh, and uh, have come to PG&E after uh, long careers, uh, pretty senior in a lot of agencies. And, and so we think we've increased that group so that there will be more uh, localized uh, focus when we have actual events, uh, as well as we've worked a lot with CAL FIRE. Uh, myself personally, as you know, I ran a number of those calls last year and, and that is not a model that I think was a model. Uh, and, uh, and so we've worked a lot with CAL FIRE on event management, and, and they've really helped us with how they manage fires to try and build a similar element. And one of the key elements of that is that we will not be doing big giant calls with dozens of counties on them. We will have a single local call twice a day 
with uh, Mendocino County. Um, it can be your call. We can organize it if you prefer. Uh, and you can invite all the local constituents that uh, make sense to you to that call. And we will provide localized uh, follow-up and information uh, in those events uh, going forward so that we're not doing uh, some big giant event management from our uh, EOC uh, Emergency Operations Center in San Francisco. So um, we, uh, in an event, uh, my boss, the head of the electric operations organization says we have to get small. That's how you respond to people's needs. And so our intent is to get very small and local with you this year. And, uh, 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 you know, I, uh, I expect to be back here in front of you all at some point early next year. And, um, and uh, I am uh, hopeful that we will have uh, a much better results to, uh, to be recollecting on as we continue to build the program. Okay. Thank you. Well, that sounds like a good plan. And I would like to say that none of my comments were directed at PG, PG&E uh, on the ground personnel, all of whom went above and beyond. Uh, Allison Talbot was uh, working very hard to get information out. Uh, when we were trying to get some of the last uh, customers on the South Coast uh, back in service, uh, PG&E, you had some employees that were working well into the night, uh, communicating in real time with uh, Mendocino County to get the job done. So you've got a lot of great people working for you in the field, and hopefully your advanced planning this year will uh, support them at the uh, higher up levels. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you for those kind words, supervisors and uh, supervisor. And uh, I, I, uh, one of the things I say often is uh, I would like my company to be as good as our people on the ground. So uh, that's what we aspire to. Thank you. And I, I would like to turn to Brent Blazer from the Office of Emergency Services, see if um, he has anything to add to this presentation and our preparation in Mendocino County for any kind of PSPS. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, yeah, you know, we've done a number of things on the preparedness side. I don't want to step in on anybody's toes. I also have Shannon here, and of course, Steve's been working hard doing internal coordination aspects with the county. So we've been doing weekly meetings, um, just kind of doing cross department talks and seeing what needs to happen, or maybe kind of uh, brainstorming uh, any shortfalls they might not be identifying. And then, of course, I've been working with Shannon, uh, Lieutenant Barney here on the sheriff's side, and just kind of doing the key leader engagements with external partners like our cities. Uh, we'll be doing something with the tribes, schools, uh, and such. And of course, with PG&E, who've been fantastic partners. Um, really, our emphasis has, started, has, has been looking at the preparedness aspect. We've been doing a lot of PSAs. Hopefully, uh, all everyone in the community has been seeing those. Um, our PIOs, our public information officers, have been doing a fantastic job of uh, really kind of educating the public on not just PSPS threats and getting ready, but also understanding what uh, simple things are like uh, evacuation orders, evacuation warnings, and kind of circulating that um, uh, language so that when they see the alerts uh, for potential secondary effects of a PSPS, I say effects, but things that we're at risk of during this time of year, like fires, that they'll know what those mean. Um, we've also been working with LISTO and a couple of our uh, internal partners here, the different nonprofits that engage um, at-risk populations, Hispanic, um, of course, elderly and, and children and such in a ver variety of different ways. Um, we're actually one of the few communities or few counties to be engaging some of these programs. So uh, we're pretty proud of that initiative. Um, on the planning side, we're doing a lot with alert and warning. Uh, obviously, PSPS is the um, is the driving force right now. But again, there's the secondary aspects and of course, then the COVID. Uh, so it's getting to be a very com complicated fire season. Uh, so we want to make sure our A game is there for any potential notification we have to do to the public. Uh, we hope to have that updated plan to you guys in the next next few weeks, actually. Um, and so we're really kind of putting a lot of, uh, of energy into documentation process, um, recruiting, of, you know, getting people to enroll, and then also just um, cleaning up uh, some different data aspects in the background. So it's, it's really a kind of a big, big lift. Uh, and then, of course, other plans that are coming, coming out are the evacuation plan, which you'll see in, a, in the next few weeks. Um, and then, of course, we did a de-energization plan for the county uh, that we're kind of working through with Steve's support to kind of 
crosswalk it with the different uh, different partners, um, which the city of Ukiah has done a fantastic job in the fact that we also got to see their uh, plan and they helped build out theirs and ours, uh, which was greatly appreciated. Um, so really, um, pending any questions, I'm, I'm going to stop there. I know you guys are a little, we're a little past the time allotted, and I want to be respectful. Um, but I just want to uh, really acknowledge that, um, you know, our executive team, Steve, Carmel, uh, Matt, over, I'm sorry, Sheriff Kendall, have been really supportive, letting us, you know, run with with new ideas and such, and, and kind of getting work done. Uh, Becky over in HSA has done a fantastic job. She's engaging her team in the aspect of uh, looking at sheltering and how do we need to change sheltering aspects of trying to cope with COVID issues this year. Um, and then, of course, you know, Steve's been doing a lot of continuity of operations type aspects from across different county departments. So it's really been a team effort and we um, just, you know, look to your guidance for what you guys need done uh, and, and appreciate the uh, support. All right, thank you. Um, Lieutenant Barney, did you have anything to add? I do, if you can hear me, I'll keep this very short. Yes. Um, one of the things that I would like to reach out to pg and and thank them for is basically uh, their change in planning to bring things to the local level. I think Aaron mentioned it earlier, is that basically that information coming uh, from Allison Rich and David Hotkiss, if he's helping out our uh, other public safety uh, folks for uh, pg e here in the county. They have intimate knowledge of the county. Allison's been uh, supporting Mendocino County for a number of years, and they hopefully will, in our briefings daily here in the county, be able to provide local answers to what's going on and get information. Um, <clears throat> and this is, I, I applaud that approach. I know last year you guys had a mountain of information to try and get out, and I think logistically it was just overwhelming to try and you know, feed that information down to so many different participants. So I appreciate that. One of the things we uh, held meetings uh, starting early in July with all of our participants, as Brett indicated, uh, just to kind of establish uh, expectations and roles and responsibilities. We are looking at this event uh, as primarily at the county level, a coordination and uh, dissemination of information from pg e out to the public and keep everybody informed back up to Cal OES and as well as pg e um, The only thing we're really anticipating uh, trying to prepare for is if we get a back-to-back -back PS, uh, PSPS event like we had last year that extends it out, we'll be in good communication with uh, pg e on that level and or if we have a fire during a PSPS event you know, we are trying to prepare for some of those different avenues. I, I would point out that uh, I know the county has expended a lot of uh, money it, towards COVID. And one of the positive things that came out of COVID was we were able to train and get a lot of our county staff up to speed on EOC type events and things like that. So we have uh, roughed out a uh, initial staffing for our EOC. If we find the need to uh, activate the EOC, we're, we are ready to do that. And our staff is fairly comfortable knowing their jobs. Uh, so I'm anticipating this year having the PSPS event have a lot less impact than it had last year. And I think uh, pg e has done an exceptional job as to putting in some planning as well as working on their infrastructure and things like that to isolate some of these grids uh, to you know hopefully provide as much power to as many people as he can. So with that, uh, if you have any questions specifically for us, we'll answer those, uh, but we know you're busy, so we'll uh, keep it short. Okay, thank you. Let's see, are there any other last comments from the board? Okay, hearing none, um, we can accept the presentation from PG&E regarding the PSPA, PS program preparations in the county, and we appreciate the work that's being done. Thank, Thank you very much for the opportunity to present. I really appreciate Sheriff and Brent, the spirit of partnership. Uh, that's uh, we'd like to be the partner to match your expectations and uh, and I'm glad you're starting to see what you're looking for there so thank you for that partnership that's how we'll get through these events and yes. uh, and for all the all the generous time today you gave us an incredibly long okay. block here and that's yeah very 
Okay, thank you all. Thank you. Okay, take care. All right. Um, because we um, we had some issues dealing with fire departments from the consent calendar that got pulled for O, for P, for R, and for, um, well, I don't know if for I was in that group, but it was, got pulled. So we're going to go to for O because um, the fire department people were available at this time. So going back to 4O. Mr. Chair? Yes. Um, there, there were three fire department items on consent and 4O and 4R um, were alike where 4P didn't have all the same language. Um, but uh, anyway, I'd, I'd like for you to go ahead, but it's it's all three, 4O, 4P, and 4R. Okay, so can we just deal with all of those together? Yes, Cause... Mr. Chair, I believe that would work. Okay, so um, do we have any kind of presentation? Is anyone here to talk to those issues? Uh, if I may begin, Mr. Chair. Yes. So um, I, I believe that the board had inquired a little bit, uh, just first of all, as to the, the process and sort of the reasons uh, for this being uh, in front of the board at the moment. Um, the, uh, so just so that everyone uh, on the board and the public is, is understanding, um, you know, these are ordinances that are adopted by the local fire uh, agencies. Um, they do have some authority under state statute to be able to adopt requirements in the fire code that are more restrictive than uh, those set at the state level. However, um, uh, in doing so, they have to submit it to the Board of Supervisors for ratification. So at this point, they have already gone through uh, a bit of a public process. Um, you know, the, those boards have met and have adopted these ordinances and submitted to them, them to the county. And I just want the, the board to understand that's part of the reason that we put it on uh, consent is because when it's already gone through that pro process, we're expecting it to be non-controversial. Now, there are questions that had arisen uh, in this, this particular case as to the interpretation and the effect of, um, of the ordinances that were passed by these fire districts. And um, you know, we, we were looking at this question, but we wanted to make sure that we give the fire districts themselves an opportunity uh, to speak to the appropriate interpretation and understanding of their ordinance. Um, you know, really, the, the agency is given significant deference in the interpretation of its own ordinance. Uh, and well, I could I could sit here and look at it and, and give you, um, you know, some some rough analysis. Um, I, I think it's very important uh, to give those agencies a chance to to be able to speak to those questions directly. So I understand that we have a, a representatives of a, um, a a few of the 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 fire districts on right now. Um, I believe Ms. Chandler is a counsel for. Uh, a couple of them. It, it might, if the chair wants to start with Ms. Chandler, that might be an appropriate uh, starting point. Okay, Ms. Chandler. This is Jenny Chandler. Uh, I represent both Hopland Fire District and uh, Redwood Valley Calpella. Uh, I have participated with them in advising them on the adoption of the code, but I really think that you need to hear from the fire departments themselves because they're there are significant reasons why an ag exempt building code designation is not the same as a fire code designation because fire code designation specifically relates to the potential damage that could be caused by an agricultural or industrial fire. So with that, I, I yield my time over to the fire chiefs. Uh, county board members, this is uh, Battalion Chief Ron Royson with Hopland. Um, thank you for uh, considering this. Um, I'd just like to I'm point sorry. out that... Excuse me. Hi, this is um, Deputy Clerk of the Board, Lindsay Dunham. Um, can I ask for all of those who are not speaking to please mute your microphones? Or turn down any uh, background noise? If I, I, I'm at the fire station. We got a lot of fires going on. I hear you. Okay. Thank you. There is some background noise. Okay. Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, speaking a little bit concerning this, uh, we find this often that uh, uh, people come in and say they're ag exempt. And that is for the construction. That doesn't mean you're fire department exempt. Uh, we still have to provide services to that structure. Um, if it is on fire or if there is a medical aid at that facility, um, we still have to provide those services. And uh, that's why we want to have those um, ag exempt um, added on to that fire code. I have a question. Okay. Thank you. Um, Supervisor Williams. Uh, under these proposed changes, uh, in effect, will we be classifying hoop houses, greenhouses, barns, tractor buildings, and livestock barns as F1 occupancies? Uh, per the proposed um, fire code changes, yes. So, you know, it strikes me that that may not be um, a feasible requirement for a lot of vineyard owners, ranchers, farmers, and so forth. Okay. okay. Um, is there anyone else from the fire departments? Yeah, this is Kerry Robinson, County Chief of Red Valley Fire Department. Yes, go ahead. So at Red Valley, we've come to the conclusion that in um, the one article in the definitions to the 202, that we have added the agricultural crop production, including cultivation, drying, and processing. Those are going to be F1s. The other buildings are ag exempt. Um, like the hoop houses. We're not including those into the F1. Um, things like barns and stuff like that, those fall underneath the miscellaneous U. So those won't be included in the F1. That's how Red Valley is uh, proceeding with this fire code interpretation. But we're still, are, are we still are requiring permits for the hoop houses. That is another item that's underneath the permits. Will uh, fees be collected for these permits? Yes. Is there a nexus study or how are those? We have, we have an ordinance in fact for that. We have an ordinance that's been in with the county for a couple of years now. Okay, just to keep it from getting too confusing with this Zoom meeting module, let's. Um, you know, if one person could speak at a time, that'd be great. So, Supervisor Williams, did you have a follow-up question? Uh, I don't think I have a follow-up question for the two presenters, but for my colleagues, the question is, um, the spirit of right to farm uh, includes ag exempt, and it looks like we're beginning to erode ag exempt. I want to make sure that's the intention here because it's a very slippery slope. I think there's there's a potential large scale impact for ag. Does Chief Dale have any comment about that? Uh, thank you. Uh, actually, I don't think there's any uh, ag exempt is, is ag exempt, but what we're looking at is fire safety. Life safety of, of the buildings that are being built is all I'm looking at. I mean, uh, the processing system of it, we've got to watch out for that because of the fire dangers and stuff. Uh, they can grow all the, all the ag, you know, I'm not all about the ag growth, but as far as the factory, the F1, I mean, it's just because of the hazards, the hazards that are in it. The drying, the cultivation that takes electricity, usually there's gas involved, there's uh, several things. We're just one so we can go through it and actually inspect these areas to help the county out and to make sure that we got everybody on board on the proper way of doing it so we don't have a mishap. Okay. Is there any further comment from the board? Yes, this is Supervisor Brown. Um, I'd like to ask the question of the two chiefs. Why is Redwood Valley and Hopland and their proposals different than Ukiah Valley? Chief Dale. This is uh, Chief Dale. Each fire district is is uh, different, and 
the codes are even different. We're going by what we feel is needed for my fire district, for our community safety, and for any of the businesses that are around here that they're, they're safe also. So um, what I have in my district may be different from the city. They're a lot bigger, more, com- uh, uh, you know, together. And then Hoppin may have something else in there. Uh, they're in. You're just like, they're, everything's different. I mean, so you have to be flexible on how you try and do your fo- uh, fire codes. Then the next question I have, which is a very important one, because, um, County supervisors have, well, at least for me, late um, yesterday afternoon, early evening, um, when I received some public comment, um, and and then today uh, we received public comment, and a couple of them were from early this morning, um, and they're challenging um, the verbiage and what is being proposed. So I want to ask both of your departments, uh, what process did you go through um, with your constituents? Was it a public hearing in order for all of them to know what was being proposed and able to come speak? Okay. And Chief Dale, uh, yes, we went by the book. We went through, did our proposals, had our uh, town meetings, advertise it like we're supposed to do and then we turn around and after everything went through the process any comments we had we even find find redid it on our own we found some mistakes in it and then we turned it over to you we went by the letter of the law so far okay, okay. and and the no. chief from hopland uh this is ron um just like uh, uh redwood valley district we did the same we had our uh first meeting next meeting second reading and then it went to the board for vote and then it sent it on to you guys so we did our diligence that way as well as uh worked with our um jenny uh, our lawyer to uh make sure we were following the rules okay supervisor brown Thank you. Um, And one of the comments received states that California Fire Code Chapter 9 um, is going to be amended, the the code, and it's going to be requiring fire sprinklers in any of the F occupancy buildings over 2,500 square feet. Um, Were you aware of that? Yes, we are aware of that. Okay, thank you. Okay, any further comment from the board? Chair has check. Mm-hmm. Yes. I had a similar question. In the case of Hopland, it looks like all agricultural production will be classified as F1, essentially requiring fire sprinklers in all uh, buildings and greenhouses and the sort over 1,000 square feet. Do we have any sense of how many um, developments that'll affect? Uh, not- how, how, how common is this? Uh, and what is the financial burden for folks to comply who are in ag? So with ag, there are the, is that mechanisms. The if you could identify yourself when you speak, that'd be great. That would help out. My apologies. This is no Ron problem. with Hopland Fire. So uh, as far as numbers of, of new construction that would be affected and you know cost burdens, um, I can't give you a number on that. Um, there is mechanisms in place for asking for variances throughout the, the fire code to um, take into account uh, what the specific uh, project is, whether it merits um, you know, sprinklers or not, those things are taken into consideration. Okay, I'm gonna go over to County Council. 
Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I didn't want to cut anyone short. I just want the board to be aware uh, that we also have the chief building official, Mike Oliphant, on the line, uh, as well as Deputy County Counsel Matthew Kudowski. Uh One of the questions raised in some of the correspondence was sort of the interaction between the county's ordinance and building code versus the fire district's fire code. Uh, and I didn't know if the board had any questions I wanted to, to direct to either of those. Um, thank you, Mr. Curtis. I, I believe I asked that they be present. Um, and I think it was, um, I know it was in the Farm Bureau um, letter asking um, that this question of whether this would apply or not um, with ag under F-1 and fire sprinklers, et cetera, um, is, you know, would it apply to hay barns as well as, you know, listed as F1? So that is their question. They want to know um, what planning staff and code enforcement thoughts are. Okay, hey, Mr. Oliphant. You're muted. <laughs> no, now you're muted. No, can't hear. Try now. Nope, something with your speaker or microphone. Okay, why don't we go to Matt Kudrowski, Deputy County Counsel. So Deputy County Counsel Matthew Kudrowski, uh, uh, we'll see if Mr. Oliphant can be able, is able to call in. But generally speaking, and after speaking with Mr. Oliphant earlier to, uh, this afternoon just to confirm, uh, once this is adopted, the county will still take in these building permit applications. But when the districts have adopted this fire code on their own, we will generally generally send those uh, applications to those fire districts for their uh, review and approval. And they're the ones who give us the okay or not in terms of if it complies with their fire adopted fire codes. So that would be the process. That's currently how it works with both Hopland and Ukiah Valley and would be doing that in the future with Redwood Valley Calpella as well. All right. Uh, Supervisor Journey. Yeah, Chair Hashak, um, I, I think the question came up about the cost of fire sprinklers and the cost would be different throughout the county depending if someone is in within a water district where there's um, adequate water pressure for the riser that, that's outside the building for the fire sprinkler system. But as an example, I'm aware of a, of a uh, you know, average house in Fort Bragg that's going up and they're paying about $7 a square foot for the fire sprinkler system installed. And that of course is in a, a city with city water and adequate water pressure. So that just gives you a little bit of a um, sense of what the price probably is pretty close to that in throughout Mendocino County. Again, could be more if you were out in the county where you didn't have adequate water pressure and you have to increase the pressure to the building. Okay. Um, <clears throat> if we don't Mr. have any Chair? other comments from the board right now. Uh, Mr. Chair? Yes, yeah, Supervisor McCowan. Thank you. Well, it does appear, or at least uh, I'm not clear are we establishing different standards for F1 occupancy for fire districts than we are for the county? Is it, uh, if that's the case, I think that's a concern. And I am concerned that ag crop production, including storage, would be considered F1 uh, occupancy. And I, I know that uh, there has been fire danger associated with certain uh, cannabis related activities, primarily uh, indoor cultivation, primarily unpermitted indoor cultivation. 
So it's an obvious concern that fire districts want to address. But in doing so, uh, potentially we're also uh, implicating conventional ag and taking the uh, sometimes overly restrictive approach that regulation tends to take towards cannabis and potentially applying that to all production ag. And as cannabis becomes more uh, regulated, more uh, above ground, uh, more standardized, the shift, I think, should go in the direction of harmonizing with existing ag practices rather than extending overly restrictive practices uh, to all ag. So I'm uh, a little concerned. Uh, I don't uh, feel that I have enough information uh, right now. Uh, you know, I think we need further clarity on the uh, potential dual classification of F1 occupancy, as well as the uh, economic impact uh, to this emerging industry that is uh, struggling to uh, come above board. And I think one of the questions posed this morning, are these particularly time sensitive or uh, is it feasible to defer final action on these so that the board can uh, get additional information to more definitively answer some of the questions that have come up? Thank you. Okay, Mr. Oliphant. Okay, members of the board, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, I apologize for that glitch. I'm glad we are connected. Uh, so, first of all, I'd like to say that currently in the 2019 California Fire Code, an F1 occupancy structure does not need fire sprinklers until it exceeds 12,000 square feet. So that's quite a jump if that is gonna be amended down to a thousand square feet. So anyways, I wanted to point that out and that 12,000 square foot F1 fire sprinkler requirement has been in the code for many code cycles now. So uh, I have not seen that amendment proposed through the Building Standards Commission yet, but I will keep my eyes open. So going over to the ag exempt policy, as you may already know, that's designed for the uh, small person, the mom and pop with no employees, the person who's, who's growing agriculture, uh, being uh, hay, flowers, uh, fruits and vegetables, or cannabis. Um, and in the ag exempt policy, that is under the U occupancy, the utility occupancy. The first item listed out of the California Building Code for U occupancy are agricultural buildings. Uh, it jumps into the F1 category when you have employees or if you cannot meet the requirements, the 18 requirements of the ag exempt policy. And, and oftentimes they can't meet those, so they'll go with a regular California building permit, which would put a cannabis facility into the F1 occupancy. Um, as Supervisor Williams stated earlier, uh, it, it possibly could be problematic by putting some of these ag exempt structures into the F1 uh, category because I, I'm not sure how you could do that with something like a hoop house uh, because that could never meet the standards of the uh, wildland urban interface requirements which are now exempt in the ag exempt policy and, and by the way the word exempt in ag exempt policy means it's exempt from the California building code and fire codes the model codes so uh, are there any specific questions that I can help clarify for you? Uh, Chair Hester? Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, could you clarify your support for this? Do you think it should pass today or do you think we should hold off? Uh, 
I, I think you need clarification because I'm reading the amendment to the fire code in section 202 uh, that the Redwood Valley Calpella district, and I, and I have a lot of respect for all of the fire districts. I, we work closely with them. But uh, in their uh, amendment to section 202, they state uh, that they want F1 moderate hazard oxygen seed to conclude all agricultural crop production, including cultivation, drying, processing, and or storage. Um, I'm not going to tell them what to do, but that indicates that that's everything, including hoop houses and drying sheds and, and uh, shipping containers used for storage or uh, uh, such occupancies that cannabis farmers currently use. So uh, that, that's, where, that's where I stand. Thank you. Okay. All right, any further questions from the board? All right, I'm uh, Mr. To... Chair, not a question, but it uh, does seem that, uh, well, I would appreciate it if we could request of our staff, and I know they're overloaded with a million other things we ask of them, but uh, Mr. Oliphant is certainly our subject matter expert. Uh, a brief memo uh, describing some of these potential changes and their impacts uh, might be beneficial to the board. And again, I would ask, is this time sensitive or could it be uh, continued for further information? Okay, I guess for county council, is it time sensitive? Uh Mr. Chair, I don't know that there are any statutory deadlines. Um, I see that uh, Mr. Kodrowski just unmuted, so I didn't know if you had a comment. Um, uh, I believe it's just a, a question of when it gets implemented. Deputy County Council Matthew Kodrowski, I think that's accurate, and I would probably defer to council or the district representatives for any thoughts on their timing issues. Okay. Any of the chiefs? Chief Dale? Yeah. Yeah, whatever the, uh, the board would like, that'd be fine with us. I just want to restate something that on the F1, it doesn't go into effect until it hits 2,500 square feet or larger. So we're, we're looking forward to the mom and pops and everything else. We're not trying to hurt them at all. It's just a safety item that we're looking at. We looked at that square footage and anything above that, we thought we should be sprinkled. So. Okay. And Chief Ron? Uh, no, I want the board to be uh, you know, fully aware of, of everything before they make their decision. I uh, just want to throw in that you know, in February, we did send a draft to the board for review as well. It's, there has been some time for this to be reviewed. Okay, thank you. Um, if we could go to public comment now, See, we have Hannah Nelson on the line. Okay, Ms. Nelson. Hi, this is Hannah Nelson. Thank you very much for taking the time to learn more about these issues. MCA submitted public comment, and I think that we can get into more of the particulars um, at a time that additional information comes back. In short, we are wondering if there's a way to refine the proposed ordinances of the districts to ensure that we don't have unintended consequences and that we maintain a safe community and environment. We certainly have tremendous respect for the work that the fire districts do and we want to continue to support those efforts. With that said, uh, there may be some refinement that can support the safety of all community members without having the unintended consequences that may result if the ordinance is passed as is. Thank you. Okay, very good. Um, so is it possible to do some kind of memo laying out the differences and, and what we're looking at, Mr. Oliphant? Yes, I, I would be more than happy to do that. 
and I'll direct it to the board. Okay. And so with that, we can, um, we can put off making a decision on this until we get more information. Is that acceptable to everyone? This is Ginny Chandler for the districts. I would just ask that we not put this off for six months. It's already been in the county's hands since February. It really seems as though we ought to be able to get this resolved in a month or so. Okay, we would um, we'll probably best we can. Okay, any further comments on that? Okay, and so we have a the path forward, we will table those and bring them back in the near future. Okay, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Chiefs, for your time today, and thank you for your involvement. Okay. Good day. Good day. Okay. So we're going to take a break now for 15 minutes till 346. Okay, so we'll be back. We're recessed until 346.
work to do ahead of us. So let's get to it. Um, we're going to continue um, 5E later on if we can get to it. So we're going to put that off. We're going to go straight to 5J. Okay. And 5J is discussion and possible action, including approval to allocate three million seven hundred thousand dollars in measure b facility funds toward the construction of a crisis residential treatment facility on orchard avenue in ukiah as recommended by the mental health citizens oversight committee which includes contracting with aecom to provide construction management services from the pre-construction phase through completion and the sponsor is health and human services agency um, so is that Janine Miller or Allison Bailey? Are you going? Okay. Dr. Good Miller? Afternoon. Good afternoon, Chair Hashtag. We are going to ask um, Auditor uh, Weir, Lloyd Weir to start with our presentation. We were asked, as you know, to bring a fiscal analysis on whether we could afford these facilities. And part of that analysis is having uh, Mr. Weir do a proceeds um, look for the next uh, 10 years on what we can and can't afford based on current conditions and future conditions. Okay, thank you. Mr. Weir. Yeah, hi, this is Lloyd Weir, uh, Chair Hasjack, board members, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Um, but yes, uh, my role in this uh, plan that we put together for you um, was to uh, take a look at the um, current sales tax proceeds that are coming through on Measure B. Um, as you know, uh, due to COVID, we are seeing a reduction in the amount of proceeds um, after enjoying basically a year and three quarters of growth uh, due to the good economy. Um, so basically for 1819 and 1920, our sales tax proceeds pretty much uh, mirrored the uh, budget because of the gross, the growth in 1920 offset the reduction that the COVID uh, uh, did for the economy. So for the first two years so far of a five year, uh, you know, a half cent sales tax, uh, we're pretty much right on what we estimated for um, revenues. Um, then um, I'm using our sales tax consultant, HDL, uh, recommended uh, reduction percentage for the County of Mendocino at approximately 15% during 2020-21 and another 15% during 2021-22. Uh, and then on the fifth year, uh, we're gonna start to see a recovery according to HDL and only about uh, a 5% reduction in 22-23. So we're going to um, um, end up with about a total of A total of about 29, 29 million, a little over 29 million for um, facilities, which is the 75% um, amount of the total towards uh, facilities, and another another $9,000 for operations. You mean so 9 million? The total, the total um, projection is it was originally after the measure B was on the ballot estimated to be about 40 million. I'm now showing it down at 38 seven. So um, this is the amount of money that was given to Allison and Janine to go ahead and, and budget a five-year plan and construction and operations. And that's my, uh, that's my presentation on the revenues for this for this project, these projects. Okay, thank you. Right. So uh, Dr. Janine Miller and I'm gonna, uh, the part of the report that I really focused on was our operational cost. And so I'm going to go through that a little bit with you guys. So as you know, um, county's uh, mental health system really works with the severe 
Uh, so those individuals that have the most persist, severe and persistent mental illness and those that are mild to moderate are served through our Beacon um, Partnership Health Plan providers and then our private insurance. But when it comes to crisis, the county serves every individual regardless of insurance type. So crisis walks in, we serve them through the special mental health um, services, and then we look at what level of placement they have. In the proposed uh, analysis that we did, because we don't have readily access to all the private insurance or the Medicare cost or the veteran insurance's cost that they pay out, we could only look at the Medi-Cal system of care and our indigent system of care. And so when we put together the proposal for a crisis residential treatment facility, we looked at what our current figures are, what number of people that were hospitalizing both in fiscal year 1920 and um, 1819. Um, and then we also did a lot of research in calling other facilities, both county run and non-county run facilities to see what their overall annual operating costs are. We then looked into what Medi-Cal will pay. So Medi-Cal will pay a percentage of the rate. Uh, so I just want to remind everyone with Medi-Cal, we always have to have realignment dollars. So um, you can't avoid um, uh, putting realignment dollars to any of the Medi-Cal facilities that we send individuals to because it's a requirement for us to bill Medi-Cal. You have to match whatever Medi-Cal doesn't pay. The federal financial participation doesn't pay is a requirement that you match with county realignment dollars so we're or some other non-federal dollars. So we're always going to have that piece where we have to come up with a per, uh, percentage of the cost, depending on what percentage this, the federal government is paying at the time. We usually estimate that it's a 61%. So your federal financial participation is going to cover about 61% of the cost and your county realignment will cover the other percentage of the cost. Currently, the, uh, that percentage is a little higher due to COVID, but we know that could go down at any time. When you look at board and care cost or you look at placement cost, um, that's sort of a negotiated rate with the state and you can negotiate that rate and that can be determined on the, your cost, the facilities cost, what's going on in the state averages. So psychiatric health facilities um, can have a different rate and bill Medi-Cal at a different rate depending on the facility and that can be a, nego that can be a little bit negotiated with a cap that, that, that's out there. So when we looked at the crisis residential treatment, we projected based on our conversations with multiple entities that, that the operating cost for our eight bed facility would run about $1.1 million. We looked at how much met, if we looked at ratio to number of beds, occupancy across different uh, number of days throughout the year, what our reimbursement through Medi-Cal could be, and then what it would cost measure B. We really approach this with that. We really hope that the majority of the costs for these facilities will be billed to Medi-Cal, Medicare, private insurance, um, or indigent means it comes out of county realignment so that this facility is really operating with minimal to no dollars out of, out of measure B. But we do know that we want to go in with a projection. So we started that projection at about, if we projected it would be about $500,000 a year out of measure B's um, service funds. Could we operate this facility and provide some additional services? And we were able to say, yes, we can. We do believe we can operate this facility. We do believe if we get a good operator in and they are billing Medi-Cal and the other insurances at the max that they can bill them, it will be a limited amount of Measure B dollars that will go into that. But we really wanted to approach this saying, at most, we think it'll be $500,000 a year out of Measure B's what Lloyd projects is about $2 million a year that will get in proceeds on the service and treatment side of the proceeds. So that would still leave us about 1.5 million a year um, to provide either for another treatment facility or to provide other services within our county. So I'm gonna hand this over to Allison, who's going to talk about what we looked at for uh, facility uh, building costs and construction. Hello, Chair Hashtag, and thank you very much for hearing me today. This is uh, Allison Bailey, a project manager for Measure B. And would you like me to go over the numbers for all the facilities, or are we just concentrating on the CRT today? Well, let's just do the CRT right now. Okay. All right. So um, the CRT has a, a potential. Uh, uh, funding source through CHAFA, 
which is a, um, a, a grant that uh, expires on uh, the 21st, uh, or no, pardon me, uh, November 2021. Um, and I believe that's uh, November 30th. And so that is um, a half a million dollars that will go to specifically building the um, this this particular uh, facility on this specific site. So, uh, so we do have that. Um, otherwise, let's see. For Nocton Lewis, who uh, is here today as well, who did the design and um, engineer engineering for the site as well as the building, uh, has charged let's see about seven hundred or yeah seven hundred forty nine thousand three hundred thirty three dollars for uh, this facility. Uh, they are under contract for uh, 3.3 million, and this so this is that that um, 749 is is the uh, is, is the charge for for this uh, the CRT. The estimated cost for completing the rest of of this, this project uh, from construction management through construction site work, um, all of the different what are called soft costs is estimated at about uh, 3.7 million. Uh, construction itself, and including the county's uh, construction contingency, is uh, about 3.3 million. It's uh, 3,254,196. So that's our, our capital costs. And then soft costs, so the construction manager, uh, the building commissioning, materials testing, um, you know, plan check, permit inspection fees, utility connections, because of it, there were no utility connections on that uh, on that land. Uh, just advertising, printing and mailing to make sure that uh, local residents know um, that, uh, that the, the place is arriving and also to uh, let the county know that it is open for business. And uh, contingency costs, that comes to another uh, Five hundred five thousand one hundred eighty-two. So that is the overall estimate for this uh, facility from uh, where we are, uh, you know, just a, a plot of land to actually being turnkey and becoming a, a business and, and home for uh, people when they need to use the CRT. Um, uh, let's see. This was put together. Uh, actually by a couple of different people, um, partly uh, myself, but I consulted with Nocton Lewis and also um, Doug Anderson and facilities and uh, over uh, careful uh, revisions, we have, uh, this is this is the, um, the estimated budget we've come up with. Yeah, Supervisor Jerdy. Uh, this, this might be a question for Nocton Lewis. Um, for a building of this type and of this size, what would be the um, amount of money that a um, prudent landlord, um, if it was the county, would be setting aside each year for things like painting walls, uh, repairing walls, uh, repairing roofs, that sort of thing. Ma routine maintenance uh, that would be expected as the building is used throughout the years um, so that uh, you don't have a $8 million capital improvement project five years later. Uh, yeah, uh, this is Eric Fadness uh, with Nocton Lewis. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, you know, I think that might be better answered by your, uh, uh, your, your folks with facilities, but, um, you know, an ongoing maintenance budget, uh, you know, you might be looking at uh, setting aside, um, you know, in the neighborhood of, of 100000 per, uh, you know, per, per year, uh, for just ongoing maintenance, um, you know, repairs and so forth, uh, may increase that, uh, to some extent, but, uh, but that might be better answered by your facilities folks. Uh, Doug, so, are you here? Uh, yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, Thanks to the chair. And uh, this is Doug Anderson, with assistant facilities manager. Um, uh, we don't have a lot of experience with brand new buildings in terms of having uh, a, a regular 
maintenance cost uh, adjustment for this. I don't, um, um, I don't know that we can uh, answer that question here today, but um, I believe, um, you know, after the first few years, we would need to be um, setting aside something on the order of what um, uh, Mr. Fadness had indicated. Okay. It, yeah. So, it, go ahead, so, so I, I appreciate the answer. Um, I would like a refined answer, uh, not today, but in, you know, in the future, because it seems like there's one of two ways we could do this. We could either budget, budget money, money in our operational, operational expenses, expenses to set the money aside, aside, or we would have uh, some of the capital money set aside into a trust fund to maintain these buildings um, by using it sort of as an endowment. So it seems like we have sort of two choices. And at some point we need to make which, you know, make a choice there. Okay, Supervisor Williams. Is there um, a line item breakdown of the 1.1 million for the eight bed CRT facility? When you say uh, line item breakdown, are you, what are you asking? Well, what, what, how did we, um, what did we use to derive 1.1 million as the total? So that, so that is based on the average cost for um, having, um, uh, that was actually based on having a 13, uh, a 16 bed facility was about 1.1 to 1.3. And it's based on the average operating cost for having clients, feeding them electricity. It was their total operating budget when they include everything at cost to house, provide this support of services for um, a facility of up to 16 individuals. We went with the higher of 1.1 based on the fact that we were an eight bed facility. Um, and that does include, it does include staffing cost also. Can we see that breakdown of what's included in the 1.1? I could, I don't have it with me today. Okay. Um, but and, then, and then the next question, um, you know, I think we're, the chair said, let's look at the CRT because that's what's before us today. But I think the public expects um, a CR, at least one CRT and a puff. And it's not clear to me that we that we have a, a financial plan that includes at least those two types of services. And the assumption that we can build the puff and then lease it for one dollar to a provider, do we need to put out an RFP or how do we get some assurance that a provider will operate a puff if we construct the building and lease it uh, essentially for free? It seems like an awfully large assumption. And so my worry is we. We spend the money on the CRT, we move on to the PUF and we find nobody wants to lease it. We have to operate it. We need funds to operate it. And if we get to that stage and say, well, we already spent it on the CRT, we should have scaled that back. We're, we're in a really bad place. How, any thoughts on that overall? That, it was eight months ago we talked about a business plan. And I feel like this, these documents are a really good starting point and it's giving us more information than we've ever had. But I, I think it's still critical that we get a business plan. Do we need to um, contract for that? Get a consulting CFO to help put it together? I understand we may not have the resources in-house, but before we begin spending millions of dollars, I think we need to have a financial plan that is holistic and looks at the construction and operating costs and maintenance and everything that's involved in the, t the total structures we plan to build and operate. So I will try to respond to all of your questions. If I missed it, if I miss any, please let, let uh, re-ask me those. So one, um, when we looked at the CRT, we also included the PUF. So Allison's numbers did include building a um, psychiatric health facility or acute psychiatric hospital, because there's three types of facilities when you look at psychiatric hospitalization. So her numbers did take into what would be the cost to build those facilities. My numbers also took into what would it be to uh, operate a psychiatric health facility. But we're also putting in that that really, if the county does it right and works with a private entity, it should not cost us a dime to run that facility. It would cost us the maintenance of upkeep of that uh, building. And the point of that, when you look at both the CRT and the PUP, what you have to realize is when we're putting in $1 to lease it, that is part of the revenue they're gaining because they're not putting out money for rent, lease, or a mortgage. So that goes towards their operating 
um, revenue in because they're not paying to uh, maintain that building. They're not paying to rent, lease, or put pay a mortgage on that building. So that also goes into their operating cost, but it's in a positive because they're actually not paying for those things out. So you have to make sure that's included in their financial analysis. When we have released a CRT, um, RFP, that has gone out. It is currently posted on our website looking for an operator for a crisis residential treatment facility. We have written a um, RFQ, request for qualifications for a psychiatric uh, hospital or, or PUP, um, and that should be released, I'm hearing, in the next week or two. So we have those pieces um, already going forward. We are moving forward with that, um, and I'm hopefully the hospitalization part will be um, posted within the next week or two so we can see if we have a vendor that's willing to work with us before we go forward with building that facility. But in regards to doing the analysis on what we project it will cost, Allison has done that based on her outreach to other counties, like Sonoma County is in that process, talking with the state, working with other experts on getting that analysis of what we think it would cost to build versus renovate a facility. And then we've done it from the behavioral health side of just talking, what are the operational costs? We know there are private, a lot of private entities we spoke with who don't need to depend on the county to make them whole because they're a private entity and they operate based on billing for insurance, both Medi-Cal, Medicare, veterans and private insurance and are able to make that up in their operating costs. We add the benefit of the $1 rent means that they actually have to bring in less revenue because they're actually getting the benefit of not paying that additional uh, cost of uh, renting a facility. So we're actually doing something that will actually benefit them overall in both of those facilities. So um, I understand the vision. It's, it sounds like a good concept. What I'm missing is are any specific providers interested in this $1 lease? My fear is that we construct it, we assume somebody will use it because we're offsetting their capital expenses and we find actually we have to, we still have to subsidize it. Do we have enough to subsidize it? How, how do we get that included in the financial plan? Not just a, a hope, not a, um, if we build it, they will come, but a little bit more concrete. We have some potential providers and they've shown interest and they're willing to operate on this $1 lease without subsidy. So we will get that through the RFQ. So that is why we're releasing the RFQ for the psychiatric health facility, psychiatric hospital. Um, that will be what the RFQ focuses on is do we have some providers out there that are willing to work with us and uh, what would they be asking? Could they operate on their own? Are they going to ask for some type of match from the county? That's what this RFQ will focus on uh, for the psychiatric health facility. But the item before us today is to spend 3.7 million, not knowing the answers to those other questions, which are critical. If we look at this as a as one whole integrated project, we need to know that all of the elements are financially sustainable. If one isn't and we have to subsidize it, that may shift another. For example, if we have to subsidize the PUF and the PUF is the most critical service we plan to provide, we may have to scale back on the CRT. It's really hard for me to look at the CRT today and know if it's a good idea without seeing the rest of the financial picture. Um, but that's more of a, I guess, more of a comment than a, than a question. Thanks. Okay. I have a question about the CRT is that with the 1.1 million to run it, that how much like these people who would be clients there, we're, they're going out of county right now because we don't have the facility, correct? Correct, so what's happening currently is because we don't have a facility, the individuals are not able, so there's, there's two things that happens. One is that the individual either is not offered this level of care and goes back home with just some uh, basic wraparound, which isn't always meeting what they need, right? The other is the majority, I would say the majority end up on a 5150 hold and end up out of county because there's no alternative. So you have to err on the side of caution and give them that higher level of care because you don't have an alternative placement within your county. So probably 95% of those individuals that could go into your CRT are hospitalized because we lack that alternative care. When you look at statistics, what you hear throughout counties and statistics is they say adding these alternative care 
options like a CRT can cut your hospitalizations at least by 33%. Now, some other some statistics are as high as 50%. But if we're looking at the average, I'm hearing that it cuts your number of hospitalizations by 33%. So so we're spending a lot of money outside of the county. Do we know how much that we could possibly recoup out of that 1.1 million? So I would, um, I'd, I'd have to run the numbers. I didn't run them right for this meeting, but what I can tell you is that in, um, we hospitalized over 600 people in 1819. We hospitalized, I think around 597 or 579. I'd have to pull up the number for 1920. When I look at the numbers for 1819, we spent about $3.1 million in out of county hospitalizations. So if you figure 33% of that $3.1 million would divert to your CRT, and that's only in Medi-Cal dollars. So, you know, what you have to remember is that that can only give you the Medi-Cal dollars. So we spent 3.1 in Medi-Cal dollars. That does not include the number of people that were hospitalized by private insurance, Medicare paid for, the Veterans Affair paid for. Um, all of that is additional dollars on top of that 3.1 million that was paid uh, by Medi-Cal in the county. Okay, Supervisor Dirty. Yeah, thank you. So on the report, um, I'm on, I guess on page four of, um, let's turn to see which report it is, the Mendocino County Behavioral Health Recovery Services Operational Costs Proposed Crisis Residential Budget. Um, and you, you give the different scenarios of the six of the eight beds occupied 256 days out of the year, it would need a subsidy of the 569, which is sort of the prudent budget you put out with um, eight out of eight beds occupied 256 days of the year, operational subsidy just under 400,000. Um, how, what would the strategy be? And maybe we don't make it now, adopt it now, but um, what would the strategy be? Would the strategy be to try to fill the spaces? And therefore, does that mean sometimes we're actually accepting a patient from out of county in order to keep those, those uh, beds filled or if we're only reserving it for in-county residents, could you have? Could we have a scenario where, you know, we we have fewer beds occupied um, throughout the year because we're always reserving two or three beds at a time, just for well, all all beds that are empty, we're reserving just for Mendocino County residents. So I guess, I guess that's kind of the question is um, I, maybe we can't answer that until we um, build it. But I'm just, it seems like it's going to be a question that will have to be addressed at some point. Is are the room are the beds ex exclusively for Mendocino County residents, even if that means leaving beds empty night after night? But maybe again, maybe we only address that once it's built and operating. So I would, uh, what I would say is, in the RFP that's released, um, it is a recommendation that the um, potential contractor look at doing some regional outreach to fill those beds. I would like to see the beds eight of eight beds um, occupied 365 days. I know that Lake County does not have a CRT, a CSU, or, or a PUP, and that they are interested to work with us if we have these facilities closer to home. And the fact that not having a CRT, um, they don't have any alternative resources just like we don't. So all their clients are having to go to that high level, higher level care. In conversations with their uh, behavioral health director, he is interested in any facilities that we build here in Mendocino County and would be interested in having a partnership and using these local facilities as they would be closer and provide a closer resource for family members of Lake County and clients from Lake County. So I would hope that we would ask in all of our facilities that we're looking at more of a regional approach and seeing how Lake County would also be interested in all of our facilities. And based on my conversations, Lake County is interested in a CRT and interested in any psychiatric hospitalization we have in Mendocino County that could benefit them. Okay, any further questions? All right, hearing none, are there public comments? Let's see, Jan uh, McGordy. Chair Hashtag? Yes. Uh, we do have Knox and Lewis um, here to uh, share a, a quick walkthrough with you. It'll be about three minutes just so that you can get an idea of what the building will look like if uh, you're willing. Okay, if we have a three-minute walkthrough, mm -hmm. that sounds great. 
We'll make this as quick as, as possible here. I'll share my screen. I did the walkthrough with um, the Measure B committee, and it was great. Oh, wonderful. Good. Well, um, you know, I, I, I believe you also had the site plan and the building floor plan uh, in your um, board agenda packet. Um, but this is, uh, this obviously, you had, you had an image of the, the front of the building, which you're looking at now. Um, and um, this is a live model, so we can walk through the building, we can walk around it, so you get a sense of um, how it looks, how it feels. Um, one of the important aspects of this facility is that it looks, uh, looks like a residence, like a home, and that it feels like home uh, for the residents that live there. Um, that was one of the key things that um, the, uh, uh, the stakeholder group um, had said, you know, when we started the process of programming and designing this, um, you know, that was one of the key elements, the, the, the look and feel of home. So um, let's, uh, let's move forward here and we'll walk into the building. And, you know, just bear with me if it's a little, a little uh, uh, jerky on the motions. Um, it's my, my problem here trying to navigate a straight path. So we've just walked into the, uh, the front entrance of the building. Um, the, uh, the initial uh, views of somebody entering the building, uh, you know, it, it looks exactly like this. You, to the right, you would have your intake office. This would be, you know, there's lots of glass, lots of transparency um, so that the staff and the residents um, there, there's always views to to uh, to the for the staff to see the residents, and um, you know so that there is there is some oversight. Um, we also have laundry facilities. Just going briefly here, um, they're direct entry from the outside, so that if you have residents coming to this facility that. Um, you know, bringing clothing, maybe they're homeless, um, coming off of the streets, uh, maybe their belongings need to be decontaminated. This would be the entrance. Uh, that way you don't bring contaminated um, clothing or bedding into the facility. And so we'll go into the main living area. I think one of the, the real uh, important features to note here is the openness and um, the flow of the space, uh, but also the natural light. So a lot of attention was given to uh, daylighting, uh, to have large openings that would allow views, uh, views to the exterior, that connectedness with the outside. Um, the landscaping has been designed in such a way that it will allow for um, those those nice views. Uh, there's an orchard space, orchard trees. We're calling it an orchard, but you know there are a few uh, trees that will produce fruit um, throughout the year. And um, you know residents, you know as soon as those those trees are are mature enough uh, to produce fruit, residents can harvest the the fruit. Uh, but you'd also have views of those gardens um, from the inside. Okay, Eric, we're at three minutes, so could you? Okay, get it? That, I think get you've seen the, the majority of it. This is really, I think, just to give you the look and feel. So, um, if you can we go can, to the bedrooms and show us those, you know, sure, them at least. Yep, that would be good. Okay. So this is a typical bedroom, and you know, double occupancy, basically. Um, you know, using finishes that are, are durable and cleanable um, and fixtures such as these light fixtures that are anti-ligature, you know, to be conscientious and aware of su suicide prevention. Um, so uh, this is generally the look and feel, the color um, uh, of, the, uh, of the bedrooms. Okay. Okay. I can Very good. Thank stop you. sharing. Okay. And people can go see it. It's an attachment to our our agenda. Okay. Um, let's see. Public comment. Mr. Chair. Oh, yes, Supervisor Brown. 
Thank you, sir. And I also um, listened in to the Measure B um, committee discussion and um, the recommendation that has come forward. And I just thought I should disclose that. And after public comment, if I don't hear um, anything that I think I need to question, I'm ready to make the motion. Okay. Is there, are we ready to go to public comment? Okay. Um, we have two people signed up for public comment. Deputy Clerk, are, is Jan McGordy on the line? Uh, yes, she is. Okay. Ms. McGordy? Welcome. Ms. McGordy. Hello. Yes. 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 Okay. Um, Go ahead. Good afternoon. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, supervisor, staff. Um, Architects, thank you so much for coming. I'm sorry that there wasn't time for the board to see your wonderful presentation. Um, I think it would have been much more pleasant than the PG&E presentation. However, <laughs> um, not having some kind of mental health facility in our county impacts our emergency rooms and law enforcement and costs a lot of money, as you know. A crisis residential treatment center or CRT is the most efficient and economical facility for de-escalation of individuals experiencing a mental health crisis. It's a method of preventative care that helps avoid those costly inpatient care, such as a psychiatric health facility, which is we know is a puff. Measure B called for one or more kinds of psychiatric facilities, not necessarily a puff. A CRT is the best place to start, and we've discussed this before. In the report written by Lee Kemper two years ago, his first recommendation for use of Measure B funds was to create a CRT. Years before that, the state government had granted our county a half a million dollars to build a CRT, which we came very close to losing. We're in danger of losing that money again if your board today doesn't take action at this time to create a CRT. So now is the time for the Board of Supervisors to continue down this path of looking after our mentally ill individual citizens and bring the vision and hope for a crisis residential treatment center into being by approving the building of the CRT. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. McGordy. Is um, Mika Ferretta on the line? Ms. Ferretta? You're muted. Ms. Ferretta? Hello? Ms. Ferretta. Okay. Is Ms. Ferretta, can you hear us? All right. So we're going to, let's see. Deputy Clerk. Could you call her, if possible, on another line and see see if we can get a hold of her? Um, yes, this is Deputy Clerk Lindsay Dunn. I might be willing to do that. Um, just give me maybe 60 seconds to do that. Okay, great. Are there any more questions from the board before we take a motion and hopefully hear the public comment? Well, I would just like to say I did take the tour with the Measure B committee virtually, and it was a very impressive tour. You know, certainly when I think of a building like that, and I think $3.7 million, it's, um, it is kind of shocking. You know, there's a sticker shock for this kind of work. And um, it is, I mean, it seems very expensive to me. At the same time, I hope it's, um, 
I hope we're doing the best we can with the dollars that we've been given. And, and, and that it fits into the big picture that we're talking about. So, so I, I share Supervisor Williams' concerns about how is it going to fit in overall and what's the, what's the big picture of how we're going to operate all these and build them. And, uh, but at the same time, if this is the best we can do with this CRT, I think that it's a, it's a necessary step forward in the Measure B process. So, um, if, Supervisor Jerdy. Yeah, if we're waiting for the caller to connect, uh, maybe we could just ask um, the architect to, to just explain maybe a couple examples of how this commercial building will be built to a higher standard than a residential building and be more durable. Um, I'm assuming those, those are all driving the costs. Certainly. Well, you have to keep in mind that this is a behavioral health facility and so they're with that, um, there are risks, liabilities potentially with um, the residents that will live there. So, um, you know, the type, the type of hardware, it's not standard residential hardware. Uh, plumbing fixtures are not your typical plumbing fixtures. They're, they're designed for, um, you know, ligature resistance. Um, you know, you have higher standards for uh, glazing in the facility or glass windows. We, we have a lot of, um, uh, you know, we want to have natural light, so larger openings with glass. So um, there's window film um, on insulated glass, tempered glass. Uh, so there is a lot of expense in that as well. Um, you know, it is designed to be durable. There's nothing extravagant about the design. Um, you know, it's designed to be durable and maintainable. So um, you know, what you what you have with the exterior is um, durable finishes such as stucco. Um, stucco that performs at a higher level than, say, uh, wood or masonite siding. So uh, requires less maintenance over time. Um, you know, painting and so forth would be required at times. Um, you know, and as well, this is a, a brand new uh, building on a, on a new undeveloped site. So there's a lot of um, cost that's, that's going into the development of that site to make it accessible. Um, you know, accessible for um, uh, for everyone, and, and including for the uh, the the, uh, the local fire authority that needs access to you know fight fires. So, um, and, and then as well to bring the utilities into the, the facility. So, uh, so you know that's really where where your costs are going. And um, so I think, it, but I think most importantly, it's you have to remember that this is. Uh, built to a standard for behavioral health, not not what you would see in your typical residence. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see, we have Mika Ferretta on the line. Ms. Ferretta, are you there now? Okay, I think I have a handle on it. Okay. Does that work? Yep. Hey, thank you. Sorry, I was on the other side of the continent of technology. Today that I want to encourage the board to vote yes on the recommended action to approve the allocation of the three funds to build another proposed CRT. I was first introduced to the need the need for the CRT during some of my first behavioral health advisory board meetings a few years ago by RMQ's RQMC. This current project is a result of years of ownership issues and provider responsibilities. This project could have been built a year ago, but is brought under the umbrella of the Measure B. A CRT is just the start of the facilities that Mendocino County needs. I was recently introduced to a financial fallacy that goes something like this. Don't use one dollar to chase one cent. This may be a reasonable idea within a certain context. However, mental health services and facilities should be the exception. 
Instead, we should look at the savings in the context of the cost of human suffering and the financial savings when deciding on how to support one of our most vulnerable populations. I take my responsibility as an advocate for mental health services very seriously as well as personally, and this project fits the needs and scope of Measure B funds. It is time for us to move forward with this project that we have been ping-ponging back and forth even before we had the Measure B funds. And I just wanted to thank you guys for considering this project. Okay, thank you. All right, are there any further questions from the board? Okay, hearing none, we'll go to Supervisor Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I won't read it aloud, um, but I do move the recommended action. All right, is there a second? I'll second the motion. Okay, so it's been moved and seconded. Are there any further comments? Okay, so Deputy Clerk of the Board, could you conduct the roll call vote? Absolutely. Supervisor Williams? Supervisor Williams? Yes. Supervisor Jurdy? Yes. Chair Haschak? Yes. Supervisor McCowan? Supervisor McCowan? He may need to hit star six. Yes. Thank you. And, and Supervisor Brown? Yes. Great. The motion carries unanimously. All right. Very good. Um, Chair Haschak? Thank you. Yes. Yeah, Chair. I did have a comment, but I wanted to vote first. I think we do have a problem that this county, our county, doesn't have anybody on staff who can put a business plan together. And this is not a criticism of anybody involved here. We have people who are really good at mental health and other domains. We don't have a CFO in this county and I think it's biting us. And I wanna see the CRT go forward. I don't think we have a solid plan right now. We need to do it because we, we can't lose more time. Our money will inflate away. There's so many reasons it needs to happen. But I think we don't wanna lose track of an underlying problem that process wise, we're a bit of a disaster. Okay, well taken. Thank you everyone with the working on this project of the CRT and thank you Measure B committee for bringing it forward. Okay, so. Um, all right, so moving on, we're going to go back to item 4I, which is the approval of amendment to PA agreement 20-81 with Leeward Cassidy Whitmore, the effective August 18th, 2020, increasing the total compensation by $150,000 from $50,000 for a new agreement total of $200,000 for litigation services for Gruwal versus the County of Mendocino. So Supervisor McCowan, you have pulled that from the consent calendar. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, my concern is the additional 150,000 without having uh, the board have the opportunity to review in closed session where we are with that litigation. I did read the information that was sent out uh, regarding uh, the status of that case. It has not uh, changed my opinion. Uh, so therefore my question would be, uh, is there a need to approve uh, some funding on an interim basis until we can consider this in closed session, uh, possibly September 1st and uh, approve that interim amount if necessary Otherwise, just continue the entire matter to September 1st would be my recommendation. Thank you. County Council, do you have an opinion on that? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I think I'd actually defer to risk on, on this one. My understanding is that there's about $6,000 left on the contract, but risk would be able to speak to that with more precision. Okay. Hi, this is uh, Heather Carell Rose. Um, senior risk analyst with your executive office. Um, 
for outstanding billing, we would probably need to set aside just to be on the safe side about $25,000 um, just to cover any future bills that might have been incurred already that we have not yet received. Um, that would be a safe amount. Um, and then, but one of the issues though is that if we don't have ongoing funding, you know, the case does kind of stall out. So that is a concern is that our attorneys will no longer be working on the case while they're waiting for their contract to be finished. So. Okay, so with that information, does anyone want to? I have a question, Mr. Chair. Yes, go ahead. Uh, it sounds as if we have just been told that there are outstanding bills uh, that exceed the approved amount for this contract. And risk management, Heather. Uh, I, I don't. I don't have those bills yet. Um, I would have to. I can reach out to LCW, and and see if they've incurred any additional funding. But they don't usually stop midway um, in the when we're uh, preparing the contracts. So litigation kind of doesn't work that way in terms of they usually just keep going with the litigation and do the billing kind of as is. It's kind of catching up with itself. Maybe that's how it's done in government, but uh, perhaps county council has an answer for, uh, is it within the ethical duties of an attorney to inform their client prior to exceeding the authorized threshold for a contract for service, rather than to just uh, continue working past the contract amount? If I may, Mr. Chair, um, yeah. I, I don't believe that there's a, an ethical duty, or at least I'm not immediately thinking of an ethical duty that's specific to contracting. There is, however, an ethical duty to not stop working merely because one has exceeded um, the value of the contract or has exceeded amount that they're, they're going to get paid. Um, there are certain steps that an attorney representing a client in a case has to do uh, before they can withdraw or otherwise take steps to stop representing the client. Um, so uh, there, there's um, there, there are certain requirements that even when the attorney knows they might not get paid, they may still have to do the work and then uh, negotiate with the client. I'll uh, try a motion if it uh, fits with what we've heard from Risk and County Council. Uh, Risk, would twenty five thousand dollars on an interim basis, uh, do you believe, be sufficient to? Uh, keep the process moving. Yes, sir. Uh, then if this sounds right uh, for a motion, I would approve the item subject to revising the additional payment amount to $25,000 pending further review by the board. Second the motion. Okay, any further discussion? If, if I might, Mr. Chair, this is Janelle Rao, Deputy CEO. I do want to confirm and clarify that in order to continue representation, and, and yes, the $25,000 will, will get us through, but on the first, which is our next board meeting, we will need an additional contract presented as well. So we will have a closed session update as, as requested, but we will need to have an additional contract presented because we cannot risk um, the we can't risk not having coverage. So I just wanted to make sure that that was clear. Okay. Mr. And Chair? Yes. Uh, I, I just want to comment. I'm not going to support the motion. I think we need to support the contract. Okay. And um, any further comment? Okay. There is um, no public comment on this. So, Deputy Clerk of the Board, and it seems to, just before we go to the vote, it seems to me that um, we are, it would be good to have some information about the specifics of this, this action and in closed session, but it certainly looks like we need to go forward with it eventually, like on the first. So, Deputy Clerk, could you um, conduct a roll call vote? So, Chair Hascheck? Yes. Is there any possibility you'd want to table this, waiting for that more information? Well, I don't think that's a possibility. I, 
I heard that we needed to move forward with at least the 25,000. What, what do you think about um, Supervisor Brown's concern? Well, I think that what I've heard is that um, it's, it's certainly a concern, it's a valid concern, and it's going to come back on the first, and we'll probably have to deal with the rest of that contract at that time. At least we'll have some more information. So, so I appreciate that Supervisor Brown brought that up. Okay, so we do have a motion, we have a second. Could you conduct a roll call vote, please? Yes. Supervisor Jody? Yes. Supervisor McCowan? Yes. Supervisor Brown? No. Supervisor Williams? Yes. And Supervisor Haschak? Yes. Okay. So the motion carries with Supervisor Brown dissenting. Okay. Thank you. And that will come back on the first. Okay. Item 5E, we're going to put that off until later today if we, if we can get to it at all. Okay. Item 5F, which is notice public hearing, discussion and possible action, including approval of resolution authorizing Mendocino County to submit an application to utilize community development block grant, CDBG, CARES Act funds to provide micro enterprise financial assistance and small grants to benefit low and moderate income households and provide assistance to mitigate the impact of COVID-19 pandemic. Sponsor is planning and building services. Okay, is Director Schultz on the line? Hashtag, this is Brent Schultz. We did receive notice from HCD that this funding for the county is available, $293,812. We believe there's a need to provide the, these flexible financing and technical assistance for our businesses in this uh, time of COVID. We would like the board to adopt this resolution so that we can submit an application as soon as possible to HCD to uh, for this program to be accepted by them. It, it, it would We believe we could help approximately to the tune of 20 to 30 grants to small businesses in our county. Uh, so th that would be for five or less employees to qualify. You'd have to have 51% of your employees below 80% of uh, area median income. That's a HUD requirement at the Fed level. It could provide for working capital, uh, computers, training, uh, technical okay. assistance. Director Schultz, could I yes. interrupt you for a sec? Okay, yes. I need to go back to our, our process. So I need to establish proper notice. Clerk, has uh, has proper notice been established? Yes, proper notice has been established. Okay, I'm going to open the public hearing and announce the hearing procedures that um, Deputy Clerk, uh, can you note correspondence and telephone calls received? Any tele any telephone calls received um, have been processed as either written comment or as telecomment, and both have been attached to the item, if there is any. Okay, thank you. All right, Director Schultz, could you continue, please? Yes, and. Uh where I ended off was basically we would have about $220,000 of that 293 that would be available for these small grants, uh, five to $10,000. We think if they average around eight, we think we do about 27 of them. We think it's a, we've talked a lot to HCD about this. We could submit our application. Uh, if, if the board adopted this resolution, we could submit the application right away. We'd hear in November, December, we think we would be up and going with this probably January or maybe December-ish timeframe and get these funds out there as soon as possible. We recommend you adopt this resolution. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions from the board? To, just just one, um, would that when the um, applications are available for the public, I uh, appreciate if, if the county could send out a press release and make sure the supervisors all get a copy of it so we can do what we can to get the word out. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions or comments from the board? All right. Are there any public comments? Seeing none. Okay. Staff, do you have any final remarks? 
No further comments, uh, Chair Ashick. Okay, are there any final questions or comments from this board? Okay, I'm going Mr. to close. Chair, I'll move the recommended action. Let's see, <laughs> hold on. I'm going to close the public hearing. Okay. Now, it's before the Board of Supervisors. So, Supervisor McCowan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Move the recommended action. Second. Okay. Any further comments? Okay, Deputy Clerk, could you conduct a roll call vote? Yes. Supervisor Brown? Yes. Supervisor McCowan? Yes. Chair Hashtag? Yes. Supervisor Journey? Yes. And Supervisor Williams? Yes. The motion carries unanimously. All right. So we're on to item 5G, which is discussion and possible action, including number one, adoption of ordinance rezoning R 2019-0010-0010. Palabethukal, one legal parcel located at 131 Whitmore Lane, Ukiah, APN number 184-044-10, totaling 53,800 plus or minus square feet, currently designated single family residential district with floodplain and airport zone combining districts. That's um, R1. Well, in 6K FPAZ to suburban residential with floodplain and airport zone combining districts, SR 6K FPAZ and two, adoption of resolution approving a major use permit U 2019-27 to allow for a major impact facility. Sponsor is Planning and Building Services, Director Schultz. Hello, uh, Chair Hashig, Brent Schultz. I'd like to hand this over to Jesse Davis, who's going to take us through quickly. Good afternoon, Board of Supervisors. My name is Jesse Davis, Senior Planner, Mendocino County Planning and Building Services. Before you is a request for rezoning of a property from single family residential to suburban residential. Additionally, the applicant is requesting a major use permit to allow for a major impact facility to establish or to reestablish a skilled nursing facility in an existing 22,000 square foot building located at 131 Whitmore Lane. As you may be aware, the building was formerly in use as a skilled nursing facility and was in operation until 2007. The subject parcel is located along South State Street, which intersects with Whitmore Lane, just south of Ukiah. The building is located directly on the southwest corner. The site is classified as urban land and is relatively flat with little to no elevation change throughout. Uh, the 22,000 square foot facility is a former care facility and the structure will remain and is already designed to house a use similar, indicating the need for only minimal improvements to the building and site in order to proceed with operations. A small amount of landscaping and vegetation exists around the building with planting um, between Whitmore Lane at the corner. Um, now, in particular, this building is necessary to house a skilled nursing facility as it previously had done in 2007, and it cannot be considered under the present zoning district because it's considered a non-conforming use. According to Mendocino County Code section 20.204, it states whenever a non-conforming use has been abandoned or discontinued for any reason uh, for a continuous period of one year or more, the non-conforming use shall not be reestablished unless it otherwise undergoes the appropriate, appropriate discretionary review, which this project has. Um, with that being said, we are happy to address any questions you may have. And this is Julia Acker Krog, Chief Planner. I just want to add that attached to this item, um, items three and five on the um, posting are revised ordinance as well as a revised resolution for your consideration. And the revised ordinance solely is adding the Exhibit A, uh, which basically has a visual representation of the general plan, and, or excuse me, the rezone and what district this is going to. And then secondarily, item five in the attachments, which is the board uh, tentative resolution, we just added reference in one of the last, be it further resolved clauses to reference the zoning districts up from what it was to what it is going to be if you approve this item today. And with that, we are available for any questions. All right. Are there any comments, questions from the board? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I thought it was mentioned that the uh, zoning is single family residential. 
Presently, the zoning is single family residential, other known, otherwise known as R1. It's being transitioned into a suburban residential, um, SR, and it is adjacent to an existing suburban residential district along State Street. Thank you. And what level of notice, uh, and then the reason this is necessary, we have the existing facility, but due to the lapse in use, uh, they would not be able to proceed with the previous use without the rezoning. Is that accurate? That is correct. And then what uh, level of notice was uh, put out to the public? I can take that one, Supervisor McCowan. This is Julia acker Krog, Chief Planner. So with this item, there is publication that is done in the local newspaper of general circulation, in this case, the Ukiah Daily Journal, and a proof of publication is attached to this item as item 10 on the attachments. And then additionally, we mail a notice to all adjacent landowners that fall within 350 feet of the proposed rezoned parcel. This is Jesse uh, Davis, you. Senior Planner. I will also note that this item went before the Planning Commission and was also presented to the Airport Land Use Commission for consideration. Okay. Any further questions? All right. Seeing no public comment, we'll go back to the board. Any, do we have a motion? I'll move the recommended motion, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. Second. Okay, motion made by Supervisor Brown, seconded by Supervisor Williams. Any further comment from the board? Okay, hearing none, Deputy Clerk, could you conduct a roll call vote? Yes, Supervisor Journey. Yes. Supervisor Brown? Yes. Supervisor Haschuk? Yes. Supervisor McCowan? Yes. And Supervisor Williams. Yes. The motion carries unanimously. All right. Very good. Moving on to agenda item number 5H, discussion and possible action related to presentation, review, and potential endorsement of the strategic plan to address homelessness in Mendocino County as prepared by the Mendocino County Homeless Services Continuum of Care. And there is a presentation that's been attached um, we don't have time for the presentation this afternoon, unfortunately, but we will go to um, the ad hoc committee on homeless action and the health and human services agency. So who's going to start it off? This is um, senior program manager, Megan Van Sant with the advocacy and collaboration team at health and human services. And I will go ahead and introduce the two um, co-chairs of the Continuum of Care Strategic Plan Committee who will be presenting this item today. We understand that they will not be going through the PowerPoint that they had prepared, but you have that in your materials. And so I'll let um, Dan and Shannon give us some information about this strategic plan and we look forward to your questions. So without further ado, I'll introduce Dan McIntyre and Shannon Riley as the co-chairs of the Mendocino County Homeless Services Continuum of Care Strategic Planning Committee. Thank you. Okay, welcome. Thank you, Chairman House, Chuck, and Board of Supervisors. Um, just briefly, we the Continuum Career Strategic Planning Committee has uh, put an extensive amount of time in trying to make a strategic plan that uh, works as a good skeleton for the county. Uh, we've worked in conjunction with all the agencies uh, involved, along with uh, county's ad hoc staff on homelessness. And um, the to keep it brief, um, we're very proud of the plan and we think that in moving forward, it will be very effective for the county and uh, I'm available along with Shannon to answer any questions that the board may have. Thank you. Shannon Riley, do you have anything to add? Not other than the fact that I, I was really uh, grateful to be included in the process. Um, I know there was a lot of concern initially about the Marbit study that we're all familiar with. It was done a couple of years ago, and I think um, the Board of Supervisors should feel confident that the vast majority of the recommendations from that study are included in the COC's strategic plan. Um, 
but have been done so in a way that um, that really has the buy-in from the service providers. So like Dan said, we're, we're really proud of this document and we look forward to answering any questions you have about it. Okay, would the ad hoc like to add anything to that? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate all the work that has gone into this document. As noted, it does uh, substantially incorporate the Marbit report recommendations, which uh, this board uh, has endorsed in concept. Uh, this plan will go a long ways towards providing better coordination of the uh, resources and the services that are available to better assist individuals in graduating from homelessness. I want to mention two very positive things that are included in this report. One is the recruitment and hiring of a landlord tenant navigator, which will uh, centralize recruitment and retention of landlords instead of having multiple agencies reaching out to multiple landlords, sometimes with the result that the landlords say, don't call me anymore. So with uh, this new position, uh, we should be able to establish a better working relationship with landlords that is more efficient and more effective. Uh, it is also proposed to hire a coordinated entry manager, which will greatly improve the uh, functioning of, of that process. So I, I think there's a lot of good things uh, in this report. Uh, one more point I wanna touch on, it uh, is intended that uh, the collaboration between the county, cities and law enforcement uh, will be improved regarding homeless outreach teams, but also that um, the continuum of care itself will be doing an assessment of the skill sets that those members bring to the continuum. And is there a need to reach out beyond their current membership categories? And it's not explicitly stated, uh, but I do believe that the continuum of care as it has become a much more major player in addressing homelessness will significantly benefit by expanding their membership to uh, include elected representatives. I've said before, and in fact, Supervisor Jurdy and I presented a report endorsed by this board uh, advocating for the inclusion of city council members, uh, perhaps one coastal, one inland, board of supervisors, perhaps one coastal, one inland, uh, business representatives, so that we have a broader based representation of the uh, all of the sectors in our community that are directly impacted by homelessness. And I think that would strengthen the continuum of care, as well as improve our overall response to homelessness. Uh, sorry to take a bit of time, but uh, this really is a major step forward. I want to especially uh, acknowledge the co-chairs of the Continuum of Care, uh, Jackie Williams and Dan McIntyre, and also uh, Shannon Riley as co-chair of the uh, Strategic uh, Action Plan Committee, or Strategic Plan Committee. So thank you all very much uh, for all the work done. Supervisor Journey, would you like to add anything? Just very briefly, I'd just like to add that, you know, uh, we're, we're seeing new funding from the state, and I think we're likely to see new funding from the federal government. And it's really important that, that the county, the cities, everyone, um, the nonprofits all have a common plan and a common vision for what we're going to do in Mendocino County. And, and this is one more um, important step in, in developing that common plan. Okay, thank you. Any further comments from the board? Yes, sir. Yes, Supervisor Brown. Well, my comment is I really appreciated all the information, um, especially beginning on page 12 through page 14, giving the resources available, and that was countywide. Uh, also, the funding sources listed. I think it gives transparency to the public and elected bodies of government who really must oversee a lot of these services. Uh, 
because the public does hold us responsible. Um, then I also, under the goals, section goal three, improve engagement around homelessness is excellent. Again, excellent, so everyone is aware of the progress being made under the strategic plan um, we have before us today. So th those are my comments. All right. Okay, seeing no further comments from the board, we don't have any public comment on this, but it's greatly appreciated the work that everyone's done on this. So thank you very much. Um, is there a, do we need a motion? We're just going to review and endorse. So well, I think we would need a uh, motion. I move approval of. Second. Okay, so Supervisor McCowan, you moved approval of the the strategic of the plan. plan. I think I think we want to explicitly endorse it, and uh, I believe the the hope is that the cities will likewise endorse it. Okay, and it's been seconded by Supervisor Williams. Okay, any further comment? Okay. Deputy Clerk of the Board, could you connect a roll call vote? Yes. Supervisor Williams. Yes. And Supervisor Jurdy. Yes. Chair Hashtag. Yes. Supervisor McCowan. Yes. And Supervisor Brown. Yes. The motion carries unanimously. All right. Thank you, everyone. Very thank you. well done. Okay. Moving on to agenda item 5I. Discussion and possible action, including approval of retroactive agreement with Redwood Community Services in the amount of $140,422 to provide expanded subsidized employment for CalWORKs participants effective July 1st, 2020 through June 30th, 2021. Sponsor is Health and Human Services Agency. This had come up in consent calendar um, on August 4th and had been pulled for some more information. So is um, someone from Health and Human Services here? Tammy Moss Chandler. Good afternoon, Chair Haschek, members of the board. Uh, nice to be with you today. Uh, Tammy Moss Chandler, Director of Health and Human Services. Rachel Ebel Elliott is our Deputy Director over Employment Family Assistance Services in HSA, and she's available to answer your questions. I appreciated the opportunity to address Supervisor Jardy's questions about uh, what, what exactly this CalWORKs funding is for, and I'm happy to turn it to Rachel to give you a very high level um, uh, overview of the item, if you would like, since it was pulled from consent uh, previously. Okay, very good. We could have a brief summary since we're short of time right now. Um, good afternoon. Uh, this is Rachel Ebel Elliott, Deputy Director for Employment and Family Assistance Services. Um, I understand that uh, the item was pulled because we were requesting clarification um, on the selection of vendor for our expanded subsidized employment program through the CalWORKs Job Services. Um, selection of the vendors was actually a result of an RFP uh, that closed in March of 2019. We had uh, four proposals submitted. Um, three were chosen to move forward um, with contracts and Workforce Alliance was, did not, had not submitted a proposal. Um, we currently, uh, so this is our second year of um, contracts from that RFP. Um, RCS is one of the vendors. Um, we also uh, contract with the Hospitality Center on the Coast for our coastal participants. Um, expanded subsidized employment, it provides, uh, it's a program, it provides support for job placements for our CalWORKs uh, participants. Um, program pays the wages and some administrative costs associated with the supervision and training of participants. Um, our current contracts that we have, actually the program pays 100% um, of the wages for participants for the first three months, and then it pays 50% for um, the second three months. And the contracted partners um, then 
you know, may continue um, employing the individual or they also uh, may help to place the employee in a different um, in a different job at the end of their uh, subsidized employment program. Were there any any specific questions? Supervisor Journey. Just very briefly, I, I had a chance to meet with county staff about this, and it's clear to me that this is not a duplication of, of any other services from Cal, uh, the Workforce Alliance North Bay. This is very actually complementary work and um, in coordination with, with them in a, in a way. And so um, I, my concerns have been um, uh, addressed. So um, I'm ready to support the approval. And I also appreciate that information. And uh, there was a question because Supervisor Jerdy and I both serve on the board of the Workforce Alliance of the North Bay. And so we did have those questions and I think they've been answered properly and appropriately. So um, any other questions from the board? Okay, we're going to go to public comment. Seeing no public comment, um, back to the board. Does someone want to make a motion? Mr. Chair, I'll move the recommended motion. Okay, very good. I'll second the motion. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Is there any further comment from the board? Okay, Deputy Clerk, could you conduct a roll call vote? Chair Hashtag? Yes. Supervisor McCowan? Yes. Supervisor Jurdy? Yes. Supervisor Brown? Yes. And Supervisor Williams? Yes. The motion carries unanimously. All right. So moving on, we can um, try to squeeze in the item 5E before supervisor reports, um, or we can postpone 5E and go to straight to supervisor reports. What's the will of the body? Let's do 5E. Okay, are we all right with doing 5E? Okay, so item 5E is um, discussion and possible action, including introduction and waive reading of an ordinance amending section 15.04.030 of the Mendocino County Code, speed zoning on county roads, establishing a 35 miles per hour prima facie. Uh, speed limit on Boyce Lane, County Road 413 from milepost zero to milepost point four zero, And on Pearl Drive, County Road 412A from milepost zero to milepost point five six, establishing a 40 mile per hour prima facie speed limit on Fort Bragg Sherwood Road, County Road 419 from milepost zero to milepost 1.75 and establishing a 45 miles per hour speed limit on Boyce Lane, County Road 413 from mile post 0 0.40 to mile post 1.26 in the Fort Bragg area. The sponsor is the Department of Transportation. Um, Director DeShield. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, ladies and gentlemen of the board, Howard DeShield, your Director of Transportation. The action before you today uh, implements and puts into ordinance the speeds that were uh, heard by the board in the traffic studies on March 24th. So this simply takes those um, limits forward, puts them in county ordinance. Very good. Are there any questions from the board? Mr. Chair? Yes, Supervisor Brown. Um, I just like to ask um, Mr. Deshiel, what were what presently are the speed limits? Boyce Lane and Pearl Drive were un, um, you know, they were not uh, posted in ordinance, and uh, Fort Bragg Sherwood had uh, previously been posted without a current engineering study. So you might say no, none of them were officially in county ordinance before. They were not being changed. They're new. Okay, so this is good. Thank you. Okay, any further question from the board? Okay, going to public comment. Seeing no public comment, 
or whether was there one letter written about it? Okay, no verbal comment. Going back to the board, Supervisor Jerdy. These are all in the fourth district, so I'll just quickly mention um, for the benefit of the public that in all three cases, it's really two roads are really one road. They're connected, and the Sherwood Road's the second road. Um, they were in all cases, um, neighbors petitioned and asked for the county to do these speed studies. And um, the neighbors are aware of the, of the um, results of the speed study and are aware of the speed that will be posted on the signs. Inevitably, there will be some neighbors who are not aware and will not be happy with the, the high, you know, relatively in my mind, high, high speeds posted. But the people involved that petitioned this are aware and, and are supporting and requesting that we approve this. Um, so I think we, we should move ahead and, and I would uh, move the um, recommended motion. Second. Okay, any further comment from the board? Okay, hearing none, we'll go Deputy Clerk of the Board. Could you conduct a roll call vote? Yes. Um, Supervisor Brown? Yes. Supervisor McCowan? Yes. Chair Hashtag? Yes. Supervisor Jurdy? Yes. And Supervisor Williams? Yes. The motion carries unanimously. Okay, very good. So agenda item 5K, there is no chief executive officer's report today. Um, item 5L, discussion and possible action, including review, adoption, amendment, consideration, or ratification of legislation pursuant to the adopted legislative platform. Do we have anything on that today? We do not, thank you. No, nope. okay. Very good. Moving on to supervisor's reports. Um, Supervisor Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chair. But I want to mention first, so I don't forget, um, I, I have received um, a couple of calls, um, concerns about MSERA and an item on its agenda. So I hope we can take some time to hear from Supervisor Jurdy since he rep represents us. Um, on that board, there's evidently a big item coming up. So um, moving forward, I'm just going to give the meetings I've attended, not with a lot of information unless someone so, so de desires. And that exception will be the RCRC Board of Directors meeting. But I had an Upper Russian River Water Managers meeting, lots of discussion. We had State Water Resources Control Board in attendance. We're worried about drought conditions and discuss that um, with the um, staff from the State Water Resources Control Board. We had a report and update on the Potter Valley project. So um, I also wrote a letter um, to the editor locally here, uh, Ukiah Daily Journal, having to do with the U.S. Census. Um, and I think all of you know that the plans were changed, ending and the sense, uh, census are going to be ending their field operations and self-response options one month earlier than expected. So now we've got to get our count in by September 30th, but we really have to be serious about this. This is road funds, this is public education funds, I mean, um, health and human service funds, a lot of these funds are all based on population, so we really, really need to get a good count. So please support that effort, supervisors, and go out to your own uh, social uh, media uh, contacts and, and really um, push that forward. The next item I have, uh, just really quick, the executive committee. Um, for LAVCO um, had a meeting, many items were discussed. They will be coming forward um, at our next meeting for LAVCO. I just want to mention that FERC has their scoping uh, uh, session open now and they're looking for comments. This has to do with the Potter Valley project. You go to the actual scoping document um, and you can read what's there and give comment on it. Then at the RCRC Board of Directors, I need to announce 
Um, and this took place on August 12th, that Greg Norton, who's been our president, uh, president and CEO uh, for a number of years, um, announced his retirement uh, from the organization. It will be effective December 31st, um, 2020. Then we also, um, the main items that um, we went through, and it did take quite a bit of time, um, were five ballot measures. On Proposition 15, the California Schools and Local Communities Funding Act, this is called split row. Um, the board took a position to oppose. Lots of debate on that. Proposition 16, which is ACA 5, repeal of Proposition 209 um, of 1996. They took a position to support. Proposition 17, ACA 6, voting rights of convicted felons. Um, the majority of the board took a position to oppose. Uh, Proposition 18, ACA 4, age of voting. A neutral position was taken. Proposition 19, ACA 11, um, the home protection for seniors, severely disabled families and victims of wildfire or natural disasters. <coughs> there was debate to get a good understanding of this and all the memos and information that was presented can be found online at the RCRC website, but the board um, did take a, a position to oppose um, we did have reports on forest management and wildlife, um, I should say wildfire update, and a lot of it had to do with RCRC Homeowners uh, Insurance Ad Hoc Committee. Um, and there is an assembly bill by um, 2167 by Daly and they are, um, they took a position to support it, probably very important for all of us to look at. And one note I did pick up, um, insurance companies are really looking at counties and cities and what their um, code uh, addresses as far as home hardening um, and looking at that as to whether they're gonna renew policies or not. So that information was, um, was brought up. We did have um, discussion on the state budget and basically it was an update. So that's all, thank you. Okay, Supervisor McKellen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to uh, just briefly update a couple of the criteria for the state watch list and because of our low level of hospitalization thus far, these aren't something that the state currently evaluates for Mendocino County. But one of the criteria is percentage of ICU beds available. And currently of the 16 ICU beds, or this is all as of yesterday, of the 16 ICU beds, eight were occupied four of them by COVID patients. So we had an availability for ICU beds of 50%. For the 22 ventilators, uh, four were in use. So we had an availability for ventilators of 82%. Uh, these are the kind of uh, healthcare system statistics that I think support uh, our request, which I believe we all support, <clears throat> for the state to re-examine some of the watch list criteria. Uh, with that said, uh, with the ongoing uh, COVID response and the amount of time that that does take by the board, and yet we inevitably wind up getting cut short somewhat on the COVID update and cut short on our other business, I would suggest that we have a special meeting next week with only two items. One would be the COVID update. I think there's a lot of information to be uh, explored regarding the watch list criteria, the 14-day uh, case rate, the uh, testing figures that are used to establish that rate, 
and the continuing lag and getting test results. I think these are all key issues that uh, would benefit if we devoted more time to them. The second item would be to request our staff to make a presentation on the census. Mendocino County stands to lose millions of dollars over the next 10 years because we are not hitting the mark in responding to the census. Uh, everything that we can do to uh, promote people completing the census will benefit Mendocino County financially. Uh, so again, I respectfully uh, request that we have a special meeting next week. Thank you. Okay, Supervisor Dirty. Um, well, I do want to um, try to address the issue raised by Supervisor Brown about the Mendocino County Employee Retirement System. I'm not sure that I received the letter that she's referring to, but I assume that the um, the correspondence had to do with the error correction policy that'll be um, discussed and probably acted upon at, at, um, at our meeting tomorrow. Uh, and uh, just briefly, um, uh, county employees' um, information can be entered incorrectly into a system that calculates their retirement benefit from time to time that the, those errors have been discovered and um, corrections were made to their payment. Um, and um, we have had policies that we've followed. I'm not sure if they were all written down in one comprehensive policy. Um, and we do have that comprehensive policy uh, on our agenda for uh, tomorrow. So um, that I assume is what's uh, being referenced. Supervisor Brown, do you have anything else to add? No, these were phone calls and please call me back. You need to know what's on the agenda. So. <laughs> And I, I have not called back the individuals, and but it sounds like maybe that's the item. Okay, yeah, talk to you later. Um, uh, we've had a, a couple of extra uh, MTA, Mendocino Transit Authority meetings in last uh, last month. And um, just the, uh, um, just maybe the announcement there is that our executive director uh, general manager, I should say, of the Mendocino Transit Authority um, has uh, retired and um, and we will be um, filling that position. And um, at Supervisor Chair Brown, or Hashak may wish to talk a little bit about yesterday's Mendocino Council of Governments meeting, but I think a highlight of that was the approval of the uh, fire vulnerability and uh, access routes um, plan that was um, a Caltrans climate adaptation grant funded a study of Mendocino County looking for um, ways to uh, make neighborhoods a little more um, safe. Um, and it, they had uh, good input from the fire safe councils throughout the county, the state countywide ca fire safe council, fire departments. Um, so I think that that will be a helpful planning document to and perhaps a way to help get uh, grants over time to help out those neighborhoods that are vulnerable with one route one in, one route out. So those are just some of the meetings I think I wanted to highlight. Thank you. Supervisor Williams. Uh, I wonder if we should talk about the cannabis ad hoc. Would that be all right? Yes. Uh, the cannabis ad hoc has met with staff, with CDFA, and with CDFW multiple times now. We're submitting uh, 20 CEQA checklists chosen uh, from applications uh, essentially at random. The idea is to try to get a statistic. It's a small sample, but we want to know, do 20 of them pass and go to annuals, or do 80 of them? And depending on that result, we can come back and talk about next steps. So far, the state agencies have been cooperative. I think we have all of the details worked out. We know what to do and uh, staff is, is executing. So uh, no, no red flags yet. It's looking like it's a well-defined process. Uh, uh, Supervisor Haschek, do you wanna add anything? Uh, you're on mute. Oh, you missed the best part. Okay, so um, yeah, we met with CDFW, we met with CDFA, you know, Richard Parrott and his team, you know, who's the director of it. 
and we've had communication with them. We have a meeting tomorrow with CDFW. I think there's been some glitches that we've found in the process that we can hopefully work through. And it seems like we just need to keep moving forward. And, um, and with that, I think that we will have a plan shortly about really how to expedite this, this process. So I'm, I'm optimistic that we can get people through the system. And um, it seems like the state agencies have been cooperative and have the same goal as we have. Mr. Chair? Super, super, uh, just Supervisor Williams, did you have anything to add to that? No. Okay, Supervisor Brown? I just want to say thank you for that report. Sounds wonderful. All right, very good. Um, and, then, and then the IT ad hoc met with staff. And I think we will have a uh, cost recovery plan coming forward at a, at a future meeting regarding uh, radio towers. And w Supervisor Jerry and I also met as the road ad hoc and talked about some low cost uh, illusions to uh, slow speeding in certain areas as a, as a pilot program. Those will come back as, a, as an action item after we get the cost nailed down with uh, our DOT director. And uh, last, I don't remember what this ad hoc's name was, but we were looking at signage for visitors entering Mendocino County to remind them of the uh, mask ordinance. And there's an opportunity to update that language. And I, I would like to include the $100 fine on the text of this, the, the message. Uh, Chair Haschek, how do you want to, uh, I don't mean to be using the supervisor's report for action, but can I ask if there's any objection? Well, I think that there is one question about if you say a hundred dollar fine and then what happens to the second case when it's 200 or the third when it's 500. And I think that that was a question that uh, Director DeShield had. You want to have a greater than equal to one hundred dollar <laughs> fine? Mr. Chair. Yes, Supervisor McCowan. Well, I think it could simply say masks required minimum fine $100. The ad hoc will take that into consideration. I love it. All right. Is that it, Supervisor Williams? That's it. Okay. So, um, like Supervisor Williams said, the ad hoc for cannabis cultivation has been very active. We've been meeting with all sorts of groups too, stakeholders to keep them informed. We have a meeting tomorrow with MCA and, and some others. So that's been going really well. Um, ad hoc law enforcement advisory board that Supervisor Jerdy and I sit on, we've met weekly with a development group and we were supposed to have the have it come back to the board today, but we wanted to make sure all of our bases were covered, that we touched um, everyone that we, you know, the important stakeholders in this. And so, so we will have something on September 1st, and that, so that will come back to the board. Um, we met with County Council and Human Resources and we're outreaching to the DA and Chief Probation Officer and um, John Martyr, the SIU Director. So, so that's going well. Um, Supervisor Jerdy and I are also on the ad hoc for alternative animal care and we met with uh, the Sheriff and County Council and the Sheriff who who oversees the animal control. And we also met with John, uh, Rich Molinari, who oversees the animal care services. And so we're looking at um, the possibility of transitioning animal control from the sheriff's department over to animal care. We also had William Schertz from you know, Human Resources with us on that meeting. So that was very productive, I felt. Um, and then let's see, 
There's certainly there's been issues in Covalo with the 911 service. The cell service has been horrible, and there's been some tragedies up there with arsons and and also just um, violence. And so people are feeling um, very much afraid without 911 service. So, so my commitment is to work with um, state and legislators and the CPUC to try to fix, see what we can do with that. I know Supervisor Williams has been involved too. So, so I appreciate that. Um, you know, Prop or Supervisor Brown talked about Prop 15. And um, we did take a stand as a board on endorsing the schools and communities first initiative. So that's Prop 15. Um, there was a supervisor McCowan brought up about a meeting next week and it's not possible because we don't have the staff. Staff will be gone and not available on that date and eyes also won't be available. So, so that won't happen. We will just have to do it in our regular September 1st meeting. Um, the census letter that Supervisor Brown talked about, I also wrote a letter to the local Willits um, newspapers um, about you know, the importance of the census. And certainly I hope everyone is taking it seriously. And um, that's about it. So with that, it's 535 and we will adjourn the meeting. Thank you, everyone. It's a very productive day. All right. So, okay, meeting adjourned.